I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's hearing. Uh, my name is Corey Johnson, and I am the Speaker of the New York City Council. I want to thank the chairs of the committees on governmental operations and oversight and investigations, council members Fernando Cabrera and Richie Torres for their resolve on this issue that we will be discussing today. Uh, we are, of course, discussing uh, what happened on election day earlier this month. Uh, a top to bottom review is not a small task, and I wanna thank the chairs for setting aside time to devote to today's hearing and to the staff whose hours of work guaranteed our ability to give this mess the attention that it deserves. We already have some of the most archaic and restrictive election laws in the country, and we can talk about those. We will be raising these issues with our state colleagues to hopefully enact and implement early voting, no excuse absentee ballot voting, automatic voter registration, electronic poll books, and same day voter registration it's my hope, uh, no later than the 2020 presidential election. I understand that consolidating our congressional and state and local primary dates would also greatly help our elections administration overall. It is beyond urgent that we update our laws to catch up with other states across the country. However, today we're here to discuss November 6, 2018, the general election. On November 6, 2018, uh, the City Council had 40 staff assigned to approximately 200 poll sites in all five boroughs to oversee day of operations. By 8.30 in the morning, we were receiving messages that, we were receiving messages that scanners were failing and poll site coordinators were initiating emergency protocol at select sites. That morning, I experienced the very issues those very issues at my own poll site that many other New Yorkers experienced when they tried to vote uh, or the issues that we saw on news reports. By 11 o'clock in the morning at my poll site, the LGBT Center in Greenwich Village, we were down to one functioning scanner, causing a line to back up out the door and into the pouring rain. Over the course of the day, the voting crises escalated in four out of five boroughs voters waiting in two to three hours of lines to vote, scanners jamming or out of commission entirely, and wide-ranging emergency protocols initiated at different poll sites. To say that uh, I was angry by what I witnessed and bewildered at the day of operations would be an understatement. To the more than two million New Yorkers who turned out and cast a ballot in this year's general election, I want to say thank you. You exceeded our expectations. And to those New Yorkers who tried to cast a ballot in this year's general election, and for reasons beyond your control, found the process arduous, discouraging, and unsafe, I want you to know that the Council is committed to getting to the bottom of this. I would hate for your experience on Tuesday, November 6th, to end your civic engagement. We need your voice. We need you to ensure that the laws considered by these committee members, myself, along with the rest of the council, take you into account to ensure that our budget funds programs in your neighborhood that take you into account, and we need you and every New Yorker who's eligible to cast their ballot. To the representatives of the City Board of Elections, I want to thank you for your willingness to testify to the committees this morning on the 2018 general election. But I also want to say that regardless of the weather, the turnout, or other circumstances, it is your mandated responsibility to administer our elections in an equitable and organized fashion. I can't begin to describe my disappointment at what I consider to be the egregious failure to effectuate this mandate in our most recent general election. There should not be riot conditions at poll sites across our city. Elderly and disabled New Yorkers should not be made to wait in line for more than 30 minutes, as state law says, let alone two to three hours. And most devastating, voters should not leave poll sites with any doubt of whether or not their ballot has been cast and that their vote has been recorded. That is not democracy. I look forward to an in-depth review that the committees will conduct today. And most importantly, I expect to hear a plan forthcoming from the city and state to rectify the issues of this past election 
and to improve tenfold, if not more, that the, the election operations for the next election and for the one after that and for the one after that. And I want to now hand it over uh, to the co-chairs uh, who are uh, co-chairing this hearing today, uh, the chair of our Governmental Operations Committee, uh, Chair Fernando Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Good morning and welcome to this joint oversight hearing of the, Gover of the Committee on Governmental Operations and the Committee on Oversight and Investigation of the 2018 general election. I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, and I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and my co-chair, Council Member Richie Torres, for their unwavering support of our city's voters. This committee has held oversight hearings on elections before, and he had held hearings with the New York City Board of Elections before, but I cannot remember ever being so immediately obvious that a hearing will be needed as it was with this past election. The long lines, let me say that again, the long lines and voting machine failures were so widespread that many of us not only heard about it in the news story, but also experienced it when we tried to vote ourselves. Our social media overflow with members of the public reaching out to us for help. You can see on the screen some of the comments from frustrated voters that I received on my personal page, all of whom just wanted to participate in our democracy. We spend so much time in the council on improving voting registration efforts and voting rights education, but it's all for nothing if people try to vote and fail. What does it say when our election process is a bigger deterrent to voters than the pouring rain? We simply must do better. In Nassau County, they use the same voting machines we use, operated under the same election laws that we operated under. And because clouds do not stop at the Queens border, they voted in the same wet weather we did, yet we experienced long lines and they did not. Clearly our Board of Election is doing or failing to do something different here. Truly hope that today's discussion will be a productive one. It is not enough to say that the problems were unexpected. Now that they have happened, they are no longer unexpected. Therefore, I want to hear how we prevent this from happening again. If our machines are failing, then I want to hear how we will fix them. If our planning was poor, then I want to hear how we will plan better. The voters of New York City deserve to hear that. They don't want to hear excuses, they want to hear solutions. I want to thank the staff of both committees, uh, of both committees Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cron, Emily Forgeon, Zach Harris, Steve Pignac, Jennifer Smith, Pearl Moore, Coldero Perez, Lisi Trinder, Mark Chen, as well as my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for their tremendous amount of work they put into this hearing in such a short amount of time. I look forward to our discussion. And with that, I pass it to my co-chair, Richie Torres. Council Member Richie Torres. Good morning, everyone. I'm City Council Member Richie Torres, and I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. I'm honored to join the City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, and the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, Fernando Cabrera, in chairing a hearing on the central institution of New York City democracy, our elections. On Tuesday, November 6, millions of voters were thrown into a preventable state of mass chaos and confusion caused by a lack of planning, preparation, and professionalism from the New York City Board of Elections. There were countless poll sites like PS96 in the Bronx, where every machine, or nearly every machine, had broken down. Even though New York City is the greatest city in the world, the manner in which we conduct elections is unworthy of our city's greatness. Indeed, it is nothing short of a national embarrassment that a city so great runs its election so poorly. Ever since the 2016 election, we have all been keenly aware of the brave new world we live in, a world where the threat of cyber warfare lurks in the background of every election. But here in New York City, it seems as if we have become 
our own worst enemy. It seems that we have as much to fear from our own incompetent administration of elections as we do from political interference at the hands of a foreign enemy. Now, Michael Ryan, the executive director of the Board of Elections, is right to point out that the long lines of eager voters are a tribute to, quote, a healthy, robust democracy. But he is only partly right. The never-ending delays that most of us have painfully felt firsthand is not merely a sign of health in New York City's democracy, it is also a sign of sickness in the New York City Board of Elections, which cannot manage to administer an election without experiencing a systemic breakdown. If it's not a voter purge in Brooklyn, then it's a citywide collapse of voting machines producing long lines of frustrated New Yorkers. Now, Mr. Ryan has said that the Board of Elections cannot be faulted for, quote, lacking a crystal ball. But the problem is not that the Board of Elections did not know or could not have known the challenges of a two-page perforated ballot. Those challenges were well known as evidenced by BOE's own records. The problem, it seems, is that the Board of Elections couldn't be bothered to properly plan and prepare for those challenges as a professional agency would, and therein lies the sickness in our system. The most vital institution in our democracy, our electoral system, is in the hands of a broken bureaucracy. The city cannot afford to have a voting process so cumbersome, so dysfunctional, that it inhibits everyday New Yorkers from exercising their fundamental right to vote. Our shared mission should be to produce more voters, not less, to make voting more accessible, not less. Yet we as a city and as a state are failing at that critical mission, and the people we represent are paying the price. On the morning after his election in 2012, President Obama said, quote, I want to thank every American who participated in this election, whether you voted for the very first time or waited in line for a very long time. And then President Obama paused and said, by the way, we have to fix that. And that is why we are here, Mr. Speaker, to fix that. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Chair Torres and Chair Cabrero. I want to invite uh, the Board of Elections to uh, come up to the witness stand. Uh, we have been joined this morning by Councilmember Kelman Yeager, Councilmember Bill Perkins, Councilmember Keith Powers, Chair Torres, Chair Cabrera, Councilmember Alan Mazel, and Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. Uh, I would ask the uh, committee council uh, to please swear in uh, the witnesses. Oh, I didn't see Alika. Where is she? Oh, I didn't see her over there. And Councilmember Alika Ampre Samuel. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Chairs Cabrera and Torres, and the members of the City Council's Committee on Govern Committees on Governmental Operations and Oversight and Investigation. Thank you pro for providing the opportunity to appear before you on behalf of the Board of Elections. My name is Michael Ryan, and I am the Executive Director of the Board. Seated to my right is Dawn Sandow, and we are also accompanied by additional staff as set forth in my written testimony. I will provide an overview regarding the September 13th uh, primary election and the November 6th, 2018 general election. After providing formal remarks, I am prepared to answer questions from the committee members. Uh, given the proximity of the election uh, and today's hearing, as well as uh, whatever time constraints there may be, I endeavored to keep my remarks as brief uh, as I could, but yet be informative to allow as much time for uh, questions as I'm sure uh, this panel will have many. 
The New York City Board of Elections is mandated by state law to conduct fair and honest elections and enfranchise all eligible New Yorkers to practice those rights. That responsibility is taken very seriously. To be clear, the negative voting experience for many New Yorkers during the general election conducted on November 6, 2018 was unacceptable. A forensic evaluation of the voting equipment to provide more detailed information for precise causes cannot be conducted and completed until after certification of the election results. The board is currently immersed in the process of certifying the election results. New York State election law provides for one of the most comprehensive post-election canvas processes in the nation. This process is designed to ensure that every vote is counted. Nevertheless, the board has conducted an initial analysis of the general election to provide information here today. After each election, the board undertakes a comprehensive review of all aspects of the election to identify any issues or problems that have occurred, to determine any elements of the implementation that should be replicated and expanded, and to determine any elements of the implementation that require remediation. Such comprehensive review is completed by, at a minimum, conferring with all levels of board staff, poll site coordinator debriefings, and by conducting a post-election analysis working jointly with the election system vendor, election systems, and software. Conducting an election in a city as large and diverse as New York City is a complex undertaking. As such, a thorough analysis requires the expenditure of time to assess all relevant information. Given the board's certification responsibility, this effort is typically undertaken upon the completion of the certification of the election results. The board is cognizant that the circumstances that arose during the November 6, 2018 general election caused alarm, concern, and inordinate delay, and an immediate desire for answers on the part of the elected officials and the public at large. The board understands that the purpose of this hearing today is to commence the process of providing answers that are to questions that are rightfully posed. The board is ever mindful of the council's authority and its responsibility to seek such answers on behalf of the citizens of the city of New York and to work diligently to improve the voting experience of all voters. The board shares the mutual desire of all concerned that voting is a sacred right that should be exercised conveniently and without impediment to all those who wish to cast a ballot. It is in that spirit that the board appears here today. The board will endeavor to provide all of the information requested by the City Council today, and if unable to do so uh, with respect to some inquiries, the board will work diligently to provide such information as expeditiously uh, upon the completion of certification as possible, a, a process that has been instituted uh, by Chair Cabrera under other circumstances and seems to have worked well. There was a remarkable increase in voter participation during the November 6, 2018 general election. Approximately two million voters voted at poll sites. This is a 100% increase in participation from the 2014 general election. The process of be building election day ballots differs from ordinary document construction. The board utilizes the system compatible with the DS200 scanners, and each ballot must be made to ensure that the marking ovals for candidates are placed in a location that is readable by the scanner. To complete this process, all aspects of candidate selection must be completed, including primary elections and or judicial nominating conventions. The names of candidates for various offices must be known as the ballot construction is bound by preset system tolerances and names vary in length. For the November 6, 2018 general election, there were charter commission propositions to be considered by the voters and those appeared on the reverse side of the ballot. The state certified 
operating system is not designed to permit candidates and questions to appear in the same section. As such, once it was determined that there would be charter revision questions, no portion of the reverse side of the ballot would be available for the placement of candidate names. Upon the completion of the September 13th primary, staff commenced ballot and construction for all five boroughs and ballot op options were circulated for commissioner review. On October the 2nd, the Board of Commissioners approved the form of ballot in all five boroughs. The commissioners were presented with two difficult choices. We have included samples of those choices of, for the uh, committee members' uh, review and records. One choice was to direct staff to produce a single-page, two-sided ballot utilizing an almost unreadable six-point font for ballots in all boroughs. Or, secondly, increase the font size to 12 points and increase the size to a two-page ballot in four of the five boroughs. The only borough not to have a two-page ballot was Staten Island, uh, and we did not see the issues that arose in the other counties uh, during the Staten Island uh, conducting of the election. The commissioners recognized that utilizing a six-point font was not a realistic option. As such, the board, the board began the process of creating the two-page election day ballot for the first time uh, used in the city of New York. The board has been advised that no other jurisdiction in the United States utilizes a two-page perforated ballot. While other jurisdictions utilize multiple page ballots, the pages are not perforated, as the board has been advised that perforated edge of the paper leads to an increase in ballot jams. Voter participation in the primary election conducted on September 13th uh, 2018 was approximately triple that of voter participation in the same election in 2014. The board prepared for the general election, including an anticipated increase in voter participation as follows. The commissioners authorized the ordering of ballots based on a ratio of 110% of eligible voters, with an increase of 30% from the 2014 general election to ensure that ballots would be available for all voters. This authorization was made following the State Board certification of the ballot on October 9th, 2018. It is worth noting that at the last minute, one of the board's three ballot vendors uh, advised without prior warning that they were not able to complete the printing of a two-page center paper perforated ballot because the equipment that they had ordered to do so had not yet arrived. And the board was forced on short notice to split a high volume of work between two vendors as opposed to three. I would like to say that the two vendors uh, that completed their work really stepped up to the plate uh, and constructed a ballot for us that had never been done anywhere else on very, very short notice or quite literally, we were in danger of not having an election. So I would like to applaud the efforts of Fort Orange Press and of Phoenix Graphics for their efforts in working as a, a good partner to make sure that we had an election. I won't mention the name of the other vendor, but we'll be exercising our uh, rights under the contract with respect to their services. The board recruited, trained, and tested over 34,000 poll workers across the five boroughs uh, for this election, uh, an approximately 25% increase of poll workers from the 2014 election. And I keep going back to 2014 for everyone. That's the last gubernatorial, and we tried to compare election events to election events. The board held an additional training for coordinator and AD field monitors to prepare for the two-page ballot. Given the time constraints, it was not possible to retrain and retest over 34,000 poll workers. Additional training and reference materials were prepared and distributed to all poll site coordinators and in the supply carts for use at poll sites on election day. We have also uh, provided those materials to this committee uh, for information and review. Uh, an additional voter instruction page, including uh, regarding the two-page ballot was prepared and distributed to all voters along with their ballots in privacy sleeves. A how to separate the ballot 
uh, graphic was placed in the center panel of all privacy boots, the lid of each scanner, and was added to the instruction posters placed at each poll site. The board did extensive media appearances on major networks uh, in an effort to educate voters with respect to the two-page ballot, and we spent approximately $400,000 in uh, paper advertising, including full-page ads in two major uh, pu publications as well as neighborhood uh, newspapers. A video explaining how to vote using a two-page ballot was created and placed on the board's website and social media platforms. A robocall was sent to all assigned poll workers directing them to view the video as time did not permit retraining over 34,000 poll workers less than four weeks before Election Day. In addition to advising of the poll worker pay increase, which was less than we asked for, but uh, more than we expected. So we're, we're happy about the increase in pay to poll workers. The board used 100% more field tech, uh, support technicians for the November 2018 compared to that deployed in 2014. We implemented a plan to secure Election Day ballots and or scanner replacements for poll sites uh, that experienced ballot bins that reached capacity. Borough staff processed over 100,000 absentee ballot requests, the majority of which were mailed out within one week of the state certification. This included two separate mailing, absentee ballot mailings, to military and overseas voters necessitated by the June and September primaries. And Mr. Speaker, this is one moment where the consolidated primary would certainly help uh, that we're not distributing bar ballot materials to overseas voters uh, on two different occasions, causing further vo voter confusion. Uh, as stated, approximately 2 million New Yorkers voted at poll sites during the November 6, 2018 general election. The two-page ballot was utilized in the four largest counties. That represents approximately 4 million ballot pages scanned on Election Day. For the sake of perspective, less than 1 million ballot pages were scanned in the 2014 general election, and approximately 2.5 million ballot pages were scanned during the 2016 presidential election. Upon certification, total voter participation is expected to top 2 million voters. With the inclusion of all scanner results, absentee, military, and affidavit ballots in the certified results. Even with the challenges posed by the two-page ballot and those experienced uh, during Election Day, the board was able to report the unofficial results from the poll sites as follows. 70% by 10 p.m., 85% by 11 p.m., and 90% by midnight. That is somewhat behind what we would normally report. However, because of the increased uh, instances of emergency ballots, and I want to clarify that an emergency ballot is no more, no less than an election day ballot that for some reason in the moment is not able to be scanned into the machine. The procedure was followed at the end of the night and the majority of those ballots were scanned into the DS-200 uh, scanners on election night and included in the unofficial results. The balance of those are returned to the uh, various offices and included in the uh, election results during the can canvas process. As stated above, the board has not completed a comprehensive analysis. However, upon conferring with ESNS, the board has been advised that an initial analysis points to the perforated ballot requirement as a major cause of the increase in ballot jams. Such a ballot configuration has not been attempted in any jurisdiction in the United States with a, with use, uh, for use with a poll site scanner. The perforated two-page ballot presented a series of problems never before experienced by the board or anywhere in the country. The increase in ballot jams created a ripple effect in poll sites, causing longer wait times resulting in crowded sites uh, long lines, and taxed technical support resources. Further, the ballot jams continue to occur multiple times at the same poll site at a rate not experienced in any election since the use of the DS-200 scanners began in 2000.
and 10. The board commits to sharing its completed analysis as expeditiously as possible. The board further commits to making necessary adjustments within its statutory, uh, within its authority and existing election law to minimize poll site issues. In addition, the board looks forward to working collaboratively with all interested parties to harmonize the election law with the current voting system, ensuring that the election law and technology will work together rather than at cross purposes at times and to implementing any additional legislative mandates to improve the voter experience. Given the proximity of this hearing to uh, the election date, um, and given the limits of my authority, I have not been able to, nor has the remainder of executive management been able to confer uh, with the commissioners in detail to set new policies moving forward, but I am certainly happy to discuss uh, the, what we saw, which I'm sure is going to square 100% uh, with what everyone else saw, and to work uh, closely with this committee and with the Board of Commissioners to implement a policy. Given the limits of my authority, I do not think it was appropriate for me to, quote, jump out ahead of the commissioners. They set the policy. I am certain we will offer uh, many uh, suggestions and alternatives, uh, and we'll come up with a plan moving forward, working with all of you. Uh, that all having been said, I uh, am ready for your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Ms. Sandow, for being here. Um, Mr. Ryan, do you apologize to the public for what happened on Election Day? Certainly, and I also apologize uh, for it's difficult for me to assess how my remarks were construed because I actually didn't see them after Election Day. But I want to make it clear to, to this committee and, and most especially uh, to you, Mr. Speaker. When I was addressing the weather, I was at a poll site, PS22 in Brooklyn. I had just come in out of a heavy rain and was immediately uh, met by a poll worker who said she was no longer going to work as a poll worker because she was using her scarf uh, to dry off the table. It was the height of the rainstorm, and there was numerous press outlets there. And the technicians had just left, got all four scanners back up and running, and no sooner did they leave, two more scanners went down. Uh, so when I was discussing the weather, I was discussing that particular poll site at that moment in time based on observations. In no way, shape, or form was that meant to be construed as being insensitive uh, to the plight of the voters throughout the city or a shrug of shoulders saying, well, it's raining, there's nothing that we can do. We were in the middle of a crisis, the likes of which we have not seen in the five years that I've been um, uh, the executive director, and I was attempting uh, to remedy that crisis as best I could. What we did at that poll site was we made sure that we got technicians back there and they stayed there uh, until that entire crowd uh, was dispersed. So if that led to uh, you, you know, a perceived insensitivity or lack of seriousness of, of what was going on, uh, that was certainly uh, regrettable and not intended in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I appreciate that, and I understand that you are uh, referring to the remarks that uh, were broadcast by the media on Election Day, but I was, when I asked if you apologized, I was speaking more broadly about the conditions that were laid out by uh, Chair Cabrera, Chair Torres, and myself on what was experienced on Election Day by thousands and tens of thousands of voters across the city, and what they had to experience going to the polls was uh, something that uh, we find to be unacceptable, and that's what I was really trying to get at if you apologize to the voters of New York City for that experience. Yes, we do. We want what you all want and what the voters want, uh, an ease of experience. We want to serve our customers, if you will, the voters of the city of New York, uh, as best uh, we can. Uh, this particular election event uh, presented us with uh, numerous challenges that we will work, hand, hopefully, hand in glove. We've had a good working relationship with the city council uh, and, and city government in general, uh, as well as uh, the state legislature, to make 
additional changes beyond those elements of the elections process that the board controls. So let's get to some of this. I want to start at the beginning so we understand how we got here because, again, this wasn't a special election called with just a few weeks to spare. There was no unforeseen disaster you had to grapple with the day or the week of. It was a general election where it rained and a lot of people voted. I don't see either of those two things as remarkable or unforeseen occurrences. But somehow, in our estimation, in our opinion, they led to what we consider to be an epic disaster on Election Day experienced across city. So let's go through this piece by piece. Number one, the ballot you mentioned. We've heard a lot about problems with the two-page ballot and what that supposedly caused. You discussed that in your testimony. I know that the two-page ballot is new for us, but it is not putting the man on Mars. This should be doable. You just told the State Assembly in a hearing that they held that you have been expecting a two-page ballot since 2016. That's what you said at that hearing. So you've known that this was coming for a while. You knew that the mayor was doing a Charter Revision Commission in February when he announced in his State of the City that he would be appointing a Charter Revision Commission. So you knew that there would be ballot questions. You didn't know how many. That was decided in September, just after Labor Day, but you knew those things. So what did you do to prepare for a two-page ballot, and when did you start the preparation on a two-page ballot if that was one of the root causes of the issues that we saw on Election Day? So we started the preparation for the two-page ballot um, basically in 2016. Uh, there was a, a possibility, it turned out not to be the case, that there would be a two-page uh, ballot prior to the uh, presidential election. In advance of that election, we worked closely with the vendor, uh, and I learned something that there's apparently a 20-week lead time in ordering additional ballot bins. Uh, which we did for the 2016 election, and we put that plan in place. Uh, and elements of that plan included having additional scanners uh, to be uh, positioned uh, in the field in the event that we were filled to capacity and coming up with a game plan to deal with ballot bins uh, that were filled to capacity. So a, a good portion of the plan uh, was uh, completed in uh, 2016. Uh, in the lead-up to this election, and the reason that I went into a little bit of a technical uh, explanation of how ballots are built was, even though there were going to be questions on the back of the ballot, we remained hopeful because of all of the advice that we were given regarding the difficulties associated uh, not only with a two-page ballot, but with a ballot that ends up having one sheet that has perforations on both sides. Now, I'm not a machines operation expert. I'm sure that you're going to hear testimony uh, from the vendor. But they tell me that they are confident that after the analysis of this election that the center perforation uh, was a major culprit. What I can tell you in my experience in the five years that I've been here, we experienced more ballot jams at the top portion of the scanner than in any election, uh, you know, uh, since, I've, since I've been here. Since, two, since 2016, how often have you raised the possibility of a two-page ballot with the board? It, it is, it's kind of the cloud that's always lurking in the background. We have raised uh, the issue uh, with the New York State Legislature prior to the 2016 presidential election. But, but how many times have you raised it with the Board of Commissioners, the possibility of a two-page ballot? I, I don't know precisely, but I can tell you that it is a regular part of the conversation uh, when we're talking about election preparation. Did we, you test the machines with a two-page ballot? Yes, we tested the machines with so a two-page ballot. So what did you learn from testing the machines with a two-page ballot, and how did you adjust from what you learned? Given the timing of the election day a ballot finalizing uh, by the State uh, Board of Elections, we had just enough time to test the DS-200 scanners for functionality. We did not have any time uh, to do any kind of uh, random testing to try to replicate 
uh, the voter experience. All of the machines have to be tested for tabulation. But what did you learn from the testing? We don't learn much from the testing because the then people— why do you do it? We have to do it by law. So in order for each one of those machines to be able to read a ballot, we have to do pre-election testing. When we do that pre-election testing, keep in mind, it's done by individuals, our staff, who are intimately familiar with the workings of the machines. What you have on election day introduces a variable that we cannot replicate in a laboratory setting, which is uh, the actions of of the voters on election day. So you said in your testimony no other jurisdictions have used two-page ballots with scanning machines? With a perforated with a perforation. Edge. Correct. And, and I'm advised, and I don't know this independently, but I'm advised that in the jurisdictions that have clean machine edges on all of the sides, that these types of ballot jams that we experienced in this particular election are not present. I don't know that independently, but that's what I've been told. So now let's turn uh, and talk about two things you've repeatedly blamed, as you talked about earlier when I asked the first question about apologizing, the turnout and the weather. I know Chair Torres spoke about this in his opening as well. It seems like the Board of Elections was surprised and unprepared for both the turnout and the weather. And I know there is not a 10-day forecast of likely voters but I find it hard to believe that anyone following the lead up to this election would not have expected anything other than huge turnout. We saw it in the primary election, significantly increased turnout, so we should have expected it in the general election. How do you estimate voter turnout? Before I, before I get to that, I, I want to I clarify. When I offer an explanation based on what we've learned, I do not want that to be in any way uh, interpreted as an excuse or, or a running away from responsibilities. A an explanation is just that, what we observed. So what we did for this particular election, and it turned out uh, that the basic modeling that we did was correct. We tried to implement a plan based on 50% turnout. We didn't see 50% turnout across the board, but we certainly saw over 50% turnout in some uh, pockets uh, throughout the city. So one of the things that we did, uh, which was our first line of defense, is our poll site coordinators. We, uh, when we brought them back in for the refresher training, we made sure to tell them to have the voters rotate on the scanners. A then B, then C, then D. Did that you, should keep a level uh, enough uh, number of ballots in each scanner. Did you follow reports of increased turnout in states with early voting across the country? No, and I don't necessarily know that those are a predictor, but what I do know is we planned for a 50% turnout. We when did you realize voter turnout would be higher than expected? When we realized it, uh, I think when everybody else realized it in New York, which was after the September uh, primary election, the, the next highest attended primary election after this past uh, September was in 2006, where 400,000 uh, voters voted in that primary. In this primary election, we had over 945,000 people vote. That caught us all by surprise. Uh, on election night as we were watching the results. And from that point forward, we knew we were going to have a myriad of challenges for this uh, general election. So rain during an election is an unprecedented. It rained this year, it's rained before. When the Board of Elections knows rain or humidity is expected, what do you do? With respect what extra precautions and procedures do you implement? Uh, we didn't have any extra precautions or procedures with respect to the rain. It, it has not uh, presented itself uh, as an issue to us prior to this election. With respect to the humidity, I have been told, uh, because I did raise that uh, specter with our vendor, and I have been told that the humidity uh, reports that have been out in the, in the media are involving the long-term storage of the machines 
uh, at the facilities, not necessarily their operation on election day. Because I asked, I said, well, how come I'm just hearing about this humidity uh, for the first time? And I was told because you don't have a problem with the way that you store your machines. Your machines are stored in climate controlled environments and uh, they don't have those issues. So I'm going to try to uh, rifle through some questions quickly to get to the chairs and the other committee members. Voters had problems on Election Day with interpreters, with accessibility, and with uh, communication uh, at the poll sites. Unfortunately, this, from our experience and from what we hear, has become pretty standard uh, in New York City elections. But what made this election different, what made this a disaster even by greater standards was the scanner failure that you talked about. We've heard countless stories of poll sites left with one scanner or no scanners after paper jams. Sites where poll workers waited hours for technicians. How many scanners were out of service for any length of time on election day? I don't have that specific report. You have an initial number. Just yet. I know that we received between ballot marking devices and uh, regular scanners, we received over 3,000 uh, phone calls with respect to that on election day. How, how do you collect data on this? It, through our call center. Uh, I, no, I guess data on with the question you weren't able to answer at this point. Oh, the, the, the number of scanners down on election day for any period of time, how do you collect that each, data? Each one of the scanner machines has log data in it. So they're error logs. There are error logs. But they were designed, those logs were designed uh, basically, you know, just to be logs. They were not designed to tell you anything if you're not a technician. Uh, we work with our vendor, and they are able to reverse engineer uh, the information that's on those logs and provide us with a report post-election. But that cannot be done until after certification is completed and that they have access uh, to the machines to download the logging information. How many calls were made by poll site coordinators? to the Board of Elections reporting broken or jammed scanners? I don't have that information. Well, why don't you have that information? That's, uh, that's easy information to have. Right. I don't have it readily available. Uh, well, you should have that information for this hearing today. I have raw information which has not distilled out which ones came from the poll sites and which came from outside callers. We can distill that information and get it that to you. Uh, Mr. Ryan, that should have been done before this hearing today. I, I understand and I can assure you that it was attempted to be done. Uh, however, uh, it was not completed and for that I apologize. But we can get, this is an example of that information that we can get to you uh, relatively uh, quickly at the conclusion it of the It should have hearing. been done by today, but I look forward to getting that. So I assume you're not going to be able to answer these other questions as well. What percentage of poll sites made a call for a technician at least once on election day? You have that information? No. What was the average wait time for a technician after a call was made? Do you have uh, that information? Yes. Now, um, the, average, uh, the average time to repair uh, vary by borough. Uh, Manhattan was less than a half hour. Uh, the Bronx was a little over an hour. Uh, Brooklyn was about an hour and 15 minutes. That was the most difficult uh, borough that we, we had. Uh, Queens was slightly less than an hour, 57 minutes. And Staten Island was also uh, less than a half hour. So the average wait time for this election for scanner repairs was 52 and a half minutes. But when you couple that with- That's a long time. It is a long time. And it's longer than- Which is what created much longer lines. Correct. And it's longer than we have experienced uh, in recent elections, for sure. Are you aware of any instances where a call for a technician went unanswered? I, I'm, sh I'm not personally aware of them, but I'm sure that that happened because, given the volume of calls that we were getting on election Because our day. staff, the people that I mentioned in my opening, observed poll site coordinators calling for technicians, but their phone calls were not being picked up by anyone at the Board of Elections. Right. So there are issues on, on election day when call volume spikes. We have uh, encouraged and trained uh, the poll workers, the poll site coordinators, uh, to use their tablet devices as an alternate means of uh, communication. That uh, advice and request and suggestion is heeded by some and not by others. So, uh, so but we make every effort to get these issues resolved. 
I have many more questions on scanners, on the sequencing. I'm not going to ask those right now. I may come back for an additional round unless other members ask for it. Uh, what were you doing on election day? Where were you? I was in all five boroughs. And typically uh, what I do on election day is I remain out in the field and then the core of uh, executive management remains back at 42 Broadway and we communicate uh, throughout the day. One of the challenges in, in high uh, turnout election events as well as ones with uh, coverage is there are times where media goes to specific poll sites to follow uh, particular candidates. How long, how long did it take you to vote? I voted at IS24 in Staten Island uh, at my personal poll site, and I voted in under 10 minutes. So uh, I'm just going to end with this and then hand it over to the chairs. I get that you have to deal with arcane laws, state laws, and resource constraints. But I don't get just throwing our hands up in the face of those constraints and in the face of what the state law says. It doesn't seem like a failure of laws or a problem that we could spend our way out of. It seems like a failure to even aim for the bare minimum in our estimation. I don't have any confidence at this point, given that basic information you are not able to provide today and the analysis hasn't been done in a fulsome way in the BOE's ability to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future, let alone anticipate new problems. We are going to have a special election in February for the Office of Public Advocate, and I am concerned of uh, voters being able to have confidence that we will run that. I am embarrassed as a New Yorker by what happened on election day. I'm embarrassed by earlier news from years past about purges that took place of, of voters that should not have been purged from the voter rolls. I am embarrassed by poll sites being changed at the last minute. I am embarrassed at voter guides that don't always properly reflect accurate information. I feel like this happens over and over and over again. I can't remember an election where people said, you know what, it was done in a thoughtful, calm, professional, easy manner. New Yorkers deserve that. And I, and, I don't, and I don't have that confidence that that is going to happen. And so we are going to continue to use our oversight authority. We are going to push for changes like early voting and no excuse absentee voting, which hopefully would uh, lessen the crush of voters on election day. But I would hope that even if we are able to secure those things, that the Board of Elections would be able to implement those good changes in an effective and fair way. So I, I want to hand it over to my chairs. I will come back for additional questions. I am grateful that you're here today, but I am disappointed by what happened. I am disappointed by not having all the answers. And uh, am I going to Chair Cabrera first or Chair Torres? And I want to hand it over to Chair Cabrera. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I may. Yes. I would like to take this opportunity to renew the board's request uh, to in enter into a partnership with New York City to develop a robust municipal workers as poll workers uh, program. I have provided materials uh, to uh, this committee regarding a program of a similar nature in Los Angeles County. Uh, and if Los Angeles County can do it, New York City can do it. I'm open to that, right. but Mr. Ryan, so, so, but the, I, ma the, but ma the mayor offered $20 million that the board turned down. Why did the board turn that money down for reforms? The, the $20 million uh, that the, the, the mayor offered, uh, $7 million of that was to double the amount of poll worker training which was advice that ran counter to what we received from our outside consultant that we had already engaged the services of. Uh, so that was $7 million that was right out of the $20 million that we were already on a completely different path, number one. Number two, an additional $4.5 million of the $20 million was to resend all of the voters their registration information. That task was given by the New York City Council to the Campaign Finance Board. So right off the top, that's over $11 million that was not uh, going to ultimately come the way to, of the Board of Elections. In addition, there was $2.3 million in a poll worker pay increase. 
for $50, which we just got. Now, the board has been asking for a poll worker pay increase of $100 a day since 2005. And there are two different ways you can get it. One is from the state legislature. The other one is through executive order. Uh, and there are other things that, other money that is in here that was earmarked to outside uh, consultants. In addition, uh, there was a million dollars for a voter outreach portal, which we are uh, have developed in-house, and it's in the process of being beta tested. And when we're able to launch our new uh, website after all of the cybersecurity concerns have been addressed, that will be already done within existing funds. Mr. Ryan, if you were a voter who is sitting at home or sees coverage of this hearing, who is watching your testimony and the questions that are being asked of you, and who is not an expert in scanners, who is not an expert in perforated ballots, who is not an expert in the rules related to uh, how elections are administered, but as someone that experienced a two-hour, three-hour delay, as someone who showed up and their name wasn't in the book because they were uh, purged and removed in a way they shouldn't have been, someone that time after time has experienced uh, unfortunate issues at their voting location, uh, you, you, if you were watching that, I don't think you would want to hear excuse after excuse after excuse about vendors, about the size of ballots, about perforations. What you would want to hear is, we are going to fix this so this doesn't happen anymore in the future. They don't, voters don't care about the technicalities and the administration that happens by you and your staff and by the commissioners. What they care about is being able to go up, show up on election day, and vote in an expedited manner. That's what they care about. And when, if you listen to the testimony so far today and the answers to your questions, what you hear is what I consider to be important information that we need for our oversight capability and to be informed, but it seems like excuse after excuse after excuse. The first step, to fixing a problem is admitting you have a problem. And, and we do, and I, the point that I was trying to get to when I raised the municipal workers as poll workers uh, possibility is one serious lesson that we learned at, at this, for this election is that we have to change the way we approach scanner uh, problems. We have been reticent to allow poll workers to, to overly handle the uh, the machines for fear uh, that they would not be su sufficient. What, what if this happens again in the future? So what if the next election, the same thing happens again, where New Yorkers show up and this happens again? So what, I, what I'm trying to say, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that if these uh, ballot jams occur because of the perforation and there is no change in law, as our vendor tells us, one of the, the direct fixes that we can do is have steady staff at the poll sites who are there simply to clear what I'm going to refer to as the top side ballot jams. So if a ballot does jam, it can be cleared quickly as opposed to relying on a team of field technicians to have to be dispatched from one location to another. I suspect that that will be an element of the fix moving forward subject to commissioner approval. And then if we have that staff at the poll sites and these rather simple uh, jams occur, they can be cleared relatively quickly and keep the lines moving and avoid uh, the large backups that we had at this, uh, in this particular election. That is a direct fix that I think would address one of the issues. I just don't feel the, I, I don't personally feel confidence that this is going to get fixed. Uh, and, I, and I hope I'm wrong because I want this to be fixed. I want to turn it over to the chairs. A lot of people have questions. Chair Cabrera. Right. And Mr. Speaker, we have to work to re-earn your trust, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mike, I have to tell you, on election day, first of all, I appreciate your apology. It was going to be my first question as well. But I have to tell you, I was fuming. And let me tell you why. Never since I have been voting in this wonderful city of New York City, never have I seen so many people. We were all waiting for this day to happen. 
Then to have parents take their children, that's the part that's really getting to me. And to have such an awful experience, I can tell you in the Bronx, we have people waiting two hours. My, my Facebook was blowing up. I put a simple post. People were just livid. Just the negative reaction that we're getting and the back taste, the brackish experience. I have to tell you that inevitably, my fear is it's gonna have uh, a never negative outcome in the next election. People are gonna say, you know what, I'm not gonna go through this. Especially the young people or those who voted for the first time in a long time and they went there to vote their conviction and their beliefs. And that's the part that frustrates me the most. I, I wanna get to the machines, because uh, as I see your testimony at the very root of the problem that you're attesting to that day's uh, problem is, is the machines. I wanna get to the testing. Can you give me more detail as to the quality control that took place. And here's a specific question I'm asking. Was there ever a test that replicated the exact same experience uh, and process that the, the machines and a person were to go through an entire day? Meaning, did they start early? Did they put them to run early in the morning and make them run as many hours as we have for election day? It, it's just not possible to replicate the poll site in the, uh, in the warehouse environment. Uh, and, and the purpose of the testing, once the ballot is finalized, is different from how does it work at the poll site. The purpose of the testing, and is required by the state law, is we have to run uh, three uh, ballots per style through each scanner machine uh, to make sure that the uh, eye that uh, is in the scanner is able to read uh, the ovals and appropriately tabulate the election results. So the purpose of the pre-election testing is not the type of replication that you're suggesting. I, I hear you, Mike, but, but I'm talking about leadership here. It's been able to anticipate what the problem, that's what leaders, that's what we do. We anticipate the problem. I'm not asking whether did you do the bare minimum that was required by law. Did you order for a testing, and you have within your power to do so, right, correct? The power to say, let's replicate this. It wouldn't take a whole lot of staff. Uh, and, and, and a similar, scenario for that many hours with that many ballots. You see, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for what the law, you know, the, the, the law standard that we may have. And I'm saying that the bar is not a noble one, but what I'm saying is you knew, we all knew that this was gonna be, we're gonna have an unprecedented amount of people to come and vote. Did, did you guys, did you, did you order for such a testing to take place? No, and, and the thing that I really need to point out is the ballot for this general election for the citywide uh, election was not finalized until October the 9th. And then we first were able to order ballots from our ballot vendors. One of our ballot vendors told us they can't do it. We had to redistribute that work between two. We didn't first receive ballots for testing to test the scanners until October the 15th. Okay, so which, let me stop you right, there, Mike. Sure. I'm not trying to be rude. No, no, I, I know that. So it just, I'm trying to be parsimonious with our time. So it's October 15th to test it. You, had, you still had the state mandated test, right? You still yes. had that test. On that same day, couldn't you have run other machines to run it for that many hours because you knew, Mike, you knew there were gonna be problems. Yes, yes we did. Okay, so, and I appreciate for, for your, your, uh, your level of honesty here. Uh, you knew there were gonna be problems, and in light of that, why not do a test and say, hey, I'm anticipating problems here to take place, why not 
go ahead and test it all day, all, all the way into 9 o'clock at night to uh, emulate a, uh, a similar uh, experience. In retrospect, I am certain there are things that we could have done differently, and perhaps the suggestion uh, that you make is, is one of them. But in the moment, I'm trying to convey uh, to everyone uh, a sense of appreciation that given how late in the game this ballot was finalized, we were in real danger of not meeting our mandate of putting the election on at all. So, so, and, so like and, and asking print vendors to do something that they have never done before, three weeks before uh, an election and start that process, that lays off to the side that the Staten Island ballot wasn't finalized until October 22nd. And I commend the printing uh, companies that came through. We salute them, you did that, I'll do that myself. But what I'm addressing is, and I think you have acknowledged that in hindsight, uh, that could have been something that would be done. Here, here's another thing that I had in mind here, is another option, uh, because that was not the only thing we could have done, which was, why not have and hire more technicians, because we knew we were going to have problems, and have one for every two sites or every three sites. There is no price that we could put uh, when it comes to our most fundamental right, civic right that we have when it comes to voting. Was there any discussions regarding that? Yes, and what we did was, which we thought was a good plan, uh, prospectively, retrospectively, not so much, was we staffed the field technicians to the level that we do in a presidential election. Previously, we were staffing to those deeper uh, issues inside the machine where the ballot gets jammed internally and you need a real uh, technician uh, to, to unclear that jam. Uh, in this election, we experienced these, these jams really at the top of the scanner in a way that we hadn't uh, done, I hadn't experienced that before, and really what happened was there was an avalanche early in the morning, and we just could never catch up. But why not hire more people right from the beginning, Mike? That's well, the part that I don't get. Well, I, th I think you're right, and one of the things that I expect will happen moving forward is that we will have individuals, at, rather than relying on field teams uh, solely, which can get stuck in traffic, their vehicle can get a flat tire, there's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong. One of the things that I expect that we will do is have people at the poll sites, at all poll sites. We had 1,200 and I think 31 poll sites for this election, have people at the poll sites whose sole function it is to deal with the basic ballot jams. Not to, not to uh, engage in scanner repair, but to clear these ballot jams at the top. So if it does go down, it can be cleared in a matter of you know seconds or a minute, as opposed to waiting for a field team to come even from another location. For, uh, were these machines clean, all of them, prior to, just for point of clarification, I'm assuming that they yes. were, but I just want to hear. Yes, and one of the issues associated with the perforation, as I understand it, is that fibrous material becomes loose, uh, and the machines can get sensitive in that regard. So as a result, our technicians, all of our technicians, were uh, equipped with uh, air cans, uh, as simple as that may sound. That's the way that you fix the fibrous paper, you, you know, uh, alcohol wipes and air cans. So all of our technicians uh, had those on election day, and we made sure we had extra supply of that uh, to deal with those issues. Now, in the past, uh, actually in this election, poll workers were not allowed uh, and you testified to this in the assembly hearing, they were not permitted to clear the scanner jams themselves. However, according to the 2017-2018 poll workers basic manual under the scanner troubleshooting uh, for scanner jam, it says, uh, and I quote, a, bi a bipartisan team with police officer present can break the seal of the ballot box door open the door and check for a jam making the lid slash flaps are open. Uh, I'm just curious as to why was this taken so that I, of the 2018-2019 manual? That is a different problem and that typically deals with the setup on election day. 
The blue ballot bins have four lids that, that open up. They are supposed to be placed in the open position uh, prior to deployment. There are times when those lids can fall in uh, during transportation. And you'll see uh, on election day where the ballot bin will appear to fill up. And in fact, it's not filling up. So that's a procedure designed uh, to make sure that the ballot bin liner is in ready position to accept ballots. So, okay. So, so that's a, it's a different kind of a circumstance I, than what we were talking about moments ago. Thank you for but that. But I understand, I understand what you're saying, and we, yeah. and we agree. All right. So thank you for that clarification, but why not use the same process uh, for the top job? I mean, this is like, explain me, you know, please explain to me if I'm wrong. This is like a laser printer, right? It's similar in right. process. You open, you know, the machine, you take out the paper, you know, you clean it, and then you close it, and then you could have uh, the seal placed back, right. obviously under the supervision of a police officer and, uh, and the two coordinators that are there. I mean, why not use that process? You make a straightforward uh, and reasonable uh, suggestion. The reluctance going back to 2010 was that we were losing poll workers uh, because of their fear of, of the new machines. So a decision was made in that moment, uh, which carried through to this election. Have the poll workers do less with the machines, not more. This uh, election, in a very hard way, taught us a difficult lesson. The difficult lesson is we need, whether it's the poll worker or some other individual or individuals at the poll sites, we need to have individuals interspersed at all the over 1,200 poll sites that we use who are fully uh, versed and trained in clearing uh, the ballot jams. So should a circumstance arise, the voter will experience minimal inconvenience. That is a lesson learned. I cannot say to you exactly what form that will take today. Ultimately, we'll put a plan together. We'll present it to the commissioners. Uh, we have the plan already. We're going to present it to the commissioners. We, ha we have it right here. Uh, it's one of the things that we've been working on. And I suspect that uh, uh, with good confidence that the commissioners will uh, authorize us to move forward uh, to do that so that if a circumstance occurs beyond our control, like a jam, uh, that we'll be able to deal with it uh, quickly as opposed to relying on field teams solely. You heard my opening statement that I'm looking for solutions rather than excuses, and I, I sure hope that we will have the level of technician way above what we have right now, because anticipating that it's very possible, I'm hopeful that uh, people will not stay home after what we just went through, uh, that we'll be ready for the next time because we cannot afford to have a part two uh, to this movie. I wanted to ask you, how many people were receiving the phone calls from the coordinators about, or the public, regarding jams? It, it depends. It's a borough by borough uh, breakdown. I Go can ahead, certainly get you those, uh, those numbers. We have our call center. There was, I believe, over a, was it, is it 100 call takers we have uh, at the center? It's over 100 call takers at the, between the central office and the Staten Island call center that we centralized uh, that we do, and each borough then uh, has their own staff. So we can, we can get you uh, a number of the actual dedicated staff. I don't want to mislead, so we'll get you that number uh, after the hearing concludes. So wait, wait a second. So those 100 were taking also calls regarding jams, or they were referring to somebody else? Those are all the calls that come into our 800 number. But if I'm calling and I'm saying, I'm a member of the public, right, and I'm saying there are jams taking place in this machine, do I get referred to somebody else? Uh, no, it gets taken into the system. We have a call center uh, system. I, I suppose it's similar to 311. Okay. Uh, and then it has a drop-down list, and it, and it can tell you what the problem is. Uh, and then that gets uh, dispatched, and then ultimately, relatively quickly gets dispatched electronically to the, uh, to, the, to the technicians on their tablets out in the field. Now, you, you have some roll numbers uh, that you said you didn't have. I, I want to hear the roll numbers uh, because at the end of the day, they, they're all complaints. Yes. 
Um, raw numbers, uh, we have them broken down uh, county by county. Uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you the, the raw data. We have a total of 2,284 uh, in Manhattan alone uh, calls. Of those, uh, 1,200 were scanner and 649 were ballot jam. So I would uh, take those two as one category in, in some respects uh, because often people don't know precisely the reason why they're calling and know there's a problem uh, with the scanner. Uh, Bronx County, 1,798 total calls, 1,132 with respect to uh, scanners, uh, and 513 ballot jams. Kings County, 3,362, 2,058 scanners, 851, um, 851 ballot jams. So most of the complaints that were coming in were regarding this particular issue that we Correct, were scanners and then ballot jams. Now the, scan the ballot jam number is a smaller number, but that doesn't mean that those two things can't be read together. Somebody might say there's a problem with a scanner. Another caller may come and say there's a ballot jam. Those would drop into two How different How does this categories. compare to the previous election? Uh, it's, it's certainly higher, and I can get, I can do a comparative analysis. Do you have uh, those numbers? Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head, but we have them. And, and I, believe me, I, I do apologize. We have made our best efforts to be as prepared for this hearing uh, as we, we possibly could, and I've tried to anticipate the types of inquiries that we, we, we would be getting. Uh, but I can get you them uh, from the, the prior elections. Uh, please uh, get us those numbers, because you were going to say? Right. So the one thing I can, I can tell you, which kind of really uh, puts this uh, in some form of perspective. In 2010, uh, no, let me go with 2014. 2014, we had 253,620 voters vote in, the, in, the, in Manhattan in 2010. We only had 14 emergency ballots in 2014. Hmm. So when we were planning for this election, we look back to the last most recent event. Even if you take that and double it because of turnout, you're still talking about less than 30 emergency ballots. We have significantly higher numbers of emergency ballots in Manhattan for this election. So I just use that as, as one example. So when we're having a conversation about what did you anticipate and how did you anticipate it, our plan up to this point is always to look back to the most recent election event of similar type. And, and we saw numbers far out of, uh, out of the ordinary for this election. So I hope uh, we could take you away. I'm getting ready to pass it uh, to my co-chair, and I have some questions for later on. But I hope that at the next election and all of them thereafter, we will have enough technicians or slash poll workers. If we're going to use certain poll workers to do certain, you know, to deal with the top level jam with the right supervision to make sure, which I, to be honest with you, I, I, I'm not as amicable to the second option. I'm always afraid of people breaking through that seal. Uh, those, there were postings of machines that didn't have the seal on. I'm paranoid. And uh, my own experience, you know I share this with you, and this is the other issue that I was hearing, that people's name were not showing up. You know when I ran, uh, that my name was not there, and three pages uh, were not there, and I had to wait two hours in my day of election uh, to finally, for the pages to come in. People are, I'll be honest with you, including myself, I don't trust those paper ballots. I'm sorry for the, my paranoia, but I, I just don't trust, I don't know what people are gonna do with those. Uh, I, 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 I trust the machines uh, because there's an objectivity level for me in my mind, and I tell you the vast majority are New Yorkers, because otherwise 
uh, it would have not been an issue. Otherwise, you would have not gotten this many calls because people just don't trust paper ballots. We're not there yet. Well, we share your concerns in that regard. That's the reason we put the seals on the machines in the first place, is to prevent those kinds of things. And that was up to this point one of the major concerns about not allowing uh, the poll workers to do too much with the machines on election day. This crisis ca has caused us uh, to reevaluate that. The other thing, um, emergency ballots happen in every election, not to this volume. Uh, a poll site could lose power on election day, would be you know, out of the authority uh, of the ability of the board to prevent that. Voters don't like the emergency ballot process. They don't like to put their ballot in a slot and have it sit there uh, for scanners, uh, you know, for poll workers to scan later in the evening at the close of polls. So anything that we can do uh, that reduces the number of emergency ballots that are necessary and, and reduces the amount of overhandling of the machines will necessarily, in my opinion, increase voter confidence. Let me ask you one last question. Sure. At what point did you know we were in trouble? Um, what point did I know we were in trouble? Uh, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'll tell you how. I was going to an interview. So let me at, stop you right there. Sure. I, I just need a time. At 6 o'clock in the morning, wouldn't it have been wise maybe to call the administration to talk to do it, train really quickly, some of these, uh, you know, the tech people that we have in the city and then deploy them? Uh, I suppose that was an option that I know that offer was made. I believe it was a sincere offer. Uh, it came to my personal attention that the offer was made about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which was a little bit late in the game uh, to make a decision on the fly. But that is precisely, that offer is precisely why I have uh, provided uh, the municipal workers as poll workers materials uh, from L.A. because if we can replicate something like that and have a sufficient number of technicians uh, available to deal with these issues on Election Day from a pool of workers that we have access to you know, year-round so that we could train them and give them familiarity and we can all rest with a level of comfort that the issues that you've raised uh, don't get replicated, that would be something absolutely worthy of exploration. But you hear what I'm saying. Yes. What I'm absolutely. saying here is anticipation. Part of leadership is anticipating problems, and when a problem occurs, I need to fix this problem right away. What do I do? And so there were things that we could have done uh, prior to Election Day, uh, regarding the quality control that I mentioned, the testing that should have been done uh, while you were doing the other testing. Um, six o'clock in the morning, you knew there was a problem. I know you're under a lot of pressure, uh, more pressure than people will ever know, but Thank you. that's why you're there, right? Yes. To provide that leadership and say, we have uh, a 911 election voter problem, and I need to fix this right away who can help me to bring a solution here? And so it's not just the complaining part, it's complaining with solutions. What can we do about this? And that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking, uh, even moving forward over here. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Richie Torres. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, Mr. Ryan, I suspect you're judging by my statement, you know I'm quite angry. Yes, and, and, I, and, and I I'm not sure if I'm angrier at the Board of Elections about or about its no response or mismanagement of public housing, but it seems quite a bit is going wrong in our city. You mentioned earlier that you were unaware that humidity was a factor affecting the performance of the machines. Did I hear you correctly uh, earlier? No. What I said is I've been advised by our vendor that the reports regarding humidity deal with the storage, the long-term storage of the machines uh, and the effect of humidity uh, in the environments where they're stored. Now, clearly, we experienced a different type of uh, humidity, if you will, on, on Election Day. And wet paper 
will jam. And that was the spirit in which I made the comments at PS22 because I was watching it and people would drop the ballots on the floor and the floor was wet. So there was a lot of things going on there. I wasn't uh, meaning to say that it was a blanket cause across the city. So you're saying that humidity has an impact on the machines when it comes to storage. That's what I have been told. And humidity has an impact on the ballots because it dampens and moistens them. Is that, is that your understanding of the impact? That is, okay. that is correct. As, as I witnessed it on election day, yes. How many, how many scanners do you have in your inventory? What did I do with that report? I have it. What did I do with the scanner report? Hold on one second. I have it. 5,166. Yes. 5,166. I'm going to get to it. I want to make sure I give the right. Uh, 5,166 in total? Okay. And, and how many of those scanners were deployed on election day? There were over 4,000. I have that exact report. I'm just not putting my hands okay. on it right this second. And so what about the remaining scanners? The remaining scanners were scanners that are either spare scanners, uh, as we uh, refer to them, and here we have. So we had deployed uh, 4,054 on election day, um, and we had uh, a combination of scanners, spares, and training uh, machines at 333 in Manhattan uh, in specific. So, so it sounds like you had about 1,000 scanners in reserve. A little right? bit less, about 850. Okay, and how, how many scanners were, were swapped out for new scanners on election day? Only 56. Uh, so most of those uh, So were I guess my question is why did you only deploy 56 out of 1,000 reserve scanners, that's less than 6% six, six of your total reserves. Well, we only, we only swapped out the ones that required replacing. Most of them were because their ballot bins filled, not because the machines the failed. Case. That was the 56 that number. That uh, but in any event, New York State election law requires that we deploy uh, one scanner for every 4,000 voters. Uh, the New York City Board of Elections, uh, the commissioners have set a ratio of one scanner for every 1,400 voters. And that's uh, the foundation on which we assess poll sites. So we have to prepare uh, under a federal court mandate uh, a survey for each poll site. Every piece of equipment that's in the poll site takes up real estate. And in a gubernatorial election, it's a little bit more of a challenge because we have to deploy one privacy booth for every 250 voters, as opposed to a privacy booth for every 350 voters, which we do in other elections. And, and forgive my ignorance, of the 1,000 in reserve, can all of them be easily deployed for any election district throughout the city? No. Okay. Because, like, I'll give you, for example, I know off the top of my head, there were 924 ballot styles. Uh, in the borough of Manhattan for this past election, given all of the contests. It takes roughly uh, an hour to complete the testing for each ballot style on one scanner. If we were to deploy... You said there were 924 in Manhattan alone. Correct. So if we were to deploy a machine with all of the ballot styles, since we don't know where the breakdown's going to occur, it would, it would take... 924 hours of work per machine to get all of those ballots uh, loaded into those machines. So what we've done in the past is have uh, some at the warehouse, some out in the field, and then they have to be programmed more or less on the fly and tested quickly uh, to get them to deployed to a poll site, which is really why we try not to replace ballot scanners on election day. The machines are not that uh, limber. Uh, in order to us, for us to timely resolve the issue. Now, it sounds like the, it sounds like the process of, of programming these reserve machines is quite cumbersome. Out of the 1,000 reserve machines, how many of them were programmed for all election districts? We clear them out, and since we don't know where the, where the issues are going to arise, uh, we leave them 
unprogrammed. No, but, but in theory, you could program a machine for every election district, right? It would take an inordinate amount of time, but you could do it. Theoretically, yes, but and, I think— And it sounds like out of a 1,000, not a single machine was programmed for every election district in the city. Prior to this election, we, we have never done okay, so that. Not, we didn't do it for this election either. We have discussed— Was there any machine that was programmed for all the election districts within a county? Uh, no. And, and I think what you have to remember, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that we didn't get the ballot finalized until October the 9th. So our ability to test is a finite period of time from October but, but, the 9th. But it sounds like you did not program any of the machines over the course of a month. As, as I said, it was th three weeks, and it would take 924 hours uh, for one machine in Manhattan. But there has to be a middle ground between all or nothing, and it sounds like you opted for nothing, even though you had a month to program these machines. No, what we opted for, what was had worked in the past, we had a plan in place for full ballot bins, as with respect to actual machine failures, our plan worked, but only with respect to that, because there was only 56 machine failures citywide. What we experienced here was a, quite a number of machines uh, that had their ballot bins filled because of the turnout and because of the fact that we were putting double the amount where, of paper. Where do you store these scanners, the reserve uh, scanners? Uh, they are in their borough facilities, and then we do put a certain number out on field, uh, in the field on Can trucks. You, do you have a breakdown of the numbers? Uh, how many are centrally located? How many in borough-based facilities? Um, well, I can give you the, the breakdown of the numbers by borough, and then we can give you a report after the, uh, the election uh, with respect to where precisely they were on election day. Do, do, you, do, you, do you feel like the scanners are sufficiently dispersed throughout the city? Because it seems like you could disperse these reserve scanners throughout the city and have different scanners right. pre-programmed for different election districts. I think they were prior to this election. I think the experience of this election teaches us something different. And maybe, as you suggest, we could find that middle ground where we could load a number of uh, assembly districts onto some scanners and have them strategically placed uh, throughout the city so that we're not doing that 924-hour number for Manhattan alone uh, that we discussed. I, I want to cover some of the ground that was explored by Speaker Johnson and, and Council Member Cabrera. Can you just describe in greater detail the process of testing your machines? Because the, the criticism that I have of the Board of Elections is that it seems like you neither tested your machines for a two-page perforated ballot, nor did you train your employees on how to feed a two-page ballot into those machines. And I think whether it's elections or any field, wherever there's no training and no testing, you're likely to have a systemic failure. But can you explain in greater detail the process of testing your machines? Sure. E after the ballot is set and we get the test ballots back from the print vendor, because state law requires that we test ballots from the print run of the, uh, of the ultimate election day ballots, so that if there's any inconsistency uh, in the printing, uh, that will be picked up during the testing process. And, and did you test, and I know you point out that you received the ballot late from the Charter Revision Commission, but there's nothing that prevents you from testing your machines for a generic two-page perforated ballot. So we can test and, and you admitted to the speaker that since 2016, you've been keenly aware of the possibility of a two-page ballot. So for about two years, you've had an opportunity to test your equipment for a two-page perforated ballot. And it sounds like over the course of those two years, you failed to do so. What you're talking about is not the type of testing that we engage in uh, before an election. And the generic ballot, yes, I, I suppose we but, could but have— why, why couldn't you undertake the kind of—I mean, forget about what is actually legally required. I'm talking about what makes for good practice, what's going to prepare you for every contingency that arises. What prevents you from extensively testing either all your machines or even a sample of your machines for two-page perforated ballot. We tested, we time-tested uh, on a limited basis the amount of time that it would take a voter uh, to scan a one-page ballot versus a two-page ballot. 
I, I think the challenge for us is the people that would conduct the testing, our people, are intimately familiar with the machines and the way they work. What we experience on election day is a variable that we can't replicate in a laboratory setting, and that variable is uh, the voters uh, and their lack of, of familiarity. I'm not clear with, why that's the case. Maybe I'm not following, but why could you not have scenarios in which you ser well, you're a voter and you're, you try to feed the two-page ballot into the scanner and you could test how often it breaks down. It's, it's not rocket science. It seems like common sense. Right. I, I can tell you that the rate of actual breakage is very, very small. The rate of actual... Well, it sounds like it, there's something wrong with you because if the rate of failure in your testing is small, but the rate of failure in real life is quite high. Well, so there's a disconnect between... I, well, I, what I'm trying to get to is... It is a differential, there's a differential between scanners that were completely out of service and scanners that had momentary problems and some of them lasted longer, much longer than they should have. Those are two different problems for us uh, to attack. I can tell you what we saw in this election with respect to these basic jams that were occurring on the top side of the machine that did not put the machine out of service for the day was at a rate we had never seen before. But those were precisely the kind of jams that your previous man manual will have a bipartisan team of poll workers no. correct. Am I wrong? No. What, what the, the jams that we're talking about in the manual are really jams that occur based on the setup of the machines, mostly that will be prior to the start of Election Day and be noticed some point later in the day when, uh, depending on volume, how quickly the distance between the top of the uh, of the blue ballot bin now closed and the, and the bottom of the, of the scanner it itself is. Do we have the language from the manual? The language from the manual? Yeah, the 2017-2018. What, uh, and I'll come back to the manual. I want more about, want to know more about the, let me read it. Uh, this is from the 2017-2018 manual. It indicates a bipartisan team with police officer present can break the seal on the ballot box door, open the door, check the jam for making sure the lid flaps are open. It speaks about jams generally. Right. It's not specific. What I'm saying so, so is that, that is the a new manual makes no mention of a bipartisan team of workers resolving the jam. Instead, those workers have to inform the coordinator, and the coordinator has to wait for a technician which has the effect of exacerbating delays. That is certainly a lesson that we learned uh, in this past election, which I believe is, it, it was the thrust of my testimony uh, with Chair Cabrera, which is we need to have individuals, right. whomever they turn out to be, whether they're poll workers, whether they're municipal workers, whether they're our workers, we need to have people at the poll sites throughout election day that have the ability to clear the basic jams. That will keep the line moving. Up to this point, we've been concentrating our efforts on the more serious uh, jams, the ones that could either cause the machine to completely fail or require. But you could actually do both. If, if you have yes. the poll workers focus on the simple jams, you can free up the technicians for the more complicated jams. You're killing two birds with one stone. Correct. And that is a lesson that we learned so, in, in this election okay. based on the increase uh, in volume of jams that we saw but, on but the top side But I just want to be clear, your, your previous statement, if I heard you correctly, during your exchange with Councilmember Cabrera, is that historically you've been hesitant to allow poor workers to correct jams. That's not true, because your previous manual explicitly authorizes a bipartisan team of poll workers but that to correct a, jams. Because in that specific instance, that one specific it instance. It doesn't specify any instance. Right. It speaks generally of a scanner jam. Right. So. What I'm, I'm trying to tell you from experience, that type of jam would occur as a, a problem with the setup of the machines at the start of election day. It is possible that those flaps could drop down during election day as well. They typically don't. They, they will drop down either because they left the warehouse in a closed position, which they should not have been, or they could drop down during transportation. And, and if we don't have the poll workers do those types of clearances, the poll site will, won't get up and running. Or if there's a high volume, 
the distance between the top of the closed ballot bin and the bottom of the scanner will fill up quickly, and then the machine will be out of service. So the first line of defense is to have them uh, check that and make sure that the, 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 the ballot bin flaps are op in the open position ready to accept ballots. I want to know more about the actual scanners. So what's the age of the underlying software? These scanners, and there have been upgrades over the course of time, these scanners have been in use since uh, 2010, uh, after the... Uh, no, the, the software. The, the software, oh, we have the most recent uh, version, I believe it's been upgraded within the last 18 to 24 months. Understand when we recognize an issue with the software or the hardware of these machines, uh, there is an extensive uh, change process that we have to engage with the vendor and the New York State Board of Elections uh, to complete. The City Board of Elections has no authority to, Im to make any changes or request that the vendor make any changes to the machine, and, the and software. That, that, that point is taken. Right. What is the useful life of your scanners? Um, I have been told uh, You've that... You've been told? Well, I have been told that uh, th there was a... Uh, approximately uh, a 10-year... I'm sorry, uh, why are you so... Uns I mean, that to me is one of the most important questions, is the age of your, of your infrastructure. Right, it's, it's, it's a 10-year cycle as, as I understand it. Okay, so it's uh, 10 years. So I, I, I'm sorry, and, and so I, within I, the I occasionally over-lawyer an answer because I don't want to say anything uh, that's, that's misleading. Okay, um, so 10-year useful life. Within the 10 years, what's the age of the... We have used it for nine election cycles, okay. and we taxed these machines uh, at this so election. So these, these machines are on the verge of, of exceeding their useful life or arriving at their useful life. Do you intend to replace them before the useful life expires? There is new technology uh, that is available uh, through different... So, so don't speak to me like a lawyer. Right. Do you intend to replace them, yes or no, before... If, if we have... Uh, the money, and it makes uh, fiscally prudent sense to not try to extend the life cycle and to purchase new machines, uh, we will do that. It will be a balance, uh, a balancing act to determine when a new system, a completely new system might so, be available. So there's a question mark over whether you're going to replace machines that are about to approach their useful life. Right. I find that well, the, quite the thing troubling. Is, no, I, I wouldn't be quite so troubled on that for this reason. We can replace as needed the machines that we presently have under the contract and go with a, a newer uh, DS200 scanner. Where the balancing act comes from a fiscal prudency perspective is there is new versions. So can I ask out of, out of the 5,000 scanners in your inventory, how many of them are approaching their useful life? I would say virtually all of them. Virtually all of them. But, but we monitor them. We do preventative maintenance. Yep. Our a vendor does preventative maintenance, and they're evaluated over the course of time right. to make sure that they're functioning properly. If they need to be swapped out, uh, we can do that on a machine-by-machine -machine basis relatively easily. The point that I'm trying to make to you, Mr. Chair, is that there are new systems out there, and we have to then make a balancing act judgment collectively, not just the Board of Elections. Do we spend the money to replace uh, these machines that we have? that are based on uh, 10 to 13 year old technology, or do we transition as a state to a new system uh, that would, uh, would take uh, the voting into the future? All of that is not an either or proposition. I suspect that it lies somewhere in the middle, that we'll have to replace some of these DS200 machines over the course of time if they determine themselves to be uh, unreliable. But if a wholesale replacement of the system is in the offing, which I understand so it may and be I, possible, so your, we'll your have to make a judgment. Taken. I just can't quite wrap my head around the fact, around the lack of testing, because you acknowledge the two-page ballot is not only unusual, but to your knowledge, is nationally unprecedented. Is that, did I correctly understand your testimony? Or? No. Multiple-page ballots are not unprecedented. Okay. What is unprecedented is the requirements of Election Law Section 7-106, Subdivision 1, which requires that if we have to go to a two-page ballot, that it has a center perforation. Okay. So a perforated two-page ballot. Right. So 
Right. So what you had, say, in Manhattan... Uh, I, I don't want to dwell on this point. Right, okay. But I want to... You made a comment that you cannot be expected to have a crystal ball, but you certainly knew or should have known that a unprecedented two-page perforated ballot was going to double the amount of strain that you're placing on your aging machines, machines that are near the end of their useful life. So given what you clearly knew or should have known, are you going to acknowledge that you made a mistake in not testing whether these machines were prepared to process a two-page perforated ballot, to prepare to process what you describe as a volume of, quote, unprecedented proportion? I I've yet to hear an acknowledgment of a mistake that was made. The timing of when all of this happens uh, put us in a very, very difficult position. But we, I, we, we, we've explored this before. I understand. Again, there's nothing Mr. that prevents Chair, you what I'm, what from I'm, testing it for a generic ballot. You don't need the exact wording right. to test the machines generally for a generic two-page perforated ballot. Right. I, I just want to, and I'll end it here, but it seems like there was, there was no, you, you failed to test your machines for the two-page ballot. You failed to train your employees. You changed your manual in a way that led to inefficient responses to correcting paper jams. And your reserve system strikes me as broken. Right? None of your machines were programmed for, any, for all of the election districts. So it seems like the combination of policy choices that the board made made the voting experience far more painful than it had to be. I am certain that we could have done better. There's no question. Oh, you question. certainly could have done better. There's there, no question. There's no question about that. Yeah. What, I, what I'm trying to avoid is making a commitment uh, to changing something in a specific way when I'm a lawyer by trade, not a, not a technology technician by trade. So we're going to sit down, as we always do with our vendor post-election, and come up with things that we can reasonably do within the time frame of each election to improve things uh, going forward. And assuming that we can't stop those top jams from occurring, if we're using a two-page ballot, we'll have appropriate personnel at the ready, however we comprise that, to make sure that they're in each poll site to remove uh, those ballot jams quickly so that we're not waiting for field technicians upwards of an hour to get there. Well, I just want to be clear. I'm just deeply ashamed of how we manage elections in New York City. As I said in my testimony, it's unworthy of our greatness as a city. It's an embarrassment. Uh, there's nothing resembling the 21st century in how we administer our elections. Uh, and I'm, I just remain, I continue to have no confidence in the ability of the Board of Elections to correct some of the problems uh, that were brought to light by this committee hearing. I, I could ask a million questions, but I want to give my colleagues an opportunity to cross-examine. So, uh, Councilmember Cabrera, thank you. Thank you uh, so much to my co-chair uh, for your line of uh, questions. Uh, just 20 second questions. You give me all the raw data for all the boroughs uh, when it came to the complaints of ballot jams, uh, but I did not hear Queens. Can you give me Queens real quick? Oh. Certainly, if I can get myself back to that. I don't want <laughs> uh, great people the, and uh, my balls. colleagues from Queens to feel uh, neglected. I'm sorry. We're shuffling a lot of paper around here, Mr. Chairman. I had that moments ago. Well, maybe one of your right. staff. So, yes, yeah, uh, so I got it now. Uh, it was just a question to put my hands on it. Uh, Queens, 1,914. 1,230 uh, were scanner type, uh, and 785 uh, were ballot jams. Okay, thank you for that number. And with that, uh, I'm gonna call on my colleagues. Uh, we're gonna put a five minute clock, but we'll do a, definitely a second round uh, to make sure we get all your questions in. And with that, we start with Council Member Powers. Thank you, thank you, the Chair, for having this hearing. And I, like others, experience being outside of polling places this year and having people actually walk off, walk out, and say, to the you know the scanners are down, the lines are, are, are jammed up, and I have to walk home. I have to go home, and I'm not going to vote, which is you know disheartening. I know you share that 
that, that as well. I think when we talk about right now in the city, some of the agencies and some of the systems that have the biggest challenges uh, of public confidence, it's the MTA, public housing, and I would put elections up there as well. I think the difference that I know, and others have noted this to me on election day, is the, day, the challenges of like the MTA, for instance, are really managing a tremendously large system day to day, 365 days a year, 24 seven in New York City. The difference here is that we get three or four times a year, maybe tops, where we have to run these elections. So the expectation to me should be higher that these are well executed, if that's a, I think that's a fair comment, that the uh, ability to prepare, anticipate, and be ready for what is a, a, a moment in time, three or four times a year, um, should give us a higher confidence that we are ready for that because of so much time to prepare. I also will note, I actually went to the Board of Elections before the primary to see some of the ballot count, the ballot preparation, and I will say there's definitely a lot of work that goes behind the scenes that we are not aware of, and I do encourage everybody to go and have these discussions. Um, but I, and I will also note that I think the, 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 the crisis of confidence is beyond just a two-page thing. I think I, there were polling places in my district didn't have pens, an elevator that was broken so people who were ADA, access, who needed ADA accessibility couldn't vote and went home the other things I mentioned. Um, what I note in the testimony, and I note kind of moving in kind of in these, uh, these sort of regular hearings that are had, is really a kind of a failure to put a plan forward, like a series of recommendations today. Like the CFB does a report at the end of every election cycle where they issue their next series of recommendations, and many of us look at that, I know I look at them. We see uh, the MTA has a fast forward plan. What I think is missing is a plan that actually outlines the priorities. Municipal poll workers, I heard that today, so I understand that, but what are the things that the city needs to do in a sort of comprehensive format and plan? So I was wondering if maybe you could share that with us, is to move forward, special election coming forward, 2020 presidential election, primaries in general, what are the things, both for election day operations and to improve the entire voter experience, like top five maybe, that the council, the mayor's office, and the board of elections need to put into place to make sure that voters can walk in, have a reasonable time to vote, have few to none issues with voting, and that that series of things I noted where you get you vote three times a year, maybe twice, maybe once, that that is a, a, a close to flawless experience. Right. So I, I hope that what is expressed here today uh, by me on behalf of the Board of Elections is a deep and abiding respect for the process and, and what this uh, council uh, committee uh, is doing. Uh, but I also respect the process uh, within the board. So before I have an opportunity to make recommendations along with staff to the commissioners and have them pass on it as they are the decision makers with respect to policy, that's my reticence, not in reaching solutions, but I want to make sure that I respect our internal process as well. But some of the things that I think that we can certainly do uh, moving forward uh, is, as I said, have qualified staff at the poll sites ready to clear ballot jams. The municipal workers as poll workers is a big deal and it's doable. The other thing that we would like to be able to do if we can is to encourage young people uh, to become more involved in elections and do a nice robust uh, students as poll workers uh, a program which would help us get younger uh, because we are implementing more and more technology in the poll sites, including tablets, which uh, we worked collectively with the city council and the mayor's office to secure uh, the funding for that. Um, as we implement more technology into the poll sites, that's going to require more individuals at those poll sites with technical expertise. That does go into then poll rate of poll worker pay. Who are the folks that we're going to be utilizing to do this? Is it students, CUNY and high school students? Is it uh, municipal workers? Is it uh, you know, the poll workers? Who are going to perform the, these tasks? All of that factors into the equation. And then I would also ask, since we are a ministerial agency and we don't wade into the political waters with respect to legislation unless invited, uh, and then at the direction of the commissioners, it's incumbent upon all of us to work collectively to get the adjustments and amendments to the New York State election law to be made uh, quickly with an appropriate plan of implementation. We are living in an electronic 
voting machine world, and we are operating under lever machine rules. Okay, I, I appreciate it. I'm going to stop you there. So, so, a, yep, sure. So, I, look, but I, I would still invite you, and I know the, the political realities here and things like that, but I do think it is important that agencies that administer things like, like the Board of Elections and other things have plans that are public and recommendations that are public. It's both for the public confidence, but also so we can do our jobs. And we talk about a municipal workers program. Like, I would invite you to come and meet with all, all of us to talk about how to implement that and how to how to execute that because I I am familiar with it but I'm not sure that we all know how that works and what we need to do it. The um, uh, I assume other things like early voting are things that the board supports. Well, those those are more uh, political in nature, but I will say this: uh, generically, any uh, amendment to the election law that can maintain or increase voter participation while it, at the same time, de-stressing the volume uh, on, uh, of voters at the poll site on election day will be helpful. Okay, uh, appreciate that. I have another question. Is, there, is, it, is it not possible for you to do, I mean, one of the problems that a lot of people have with voting is they all show up at the same time after work or sometimes before, right? midday is dead, and they all go to vote because they're required, they have to go vote at their local polling place, at the school or wherever nearby. Is there not an allowance to, to make more polling places available to people to vote where they're close to where they work? If you, live, if you work in Midtown, you work down here, right. an, an ability to be able to vote. I mean, I think you can do that through early, like if of showing up to do absentee voting. Why can't I vote in Midtown if I work in Midtown? That would require uh, a change in legislation and a change in the voting system as we presently know it. Is there technology available that could accommodate that? Uh, absolutely. And I knew uh, that during Hurricane Sandy, I think that something something similar well, to that, uh, right? Uh, because of exec an executive order. Right, that was an executive order and that presented, that was only top of the ticket. So it, it, in some sense, the, the executive order did the best it could under the circumstances, but it, it wasn't helpful to those people that were looking You couldn't for vote for your local race Correct. because, right, right, I understand. Um, the, but I, I think it's something that's worth advocating for. I, even another way to ease voting is to make more polling places available. Can you talk about next year we have a charter, uh, we may have a charter, we have a charter commission active today. Does that mean next year we believe there might be a two-year, there's less elections next year, but will there be two-page ballots anywhere next year? I'm anticipating that we'll be able to fill, fit all of the contests uh, in next year's election on the, on the first page. Uh, there will be an extra contest that we uh, are now going to have to do with the result of, of the election of Letitia James to the Attorney General, because we'll have a citywide event uh, next year as well. Uh, which wasn't going to be the case for public. But sorry, you think it's a, we, we do anticipate it to? No, to, I'm okay, anticipating no. that we'll be able to fit all of the contests on the front uh, and then the proposition questions on the back, and we, we should not have these issues replicated. Got it. Just, I just had two more questions, and then I'll give my, my time back to the chair. Well, we're going to have a second round. I'll, can I just finish up? Because I have Real to quick. run. So, yes. um, you mentioned two questions, and I'll let you I'll say, ask you. One is you re just said you, you mentioned rejecting $7 million for poll worker training uh, because an outside consultant had advised you to do so. Can you provide more light on that? Sure. And, and I'll, I'll ask the second one at the there, same time. There was, a, there was a suggestion made that we double the amount of poll worker training from six hours to 12 hours. Uh, prior to that suggestion being made, we had engaged the services of Election Center, which collectively has 150 years of experience uh, conducting elections. And what we were told was that the reason we were having difficulty retaining poll workers was because the six-hour training was too long. And the whole uh, training program was revamped. We came up with a color-coded uh, manual system, and the training thrust was then to train the poll workers to be able to refer to the reference manual uh, to be able to deal with problems on election day, as opposed to trying to cram the entire election law uh, into the into the poll workers' heads at a six-hour training. Got it. I heard. The, I've actually heard the same complaint about the too much training, but there was a balance here. So, so it just became a philosophical difference. It wasn't a question of do, do we didn't want the resources. You know, we we would certainly uh, be able to use that for other things, but just not. It was earmarked for a specific purpose. And, and last question for the New York City Charter Vision Commission that is out there today: Do you have recommendations that you are making to them about ways to improve the charter around elections and voting? Uh, we haven't been invited into this current process yet. We we did have some conversations uh, with the, with the previous go round, uh, although limited. We were not invited uh, to testify. But if there are specific uh, 
issues that uh, the Charter Com Revision Commission wants us to, us to testify about and puts it out there to us, I will uh, seek the permission of the commissioners uh, to participate in that testimony. I, I don't know the process internally, but I will say, like, I, I've, I participated, I wasn't invited. Right. I, I mean, my point is, like, this is, seems to be, just to, to be frank, like, this is, seems to be what the attitude is, is, like, we will, we will show up when we are asked to show up, rather than this is an important thing. I think the Campaign Finance Board testified, but like, I think this is an important thing that we care about. This is an opportunity to improve it, and we will be there and make sure we're there when there's opportunity arises for us. I, I, it just seems like that you don't have to be invited to testify at the board at the oh, charter okay that i wasn't aware of the protocol what i'm simply saying is if i'm going to make any statements publicly in that regard i have to take my marching orders from the board of commissioners okay thank you thank you so much uh we're going to be uh hearing now from council member deutsch followed by jaeger lander and traeger and just thank uh, you very much yeah. and thank i think you. most a lot, of the, a lot of the questions were answered and i want to thank um uh, Chair Cabrera and Chair Torres and the speaker for asking the many good questions um, on today's uh, subject. Um, my, um, my first question is, is, how many technicians do you have per borough? If you uh, look at all five boroughs. It, it varies from uh, election to election. Uh, and I have, uh, in, in this particular election, uh, we had 36 uh, AD monitoring teams in Manhattan. I'm sorry, 36 where? AD monitoring teams in Manhattan. F uh, I understand. Uh, but the AD monitoring teams, the general office teams, a combination of our AD monitoring teams, our general office teams, our ES&S technicians, and our borough technicians uh, can all deal with the types of ballot jams uh, that we experienced. If you want me to confine my response to just technicians, we had uh, 14 uh, teams of ESNS techs in Manhattan, 24 board techs, uh, 11 uh, teams of ESNS techs in the Bronx, 25 uh, board techs, 19 ESNS teams in Brooklyn, uh, 33 BOE techs, uh, 16 ESNS techs in Queens, uh, and 19. Uh, uh, BOE techs uh, in Queens. Uh, but we did have uh, the entire city blanketed with respect to individuals who could clear basic ballot jams. So in Staten Island, you had 19? Uh, I, don't, I don't have the, the Staten Island information. I don't know where that portion of this report went uh, as I was shuffling my papers, but we could certainly get that to you as well. So um, in which bar did you have more complaints on election day? The most uh, complaints that we had could pursuant to our telephone data that we um, submitted earlier was Brooklyn. It is Brooklyn. So if you take a look, do you know the population in Brooklyn? The overall voting population is 1.4 million. 1.4. And in, do you know per borough? Uh, the, the per borough breakdown of voters? Yes. Uh, yes. We have... Uh, Which one has like the least amount of voters? Staten Island. Staten Island. And you have, uh, that's what I'm checking, because in Brooklyn you have the highest population, right? Then comes uh, Queens, then you have Manhattan, then you have the Bronx, uh, then you have Staten Island. And I'm looking at the numbers, you had in Staten Island you had probably almost as much as in Brooklyn, and Staten Island the population itself, not voters, is 480,000. We had 12 BOE techs in Staten Island and two ESNX uh, techs. Uh, each borough uh, presents its own set of challenges. Uh, Staten Island, while small in population, uh, is uh, large uh, with respect to land mass and infrastructure uh, is not available. So we can't rely on anything really than automobile transportation uh, in, um, in Staten Island. But uh, we think that based on the types of scanner failures that we experienced, we had sufficient text to deal with the absolute failures of scanners. What we didn't have sufficient text to deal with these jams that occurred on the top side of the scanner, that, the likes of which we had not experienced uh, before, and that's gonna be part of our plan moving forward to ensure that we can deal with those quickly and get those scanners that haven't been disabled uh, back up and running uh, as fast as we can. What, uh, what would you say is the comparison from the, um, the current 
scanners and the manual ballot machines that we had before in comparison to compliance? It, it's, it, it's night and day in some respects. Is, but is the, it better but, the way we had it before? Uh, we had a ha much higher degree of emergency ballots, uh, although it, pre it, it predated me. It, it, we had a much higher degree of emergency ballots with the uh, lever machines than we do uh, with the current scanner machines. So, um, as far as responding to complaints, did you, did you, do you have more complaints now with the digital way it's done or the way it I, used I to be? I think the complaints are different. There is a different set of challenges when dealing with an electronic uh, voting machine. Uh, we do have, you believe the way it's done now is better than before? Uh, it's certainly more accurate in terms of the vote count, and without question. So you're saying that up until the um, up until modern technology, it wasn't accurate. That that so is correct. I could. I could have to go through all the elections prior to the. Well, I digital. can tell you only from the experience that I had. The one election that we used uh, lever machines uh, since I've been the executive director, there was in in the borough of Queens had the highest number. We had over thirty, uh, close to thirty five hundred votes that were unaccounted for in the discrepancy report. So that's a major issue for every election that happened up until the mechanical, until the, the I, newer I, machines. I, I can't speak to what happened uh, in, in years past. Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't here. What I can tell you is if you look back and you look at the discrepancy reports in the elections when we used lever machines, I will guarantee you that those numbers were higher than they are uh, with uh, the electronic machines. These. The, sure. These, these machines, as a tabulator, are very uh, accurate. Okay, finally, um, I just want to ask one last question. Um, so, you answered many of the questions in the hearing. So, you know, we all, all, all the members here, we have an office across the street in 250 Broadway. And when the machines get jammed, I'm sure many of us or all of us have that air can and the alcohol pads. Uh, if you need some, we could could give you some, but when you have these issues in any office in the city and a machine gets jammed, right, people have their own responsibilities, but they tend to fix those jams by just taking that spray can or the alcohol pad to fix that. And you mentioned that you, you're going you, you're gonna, to um, reform that by bringing extra manpower, which is great, and I think uh, that's moving in the right direction. But what disturbed me was is that you mentioned that if these machines are not feasible for two-page ballots, you mentioned you'll have technicians there. So if it's not going to be feasible, if you anticipate that you will have a problem with a two-page ballot, that you will have to put technicians there, um, the voting is from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. If I have to take a 15-hour trip, with a uh, battery that is half charged, that's faulty, I'm not gonna take that 15 hour trip with a battery charger in my trunk. I'm gonna go maybe rent a car or take mass transit. If you anticipate that um, it's not feasible for two pages, the machines are gonna jam up, but you're gonna have to put technicians there, then I think that's an issue. Yes. Um, so, so putting a technician there is not the answer. The answer is, is having machines that are operable. So the point that I was trying to make is, as I have been told, other jurisdictions use multiple page ballots. Other jurisdictions, however, don't have the perforated stub or the center perforation, and the, and the experts tell me that it is the, perfor the perforation that's the problem. There could be a change in New York State Election Law 7-106 Subdivision 1 uh, to do away with the center perforation requirement, and then you would have a two-page ballot, but all of the edges would be machine cut, and you would uh, lessen the amount of fibrous material that becomes uh, present, as well as the manner in which uh, the machine feeds it. I, I understand that there's going to be real experts in that, uh, in that area that are going to be testifying later, but that is a simple legislative fix that other jurisdictions manage ballot accountability without having a stub and without having a center perforation. And it seems to me, in that regard, fears maybe were right at the time, 
but the legislative action resulted in a pound of security for an ounce of cure. Right? So, 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 they is, will, this, they will, so is this being uh, discussed now in the state, you're saying? I'm hopeful. Uh, I know that there's going to be uh, legislative changes. Now that we have uh, the day of reckoning has come and the center perforated two-page ballot was a reality uh, and we saw how it performed, which was not well, that I'm hopeful that the appropriate legislative changes will be made to give boards of election uh, throughout the state the flexibility that they need uh, to be able to conduct elections uh, fairly and conveniently for the voters. Council Mayor, we're gonna do okay. our second round. Thank you. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I uh, just want to uh, acknowledge that previously we we're, were joined by Councilmember Ben Kalos and now with Councilmember Gibson, and now we will hear from Councilmember Yeager, Udinus Rodriguez, Lander, and Traeger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director, let's just uh, get one question out of the way just to, to make sure there's no confusion. Uh, lever machines currently allowed to be used in the state of New York? No. That's because federal law doesn't allow that, is that correct? Uh, yes. If you New woke up tomorrow morning and said that the next election is going to use lever machines, you'd be violating federal law? For federal elections, correct. Okay, thanks. Let's just want to make sure that that's, uh, that's uh, stated. Okay, um, how much does a scanner cost, the current ones that you're using? Uh, slightly under $7,000. $7,000. Does it make sense to have uh, an election inspector fiddling around with the uh, machinery that costs substantially more than the $300 printer that I have in my office? That has been our reluctance, quite frankly. All right. Um, the, uh, the scanners that we use now, which were put into play, say, eight, nine years ago, is there, and I know Chair Torres uh, uh, delved into this, I wanted to just get a little deeper on it, are there uh, is there a scanner on the market, and you may have addressed a little bit, but is there a scanner on the market that has the ability to simply receive the data of all the different ballot types that are in the city, which are probably upwards of a couple of thousand, and have that information in it without putting aside the requirement that we test each ballot, because that is a state requirement, to receive that data and then have that information in it so that they could be deployed uh, as needed. Yes, I'm aware of two separate products similar with two different vendors that would accomplish that. Okay, so not to answer now, but if you can look into the cost of those and, and let the council know what that would be because we're about to do the November plan and then we're going to start talking about the budget coming up just really around the corner, but if the mayor and the council would know what that is because it's not like you have a checkbook in your desk, I assume that you can just whip it out and start writing checks I, to buy I new do, machines. but not enough to cover the cost of the machines. Okay, all right. Um, but, but, Councilman, just to be yes, clear, um, my understanding is that one system that I'm aware of uh, is on the path to certification uh, through the State Board of Elections and may very well be certified during the summer of 2019. Right. Until that certification process is complete, it's as if it doesn't exist to us. So, Mr. Director, the, the State Board, uh, I believe, is here, uh, uh, I was told, and will be uh, testifying later, so maybe they can help shed some light on where they're up to. Um, and I agree with, with what you've said earlier, is that if there were one statewide system, it would really not make sense for the city of New York to put its own uh, thing into the world and then have, you know, six months later, the state of New York say we're doing something different than all of our millions of dollars of equipment right. go into the garbage. We, we try to be responsible. Okay. And if something new is coming, we don't want to engage in wholesale replacement of scanners uh, that we have presently. Can you, can you explain, uh, you indicated uh, that there were 924 ballot styles in Manhattan, which seems like a lot, and recognizing that there are different uh, uh, jurisdictional uh, districts which overlap in some ways and don't overlap in other ways. Is 924 the bare minimum number of ballot styles that you were able to do? Would you have been able to, to get away with doing less ballot styles in Manhattan? Well, certainly I think we could have, uh, we could explore the opportunities to have some number of ballot styles uh, loaded onto the machines and have them placed uh, strategically throughout the borough. Okay. We have not done that to this point. Uh, I was simply trying to connote 
what it would undertake if we were trying to make a generic machine for the whole borough uh, that would have all I got that. And I'm on the clock, so I'm going to try to speed yep. up a little bit. Um, uh, when you were uh, having conversation with Chairman Torres earlier, you indicated there were a thousand reserve scanners, and then something that you know, I wrote a note, and then you actually said it a couple of minutes later, um, of exploring the, the ability. We have about 70 to 80 assembly districts in the area, in, in the city of New York, and that's really how we separate out our election systems. And if you were able to, say, have 10 machines in each AD, which had the data for all the potential ballots of that AD, and then strategically located, uh, you'd be able to quickly deploy machines within an AD, which makes more sense, I suppose. Correct, but the, the spare machines in this particular election were an integral part of our plan uh, in dealing with overflowing ballots, which, is, which was the primary focus in the lead up to election day. We really didn't know, A, what turnout would be. We knew it was going to be greater, and we have no control over when the voters show up. What we saw in this election as well was a crush of voters coming early in the morning. Now, I suspect they were trying to beat the rain and, and get out quickly. We had a certain uh, number of reserve scanners on the side, so if these ballot bins are filled up, that we'd be able to move them out and still secure the ballot material, since that's part of our responsibility as well. Mr. Chairman, if I can just uh, go on with one or two quick questions, and yeah. I'll uh, wait quick. for the second Thank round. You. Thank you. Um, the the uh, scanners that uh, I'm sorry, I'm withdrawn. The when you were in Crown Heights uh, and you discussed the wet ballot, what time of day did you say that was? Uh, th that had to be between 11:15 and 11:30. Okay. When the uh, there's a process right now for when in, when a machine hits five, when a scanner hits 500 ballots uh, scanned in, somebody from the site has to notify the Board of Elections. You're aware that that's the rule? Yes. Okay. Does that data result in somebody maybe going out there and checking a scanner uh, without having any knowledge that there's a problem, but just because we've gotten a report that a scanner's hit the 500? What happens with that data is my question. Well, what we were trying to convey to the poll workers um, is the ballot ca bin capacity is about 1,400 uh, pieces of paper. So by putting that 500 notification uh, requirement in was our own plan to try to stay ahead of the, what we anticipated to be overflowing ballots at the end of the So basically, day. by the time they hit the third call, that bin is full and they have to do the envelope, the, the sealed bag and the envelope Correct. and all that stick. This okay. was an attempt on our part to stay ahead of the issue throughout the day. Okay. Um, the, what, this is uh, real quick, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, what is the average number of voters at, po at a poll site in New York City? We, uh, it, if you it, know. It, it goes, it varies average. greatly. I, I couldn't even tell you average. Some, we have two site scanners. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, we have two scanner sites, and we um, have 20. You no, know, I, I appreciate that, Director. I'm, I'm referring to sites building, whether it's the lobby of an apartment building right. in the middle of Brooklyn, or whether it's a. On average, building. we could say is a rough guesstimate 4,000 voters per. Okay, um, is, is there is there any? You know, one of the things I, I thought about in the last couple of weeks, uh, um, really since primary day, but more so in the last 10 days or so is that you know, we have places in America where there are 300 people registered to vote at the local firehouse and the election goes quite smoothly and you know, they roll in, they roll out, and life goes on and all is great. And we don't have that luxury here in the city uh, to have a poll site with you know, two, 300 voters at the local firehouse. And I'm wondering what, if any, uh, resources, efforts you need uh, either to do yourself or to ask the administration and the council for help in creating new poll sites to, to divide up the very large sites that we see have problems because it's not just in my estimation, and by the way, I voted in under five minutes at, uh, in Brooklyn on election day, so you know, I don't want to be the example, but uh, I, I know that not everybody had to wait online for an hour, I believe. Um, what, what would you need to do to split up those super large sites uh, that, that have been the result of problems in this election and the primary and just historical problems since the uh, insertion, uh, the creation of the scanner machines. We need access to buildings that are accessible to all New Yorkers. One of the things that we're doing uh, to offset uh, the deficiencies at the poll sites that we, we have to use is we 
now, now, now think about this. We had 1,231 poll sites in, in the city of New York. We had to install temporary, temporary ramping equipment at 503 sites. We used 17 vendors at 387 sites. Uh, and, uh, and we do 116 on our own between our efforts and the efforts of the Board of uh, the Department of Education. Uh, going back to 2014, we had no vendors doing this. We were moving poll sites. We were getting beat up for moving poll sites. People don't like their poll sites moved. I get it. So we've now, we spend quite a bit of expense money resources uh, to make poll sites temporarily ex accessible when capital expenditure to fix the problems could really be uh, the answer. Okay. I, I will tell you, Mr. Director, that in my experience, uh, uh, something that I've seen is that I think the board, I'm not really sure what standard the board uses for uh, handicap accessible. Um, I, I mean, I know in my district, they, the board has a problem with a particular poll site that's a senior center and saying that it's not handicapped accessible. And I know that there are, you know, 100 year old Holocaust survivors that make it up the ramp that's there. And the board's position is that's not good enough. And in my district, there's a local community board, which is a ground floor storefront. And they literally, I'm telling you it's true, they came in and they installed a, a, some kind of mat or ramp. And I've been in that office 100 times. and. It never seemed to me. So I'm wondering if there's maybe uh, your, 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 the board uses too heavy of a definition of what is uh, accessible and what the need for accessible are. And I appreciate Thank it, Mr. Chairman, and I'll leave it at that right. and let him Thank answer. Thank you. That, Thank you so much, because I know we, uh, that, we have a second round. That accessibility standard that we go by uh, is as a result of a federal lawsuit. And we are operating under uh, a, a federal mandate to utilize uh, the services of Evanteri associates, uh, associates to survey all of the poll sites that we use for accessibility. And we work with Evanteri to uh, make sure that we implement uh, their recommendations. And we meet regularly with the disability rights advocates who are counsel uh, for the accessibility community uh, to implement these challenges. And some of them, I mean, we, we've had ramps in, uh, in Upper Manhattan, in the Heights, for example, that are over 100 feet long. Uh, we have uh, level landing systems that look like they're on flat ground, but because there's a standard, we have to place it uh, over, over what appears to be flat ground. Uh, so we follow what the federal court uh, is telling us to do uh, by utilizing the services of this outside vendor. Uh, and we have taken the position of trying like heck to not move poll sites if we can avoid it. And that's why we have the extensive uh, temporary ramping uh, that we're doing. Okay, I, I want to get back to this later, but I, um, Mr. Chairman wants to allow the colleagues to uh, have questions. So thank you very much, Mr. Director. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the patience of all the, uh, my colleagues. Uh, uh, Councilmember Danis Rodriguez, followed by Councilmember Lander and Trey. Thank you, Chair. First of all, thank you for the work that you do in assisting that definitely need to be restructured. Uh, one of my concerns is about the immigrant borders. As one of the probably few elected born and raised in another country that doesn't belong to the United States, I have seen how the city had to do much better to be more friendly to immigrants. What step did you take in place in that election to be sure that most workers who were placed in communities where most borders were not English speaking will be able to create the support that those borders needed? Right. So we follow the standards of Section uh, 203 of the Voter Rights Act with respect to population density. Uh, we are required to provide additional uh, services to uh, voters that speak Chinese, Korean, Bengali, uh, and Spanish. Uh, and in addition, by state law, we are required to provide additional materials on our website uh, in the Russian language. Uh, we did extensive outreach uh, with respect to uh, interpreters. Uh, we typically 
um, have a good number of uh, Spanish-speaking interpreters, and we don't usually fall short on Election Day. One of the more challenging languages that we have for recruitment, and we haven't been able to put our finger on the button exactly why, uh, is, is Korean. Uh, but we, we work on those uh, languages to make sure that we have a sufficient number of interpreters uh, in and around Election Day, as well as uh, the languages, those languages in certain areas, not throughout the city, but in certain areas, are required to be on the ballot. But what is it that is still today in that election, and most likely if we don't take the necessary step in the new election, the next election coming, that most likely will be in February, as we will be uh, hoping to have a special election for the public advocate. What will the Board of Election put in place to learn from what happened in the past election on improving? I'm not saying that you guys are not doing the job, but Right. No one can deny that much more has to be done in that particular area to be sure that immigrants who doesn't speak the language are going to fall inside knowing that there's a friendly place where people there speak their languages. What, will you, what did you learn from that previous election that in the next one coming, February or whatever, you will be right. ready to respond to those needs? Right, so I think in terms of recruitment and our, our media buy, uh, we did well in terms of raw numbers in, in recruitment. What I cannot answer for you uh, right this minute is we have to review uh, the coordinator logs, the interpreter journals, uh, to see if there were any particular problems other than the ones that we normally uh, might e experience uh, that require uh, tweaking or or overhauling uh, moving forward. And we just, from this past election, we just don't have that information uh, presently. But I can tell you that we function under a very uh, comprehensive language assistance program, again through uh, federal court order. Uh, and we, uh, and that has been extended and uh, through the end of 2019, I expect it'll be extended again after that uh, because of the federal interest in making sure that these things are taken care of properly. And how, how do you plan the ratio of translation, translation, translators per the numbers of voters that you expect will be going to the polling site and how this past election well, it respond, like how many, what is the average or how do you plan? I, I can have a longer conversation with you and walk you through the language assistance program. It is not just simply uh, one thing. It's population density through the census. Uh, there are a list of surnames that we must uh, review and determine to be, whether they are or not, requiring of language assistance. Now, I, I have some questions myself about the overall effectiveness of the language assistance uh, program and whether the targeting of what was in the past an ethnically specific surname, whether that still makes sense to do that moving forward. But under the present rules uh, that we are, we're following uh, through the federal court, we have to do it. Uh, I, I feel, and that's my end with this, with that recommendation, that again, as someone whose English is not the first language, as someone that is one of the recent immigrants that make 38% of the New York City population un inmigrante, creo que es importante que hayan traducciones para los lugares de votación con una mejor calidad. I feel that as a board of election, we look in the area, on how we can do better. I think that we still have area to improve when it comes to increasing the numbers of workers that is there to translate to the ratio of borders. New York City today is not in 1900, when in this case Latinos were not counted, or the American population was only 2%. Today, population is 38% of New Yorkers born and raised in another country. And many were living with green card undocumented 30 years ago. But today, that populations are boring. And I have seen that they've been going to places that they need more numbers of translators in those polling places. So just, and I, I know you have uh, a specific interest uh, in, in Spanish, but we took ads in El Diario. And Hispanics and everyone. Right, right, no, I understand, but I'm, I'm just, I can't read the whole list. So, you know, the Spanish happens to be at the top. El Diario, uh, La Voz Hispana. Impacto, 
we, we took ads in those, uh, in those publications uh, to be able to re do that form of basic uh, outreach. But we can always come to events, and I've tried to say this to all community groups, uh, you know, if there's specific events where you know that there's gonna be numbers of people there, invite us, let us know about them, send us an email, and we'll make every effort to get uh, our outreach teams there to, to try to get poll workers to come in, to try to get people to register, and also for translators. Look, I, I be, from my experience, the workers at Community Board, you guys, are accessible. I know that you respond to the phone call, you respond to the email, so I'm not questioning that piece. I just believe, regardless of what, we will rely on the community board, on the, on the board election. Right. For the next election coming now, most likely in February, for the next one coming in 21. I just hope that, again, as in any other election, that you look in area to improve. Y la parte de los inmigrantes en la traducción es muy importante para nosotros. Well, muchas Thank gracias, you. Council Thank Member. You. And with that, I'll pass it on to Council Member Lander. And then Council Member Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, in a minute, I'm going to follow up on uh, Council Member Rodriguez's questions. But I, I want to start by telling you about my Election Day experience and asking a question or two about it. Uh, it's certainly my sense that an awful lot of the places where all the scanners failed throughout the entire day were highly concentrated in, in my district. We were on the phone with your team a lot, and certainly they were sending technicians out, but it was a bit like a game of whack-a-mole mm -hmm. because the scanner would go down, it would get fixed, they would go to the next site to fix it, and then the one would break again. At, at my site, at the Kingsboro um, Temple on, on 7th Street in Park Slope, you know, I waited outside in the rain with an umbrella for a while. The line was up the block. When I got inside, I took some pictures from the door. It was a total mosh pit. Um, luckily, someone had rigged up an upside down broomstick with end of line here so you could find the end of the line because otherwise you were advised of two things. One, um, if you want, you can just vote while you kind of wait in this snaky line. Don't, you don't need to use the privacy booth, which was great because why go to the privacy booth if you're going to have an hour waiting in the snaky line? And two, we were told three of the four scanners are down, so you have two choices. You can wait in the snaky line for an hour and use the last scanner, or you can just put your ballot right now into the emergency ballot box. Most of us decided, uh, and I will say the spirits were good, it was a happy election day despite the madness of the administration. Most of us decided to wait in the line, and so I waited for about 50 minutes to snake through the, the, the mosh pit. And then, of course, when I was about five people from the last scanner, that scanner broke. So I was not able to, having waited for that hour, have my ballot scanned, and instead, just as I was approaching, they were like, okay, stuff your ballot in the emergency ballot box. I had never noticed that the container, the cabinet under the scanner says emergency ballot box on it, but I got none of my questions asked about under what circumstances will those ballots be removed from the ball emergency ballot box? When will they be scanned? What confidence do I have that they'll be scanned? Who will be watching when they are scanned? So I didn't see that happen, and hopefully my ballot got counted, but what can, I guess for starters, can you tell me I guess, what is the protocol for how the ballots are taken out of the emergency ballot box and scanned? What ballot security is there? Do you have any count of how many ballots were put in and out? And, you know, what kind of report can we have on that? And honestly, if that's secure, why not just do that with everything? Like, then I wouldn't have had to wait in line for an hour. All the ballots could have gone in the secure ballot box and then been scanned. Like, it seemed to me what we had is absolutely the worst of both worlds. I both waited and had no confidence in ballot security. If you convince me I should have confidence in ballot security, can't we run the election a lot more efficiently? And if not, why should I believe my ballot was counted? Well, to be clear, emergency ballots happen in every election. What we saw here, and I had... Uh, but I don't even know if mine was an emergency oh, ballot. I was given a regular ballot. Oh, no. I filled in oh, the no. bubbles. I was about to scan it. It right. became an emergency ballot at the moment that the ballot broke down? So, yeah. That the scanner broke down? Correct. So, so we're, we're covering a little, a little bit extra ground. And I know you, you guys all have a lot of uh, things that you have to do. So we, we discussed this a little bit earlier. But an emergency ballot is nothing more, nothing less than an election day ballot that cannot, for some reason, be scanned into the scanner at the moment. 
We and I was sort of given a choice, I guess, at the beginning. Would you like to have an emergency ballot or would you like to have a regular ballot? Well, I, I can tell you that if that was the, quote, choice you were given, uh, I'm telling you it was the choice I was I know, given. It, but then the information you got uh, was uh, not accurate. What I think what they were trying to convey to you was, we can take your ballot and put it into the emergency ballot box and let you get out of here or you can wait online and scan it yourself. I think that's what it sounds like they were trying yeah, to No, that's invade. definitely what they told me. Right. They didn't anticipate that I would wait online so, and then still not be able to my, have it my scanned myself. My point is, if you left with the impression that you were getting a different ballot, that would not have been... No, no, no. I, I was clear what my choices were. Right. I hoped that I would be able to scan it myself right. because I would have had more confidence it was counted than, like, stuffing it in the so, cabinet in the so way So we I did. saw an inordinate number of uh, emergency ballots this go-round. Uh, but I, I want to give you a number that I gave you earlier. Why this never bubbled to the surface as being an issue for us. Can you is. first, I just want to understand, and maybe if you did this before, it's fine. I, I just want to first understand the protocol sure. of okay. how it came out of the cabinet, page, who scanned, page who 90, saw it, and right. what confidence I can have that there was right. ballot security and accounting of my ballot. Page 91 of the poll worker manual uh, details what they do with, with emergency ballots. And at the end of the night, uh, before... Uh, the machines are shut down. All of the emergency ballots are taken out of their respective locations by a bipartisan team and, in, and with, under the supervision of NYPD and individually scanned into the DS uh, 200 scanners. So the vast majority of emergency ballots are tabulated on election night. If for some reason one of those was unscannable, then that goes into the emergency ballot envelope for processing later during the, uh, it's counted and, and accounted for in the ballot accountability process and processed later uh, by borough staff after the NYPD uh, drops all of the ballot material back to our respective borough offices. And did I, I heard somewhere that in some cases there were the, the, the emergency ballot cabinets filled up entirely. What happened then? Well, that, that was true. Uh, what happened, we saw as well with these topside scanner jams that we were talking about, some of the ballots accordioned and they don't lay flat and that ballot, the emergency ballot bin slot is, uh, is, is not big. But in years past, we get double digits numbers of, uh, of of emergency ballots. This was a high volume of emergency ballots, but the process is to count your vote on election night uh, before the close of polls. So what did people do? What did the poll workers do when they no longer had room in the emergency ballot cabinets and we, still didn't have working scanners? They utilized the emergency uh, ballot envelopes that we had at the poll sites, and in some instances we had provided uh, seal bags uh, in the case that the uh, ballot bin overflowed, and they used uh, those as well. Uh, but do, do you understand why I and thousands of other voters have find it hard to just have confidence that because our ballots might have gotten put in plastic bags, that there was the level of ballot security that we expect in our elections? The, the majority of those ballots. Do, do you understand why? Certainly. Okay. A absolutely. But I'm trying. I'm trying to convey that the process is to count all of those ballots on election night. If there's anything that's unaccountable uh, or cannot be scanned, those go back in the emergency envelopes and are and are handled by uh, the borough uh, facilities. So, so and I and, and I would want to ask my my question and follow up to Adonis, but I I appreciate all that, and I really the folks the workers tried to be very accommodating. I love the upside down broomstick with the end of line sign. They were trying to be helpful when they offered me these choices. But the damage it does to our elections when it feels like what happens is you vote and someone sticks it in a plastic bag and later some people will count it is really damaging. It's hard to believe we have an election system that provides secret I mean, I'm snaking through the thing. I'm voting in front of all my neighbors with um, no privacy. I mean, I was offered a privacy booth, but almost no one took the privacy booth. You know, voting in public, snaking through like we're in an amusement park, and putting our ballots in plastic bags, being told someone will later scan and count them. I did not put mine in a plastic bag, but it sounds like some people did. It just makes it very difficult to believe we have an election system that provides secret ballot and counts. People had goodwill to try to achieve it, but it really is undermining of confidence in the system. I just want to ask one last question following up on Edonis's, uh issues around language access, because 
a thing we did vote for on the back of the ballot uh, together, item number two, ballot proposition number two, New Yorkers overwhelmingly voted in favor of expanding poll site access, uh, language access at poll sites, and I think it's pretty reasonable to believe what likely will come out of that thing that the vast majority of New Yorkers voted for is the city putting some resources in translators. When we did that last election, without the vast majority of New Yorkers asking for it, but just the council and the mayor asking for it, the Board of Elections would not let those translators come within 100 feet of the poll site. What are we doing now that the majority of New Yorkers have voted to expand language access to make sure that the resources that get provided through the Civic Engagement Commission are used together with the Board of Elections and we don't wind up with that kind of standoff that we had last year where the people want more language access but the translators are forced to be 100 feet outside the polls? I think something did change in this election. Uh, the people of the city of New York spoke. We have to uh, certify the election, and after the election is certified, I am certain uh, that this topic uh, will be a topic that is addressed by the Board of Commissioners. I don't make policy for the agency, uh, and I'm not going to step out ahead of the Commissioner's authority on that, but I certainly uh, would expect uh, that, it, that it will be uh, addressed. And, and moving forward, ir irrespective uh, I would hope that the communication uh, between the city and the board would be better than what it was. And I want to I want to be clear: we were not advised as a board of elections as to the poll sites that were going to be used until a week before election day. Uh, and and we have to make some preparations for that as well. Right. I'm going to find optimism here. We don't need to look right. back. I raised the last election, but I'll let that one go. Okay. It's good to hear that given the fact that this came from the voters of the city, you are open, it sounds like, with the work of your commissioners to working together to make sure that the effort that comes out of that uh, is coordinated with you and achieves our goal of expanding language access for a broad set of New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Council Member Traeger, thank you so much for waiting. Sure. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and Chair Tor Torres. Uh, good to see you again, Director Ryan. Nice to see you. Um, so I, I'm a former public school teacher. When it was exam day, I had to prepare uh, for over 170 students, making sure enough paper, making sure enough pens and pencils. I did not prepare for 50% participation I did not prepare for a quarter participation. I had to prepare for a full participation. We in government and the message that we give in our, in our society is to encourage people to vote, to be full participants in our democracy. It is alarming that we don't have the capacity to accommodate full participation. We don't have the capacity to accommodate, I think, a quarter participation. This is a wake-up call, not just to city officials, but to the state and federal government as, as well. Uh, so I just want to begin by, by saying that. Uh, in addition to paper jams, the weather, two-page ballots, my colleague touched upon this. You know, I led the charge in this, in this body to uh, get resources from the city council, from the city of New York, to hire language access interpreters. Um, Director Ryan, I am outraged to learn that once again, these hardworking individuals who are only seeking to assist voters to find if they're in the right place, to make sure that they knew what an ED was, were placed outside in the cold weather, in the rain, 100 feet away, because someone in the Board of Elections interprets language access as electioneering. So my question to you is, who from the Board of Elections had interpreted this, interpreted language access as electioneering? Whose decision was it to order people to stay 100 feet away from the poll sites again in the cold, freezing rain? That was a, a decision that was made by the Board of Commissioners last year uh, when we were approached, as, as you're aware, very late uh, in the game uh, as we approached Election Day. Um, I can tell you, 
that I participated in one conference call uh, with uh, representatives uh, from the administration uh, and said to us, not that we offered to them, we understand we have to remain outside the, the 100 feet. We, the, the Board of Commissioners was not asked in any way, shape, or form. Director Ryan, and just to be clear, you're telling me that the New York City Board of, the Board of Commissioners, 10 individuals for the city of New York, interpret language access as electioneering? Is that what you're telling this committee? What I'm telling you is that with the decision that was made last year, and I'm also telling you that we were not asked to revisit that. We were told that the we were told that the interpreters were going to be set up, and that the interpreters were going to be bringing their own tape measures, and that they were going to set up outside outside the sign. Commissioner, they only first of all, again, as you pointed out. Federal the Voting Rights Act mandates, I think Chinese, uh, I, I think you mentioned Korean. The state, you, the BOE added Bengali for nothing in the law, nothing in the law prohibits the BOE from adding more languages. I keep hearing the goalposts moving. We in Southern Brooklyn have a very large Russian speaking community. Many Holocaust survivors, World War II veterans coming in, not sure if they're in the right place because also the BOE moves poll sites around. So where, where they used to go vote, they go and they're, and they're told this is not where, where you vote. And they simply ask the question, where do I go? Some might ask, what is an ED? Which booth? That's all they want to know. So we in the city put hundreds of thousands of dollars because the BOE wouldn't do it. They say they didn't have money. The state was not acting. We put in that money simply to hire people, and I thank the mayor and, and his administration on this issue, simply to hire people to tell them if you're in the right place or not. They have street finders. They're not telling people who to vote for. So I find it shameful that the Board of Commissioners interprets helping people to vote as electioneering. They fail that vocabulary test, Commissioner. And this is a major issue in the city of New York. We have a, our population, many people speak different languages. It's not just Chinese, Korean, or, or Spanish, and, and we, of course, celebrate those languages. But there are people who speak Russian, Arabic, Urdu. There's different languages. So this is an issue that we're going to continue to follow up on. I don't think you could point to one law, one law that prohibits you from expanding language access. And I, again, remain outraged that, th that people were placed in the cold, freezing rain simply because they wanted to assist their fellow voters. And I thank the chairs for, for their time. Thank you, Councilmember Drager. Um, I, just, I have a few, few more questions, and then one day you'll be liberated from <laughs> um, I have, and I, you, you might have answered these questions, so I apologize if I'm it's okay. covering familiar ground, but it's not clear to me if, if there's an issue that arises at a poll site, what number do you call? Is there a dedicated hotline number operated by BOE that you would call? Yes, and it's, and it's, on, the, it's on the side of the voting machine. It depends on uh, the borough and the, the poll workers, the coordinators. So it, it varies from borough to borough? Uh, they can call the, the, the quickest way to get it resolved is to call the dedicated number at the borough office. There's another way to get through to us uh, so that we, we log it into the system through the 800 or the 866. So, so it seems like when there, whenever there's an issue, some people will call the attorney general's office. Some people will call 311. Right. Some people will call the borough offices. Some people might call your central office. Have you ever thought of just right. creating a uniform, universal hotline through which all the complaints could go? Well, certainly we cannot mandate that any elected official that wants to set up a hotline can set up their own hotline. No, no, but oh, no. I, no, I, that's wonderful, <laughs> no, but, but you're right. the BOE so, and right, yes, ideally... No, no question. We have, yeah. when we have these conversations, and we, and we do regularly with respect to election planning, our preference is that the call come directly to us and bypass other ways of doing it, uh, because all you end up with at that point is duplication. But 
we do get tremendous cooperation uh, from 311. We're right in their lineup. Uh, so if somebody called uh, 311 on Election Day, uh, they would be routed uh, to us. So that part of it, I think, uh, is is working uh, pretty and, well. And what's the so you have a coordinating relationship with 311? Right. What's the coordinating relationship with the Attorney General's office? The coordinating relationship with the Attorney General's office is high-level officials in the Attorney General's office call us directly, uh, and we we do, give. Do they out consistently forward complaints? to the Board of Elections in the same manner as 311? Uh, on Election Day, yes. Okay. And the best time for us to get them is on Election Day. We have some other groups that like to gather data and not tell us until after the election right. over, which doesn't really help us fix the problem in the moment. Do, do you have an inventory of all the calls that are received regarding, like even the borough-based calls, are those forwarded to you centrally? Uh, Yes, they get they get logged into the system. Now, of course, if somebody happens to get through to a random employee, that's not sure. necessarily. I'm only on referring a, to the calls, right? Right. So, uh, so you receive all the borough calls, all yes. the AG calls, and all the 311 right. calls. Okay. How many calls did you receive on election day? I I read those uh, numbers into the uh, into the record earlier. Um, I got them again. Uh, I'm getting old, my memory. <laughs> um, we, I have today's report broken down borough by borough. Uh, oh, sure. Okay. So we had a total, uh, and this is raw data, unfiltered. Uh, and this is on election day? On election okay. day, through our call center. Uh, there may be duplicates within this, but this is the raw data, right? Okay. 2,284 in Manhattan. Uh, 1,798 uh, in Bronx, 3,362 in Kings. Where? In Kings County, Kings County. Brooklyn. Yep. Sorry. No, no. That's uh, 1,000. When I think Kings, I think the Bronx. But that's not. <laughs> 1,914 in Queens, and 428 in Richmond County. And do we know how many of those calls were addressed on Election Day? They're all addressed, and then. Uh, ultimately, that's how we uh, characterize our response times uh, with respect so to— So you respond to every single one of those calls? We, re we respond to every, si every single one of those calls that's picked up, gets logged into the system, and we have our own version of 311. You know, we'll call it 311 for elections on Election Day. That is a specially designed uh, program that has all of the drop-downs necessary to deal with election-related problems. And do you keep track of, of all the issues that are brought to your attention and then the percentage or number of those issues that were resolved? Yes. And, so, and we can certainly post election now that we're So what's that data? Do you have that data with uh, you at the moment? I don't have it for this current election, but I, we can provide you for past elections as far back uh, as the system goes if you'd like that. And then once we've completed our analysis for this election, we can give you the updated information. Now the, and if I'm misstating the law, please correct me, the state BOE or it might be either your rule or state BOE rule requires voters to be able to cast a ballot within 30 minutes. Is that a correct representation of the law? That is a, that is a state uh, board of elections uh, regulation. Okay. And how often do you violate that regulation? I guess every time a voter is waiting in line more than 30 minutes, and I'm not saying that to be— uh, No, do you, do you keep—okay, so right. there is widespread violation of a BOE regulation. I'm well, happy you, you're right. conceding that point. We have— uh, how, how do you keep track of how often you're in violation of the rule? It is very difficult for us to track that uh, on an ongoing basis other than anecdotally. We did have uh, our vendor a few years back uh, do an analysis uh, for us based on log data coming out of, of the machines where you can extrapolate that math uh, backwards. We just don't have ready access uh, to I, I that. I guess the challenge here is, you know, what's the value of a rule if you're not tracking whether you're complying with the rule? There's no mechanism for holding you accountable for compliance with the right. law. Uh, my understanding of the rule is that applies to presidential elections. Not that that's material. It, we should we should apply a good standard to all elections. It only applies to but presidential. Elections. That's that's my understanding. I, I could so, be wrong. So what's I, what's the rule for? Because that would seem arbitrary to me. What's the rule for for non-presidential elections? We have to process the voters as as quickly uh, as possible. But one of the challenges that we face, and I said this earlier, and this is not by way of excuse, but by way of explanation. We are trying to shoehorn an electronic machine universe 
into rules designed to govern pole sites that had lever machines. The, the machines that we use now, though smaller, with all of the attendant equipment that is required, that wasn't required previously, create more space challenge. Well, I guess my question is, so let's stipulate that the rule is 30 minutes. Do you have a sufficient amount of space and a sufficient number of scanners and paper bins and all the rest to ensure that voters on average are voting within 30 minutes? In all locations, no. There are spots in New York City that present to us very specific challenges. I voted IS-24 in Staten Island, and, and, and I never have a problem uh, voting, and they don't treat me extra special when I walk in. I just get online like everybody else and go uh, and vote. Other sites uh, throughout the city, and particularly in Manhattan, which gets a lot of attention, there is a shortage of usable poll sites. Uh, one of the things that we're doing to address that challenge, hopefully it will help, uh, we've contracted with ESRI, um, which is a software management system that we were using it for our maps, and we're going to be able to 3D map the entire city, as well as through the use of software, identify locations, particularly in government-owned buildings, to try to expand our pool, our pool of poll sites. Um, so let's stipulate the 30-minute rule. So there are a number of poll sites where even though voters have a right to cast their ballot within 30 minutes, given the lack of space constraints, given the lack of resource constraints, those voters are effectively deprived of that right. Is that a fair? In those areas where we don't have the space, absolutely. In the latest election, the, the act of voting within 30 minutes, was that the rule or the exception, in your opinion? It seems, like the accept it seems like it was more often the case that people were not able to vote within 30 minutes in, in the latest election. In this particular election, anecdotally, there were widespread problems. Uh, you've heard uh, testimony not only from myself, but from a couple of your colleagues that there were areas where there weren't problems. Uh, but I can tell you this. Where there were problems, the problems were significant, uh, and the likes of which we hadn't seen before. Uh, and that's where we're going to concentrate our efforts moving forward to ensure we, we can't stop a ballot from jamming necessarily, but we can change the way we deal with it uh, once it happens. Um, and I think what happens at poll sites, it's like when a highway has a car accident. A ballot jam is the equivalent of a car accident. Uh, once the traffic backs up, it takes time uh, for it to dissipate. And the, you provide tablets to poll coordinators, correct? Yes, we do. And can poll coordinators submit complaints through those tablets? We won't be able to because they can receive it. They receive our information. Uh, only our field technicians uh, push out uh, information back to us. The reason that we don't do that is we have the capability, we have the capability to do it. However, uh, the security concerns uh, with respect to keeping an open line of communication back and forth between the Board of Elections and the poll sites uh, have not been overcome just yet to a sufficient degree what so that you? we're I'm confident. Not, I'm not following. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. I, I'm, very, I'm always very circumspect to talk about the cyber issues. I can tell you that we have worked very, very closely with Cyber Command so, so your in the city. So your tablets lack the ability to have poll workers submit complaints because you're concerned about cybersecurity? Is that we have not overcome that challenge but yet. Why is that, and I'm not taking lightly the concerns about cybersecurity, even the machines themselves are susceptible to cyber warfare and cyber attacks, but why would it be the reason that a concern for me to send an email or some kind of complaint through a tablet saying, this scan three of our scanners are down, can it's you come and fix it? It's, like it's why is that a threat to cybersecurity? It's that? presently a simple answer. We use those same tablets to upload the results at the end of the night. 
And one of our major concerns with any election is avoiding a dedicated denial of service attack as we're processing the election results at the end of the night. So we need to keep those tablets as pristine and pure as we can uh, during election. But if, if you're putting sensitive information in the tablets as is, that information is already susceptible to cyber attacks. There, there is a difference between pushing information out and allowing an open line of communication back and forth between the tablets. Now, if we, if we go to a different uh, process where we have a separate tablet uh, for complaints and we can segregate that from, uh, from the election results reporting piece of it, yeah. then maybe we're Maybe I'm not following. I just don't know why, if you and I are communicating via a tablet about problems at a poll site, that's not sensitive communication, that's what? No, what, what I'm talking about is there is a difference, as the tech people tell me, in pushing information out versus allowing an open internet communication network uh, essentially uh, throughout the city. And we have an absolute obligation to keep those results protected. And I, and our staff has worked very closely with uh, Cyber Command in New York City to ensure the cyber integrity of the elections process. And this is one of those areas where we're just not going to jump headlong into it until we know that the security concerns have been met. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I, Councilmember Yeager, you have questions? Thank yep. You. And so uh, Ms. Sandow uh, reminded me that we have discussed uh, perhaps providing separate tablets to the coordinators for exactly that purpose in upcoming election events, uh, provided that we can- so what, what are the status of those discussions? Or? The tablets that we did receive the complaints this, this election that there were issues getting- Can you speak into the mic? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. We received complaints this election um, that poll workers had issues getting in touch with uh, certain call centers. So, of course, after the election, when we were doing some debriefings among staff, we did discuss, because we cannot open up the, the lines on the tablet that is used to upload the PMDs, we discussed deploying tablets that our technicians use. Basically, they're, they, they respond to us in real time. So they receive on their tablet that there's an issue they then click the button that they're on their way and we know it's dispatched. When it's resolved, they're clicking resolve. So we receive a resolve time and we know that the incident was taken care of. So we decided that we should send these tablets to the coordinators for them to also put in that there's issues at the poll sites if they cannot get through on the, uh, to the call centers. So you can submit complaints through a tablet? A separate tablet. A separate tablet. A separate so these poll tablet. coordinators so our, had separate tablets. No. no. Or that's something this you're exploring. Is, correct. Okay. He, it's, so is that something that's going to be implemented by the next election, or? Uh, Councilman, through the work that we've done with the council and the administration, we procured uh, these um, Windows-based tablets several years ago. It is a process uh, that is evolving, uh, and we're also anticipating putting even more information on the tablet. So yes, it's something uh, that we're, we're looking at. Uh, we put but some you, things you, off. You, can, you cannot guarantee it. Uh, we no, have to procure, this is something that- We'd have to, it, it would be a new need and we'd have to procure them. I'm, not, I'm sure it's not cost uh, prohibitive, but we had put certain things off uh, into the 2019 uh, year because we were anticipating that it would not be a busy election cycle and we might be able well, to- how, how burdensome is the process of procuring tablets. It, it's not we just, just the, the burdensome just the process. So it's, it's also a question of then buying the tablets, training. Do you know uh, the cost? Uh, the, the cost per tablet? Yeah. The last one. Or the total uh, it was, cost of the procurement. The, the city contract was uh, just about $600 uh, per tablet. It's not cost prohibitive, okay. but we have to work it into the process and we were planning on doing some of this stuff during uh, 2019 when we had a little bit of uh, of downtime. We keep jumping from election to election to election and, and some of the, the longer term planning. But the next election interrupted. is going to be February. Next year. February. Right. Fe no, it's February. now February, right? Yeah. So we uh, were expecting to have some downtime uh, between January and September. That has now been interrupted and we're going to have a full citywide election event uh, in November that we So how, how likely are you going to be able to 
procure those tablets by the public advocates election? I think the procurement is probably the least of it. It's really a question of me getting back with the, the tablet unit staff to, to make a determination how far along they are in the implementation of their plan and, and see how quickly we can get the, uh, the poll workers trained. Okay. Councilmember Yeager? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just, uh, Mr. Director, just want to let you know uh, for your own comfort, uh, I'm working very hard to make sure that the February 2019 special election for public advocate is the last time you ever have to worry about a special election for public advocate. Um, the, we discussed a little earlier, uh, and you mentioned several times, the perforated ballot um, uh, and the requirement under the election law, Article 7, that a ballot that has to appear on more than one pages be uh, contain a perforation and be separated. That provision, to your knowledge, uh, if you can tell me, was that written before we started using paper ballots in New York? Or as we started to, you know, in my other words, as we went from the lever system over to? My understanding is it all came in together as okay, they so made the preparations. It, it, I, I believe, and you've said this a number of times, that the perforated ballot is the first time in this jurisdiction, meaning not just the city of New York, but all of the, the counties uh, throughout the state. There's 62 counties. Uh, we represent five of them, so I guess 57 of them. Uh, and they've never used perforated ballots in New York, so this is really the first uh, time that that's been done. It hasn't been done in other jurisdictions, but we're required by law. So if you have to do a two-page ballot because of the challenges uh, with this uh, six-and-a-half-point font ballot, which would have been the alternative, uh, you can only do a perforated ballot. Is that correct? That's my understanding of the election law, yes. Okay. Um, the, uh, just if you can expand a little bit, is there an agency in the city of New York that is not the Board of Elections that is responsible for notifying and promoting voter participa participation and urging people to participate in elections? The campaign finance board. Okay, and uh, they receive money from the city of New York through allocations by the city council and the adoption of our budget. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so it's their job, I believe, to tell the people of New York that there's an election to urge people to come out and vote. Is that your mandate under state law? Voter outreach is an, is an aspect of our mandate. However, the way it works here in the city of New York is that the primary responsibility is that of that is the campaign finance board, and the board of elections does its best efforts to depoliticize uh, the elections. For example, if, a, if there was a contest where, could you imagine a circumstance where there was a contest where one candidate submitted their information? and the other one didn't, and the Board of Elections had that information up on their website, only having information for one candidate. I know that happens uh, with the Campaign Finance Board that not all candidates participate in their voter uh, guide. So that is one real reason why we stay away from that uh, minefield. It's good policy. Um, the, uh, the Voter Assistance Commission, I believe, uh, the arm of the Campaign Finance Board, used to be two separate agencies. Uh, yes. The, the voters of New York uh, combined it in a charter revision, I believe in 2010 or thereabouts, uh, put it under the, the arms of the Campaign Finance Board. Uh, earlier this year, the Campaign Finance Board sent out uh, an incredibly inaccurate uh, notification to voters of New York with respect to their rights as it relates to uh, parolees in New York and whether or not they had the right to vote. So they didn't do that perfectly in their outreach. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And Council Member Tranger earlier today was discussing the various languages, um, and I fully supported the mayor's uh, efforts uh, through Moya to deploy translators uh, with the understanding that there were technical hurdles and they needed to stay beyond the 100 feet radius. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I understand the, the concerns. Uh, you know, th these workers didn't necessarily take the board's oath, and I understand those issues. Um, but the uh, Campaign Finance Board's literature does not utilize the languages that the board of, that the city's uh, uh, Office of Immigrant Affairs was utilizing for translation purposes. Is that correct, to your knowledge? Uh I'm not uh, fully familiar with what Moya has dis disseminated versus Campaign Finance Board. I know that Campaign Finance Board has made uh, voter registration forms in additional languages beyond those uh, serviced by the Board of Elections, uh, and, and that they're up there and people can download them for their use if they so choose. Okay. Uh, two more quick things, and I want to get back to uh, the federal lawsuit and uh, uh, regarding the accessibility issues and uh, uh, the hurdles that you have to overcome. But I just wanted to clarify something. Uh, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that in the past when we had the lever machines, um, an ED 
uh, had a lever machine deployed per 800 voters. So if an ED had 1,600 voters, it would have two lever machines, 3,200 voters. It would, okay. Um, today, it's uh, 1,600, and correct me if I'm wrong, but per 1,600 voters in a site is where you deploy uh, an additional scanner. So your starting point is two scanners per site, no matter how many voters there are, because in case one breaks, and then you increase it per 1,600. Are you, are you at the point, based on this election, where you may be concerned that uh, either deploying those additional 1,000 scanners or simply just biting the bullet, right. so to speak, and getting more scanners and reducing that 1,600 number? It, it, is, a, it is 1,400, but the point is still taken. Uh, Yes, we're going to evaluate all of our poll sites, but we also have a finite number of poll sites. And each one of those poll sites has a finite amount of square footage uh, that we have accessible to us. And in a gubernatorial election, we have to deploy one privacy booth for every 250 voters. Whereas in other elections, we can do that for every 350 voters. It brings, so me, it brings me to my next point, which is the federal lawsuit accessibility, because one of the conundrums, as I understand, in your inability to find more locations where you can conduct elections is that you're operating within this very strict realm of requirements of what constitutes handicapped accessibility. And as I've told you earlier uh, in my earlier line of questioning, um, I found, I believe, some of the requirements that, and you've described this as board requirements that you're obligated to do under the federal lawsuit. Um, I, I find them to be onerous beyond, beyond reason. Uh, for example, uh, I was told that, um, that uh, a hospital in Brooklyn, SUNY Hospital, needed to have your technicians come out and make it handicapped accessible. It doesn't make sense, of course, that the hospital wouldn't be handicapped accessible. I told you about a community board. I told you about a senior center in Borough Park, uh, which obviously has 90, 100-year-old people going into it, but you, your staff needed to come and make it better. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a chance or an opportunity for us to revisit that federal lawsuit and if you've asked perhaps if Corporation Counsel can assist you in uh, going back to court and saying some of these requirements don't make sense, particularly uh, in instances where the poll site is located in a place that is already handicapped accessible. For example, the lobby of an apartment building may not fit within the realm of what you're required to do under the federal lawsuit, but so clearly it is handicapped accessible. The lobby of a hospital may not fit within the realm of what you're required to do under the federal lawsuit, but so clearly is handicapped accessible. So revisiting the, the corpus of the lawsuit uh, is not likely. Uh, it was decided by the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in February, uh, in May of 2014. However, we do work closely with the overseer uh, and the disability rights advocates. So when we find those instances where the cure is worse than the underlying problem, we have made compromises. And earlier I discussed uh, all of the 503 sites uh, that we have placed temporary ramping. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to keep the poll sites that we have in the places where we have them. Another thing that we've done, we've taken Help America Vote Act money and we're working with the Department of Education. You guys are familiar with the zipper drains and they have, they cup uh, because they have cheap grading. Uh, we have worked uh, with a designer uh, and a vendor to uh, make uh, cast iron grading uh, that we are providing to the Department of Education through Help America Vote Act money to put that grading down once and for all so that we don't have uh, the cupping. We're doing some uh, basic stuff. It doesn't sound too sexy, but it's like grinding concrete where there's a lip. Well, we can't just walk onto the school property to do that, but we're working uh, closely uh, with them to use those resources where we can and to be a good and fair partner uh, You know, with the uh, the schools primarily, because we know that they're facing challenges too. So, Director, that, that references sites that you're currently already using, but what I indicated in my earlier line of questioning was whether or not we can expand the sites of, you know, for example, in my district, that, that senior center that I referenced, the board really wants to not have the election there, and they, they're hunting for another place in my neighborhood, but there is no other place, and I know the challenge you have, there are a lot, you, there are places you simply can't get into, even if you have the right to, but simply because it just doesn't work. 
And I'm wondering if you're able to look beyond what, uh, what, what simply works as an accessible site and say, well, this is not at 100%, but it's 80%, and with a little work, we can, we can make this work as a site, and then divide some of these extremely large election sites into you know, two or three or four or five sites to get to that little town place that I talked about earlier right. where 300 people registered to vote at a firehouse. So we will analyze any site that is known to us that's potential uh, for poll site use. What we have done in other circumstances, and I extend this offer uh, to you as well, Councilman, uh, if there's a particular site that's vexing in, in, a, in a district, you are the eyes and ears of your community and you have been elected to represent them, so to that extent you speak for the voters in your district. Uh, if there's a spot that requires particular attention, we've done site visits. I've brought uh, the, uh, the vendor up from Alabama to come in specifically, Jim Terry himself, and assess sites that uh, have particular issues uh, because he has a specific expertise in this area. And we can walk the whole site and make a determination whether there is something that has been heretofore overlooked to make sure that we preserve uh, that site for the use of that community. Uh, and, and I commit to you that we've done it in the past and that we're happy to do it uh, moving forward. Uh, some sites require, you know, more uh, comprehensive analysis uh, than others. And, and while our staffers have good basic skills uh, with respect to poll site assessment, they're not uh, architects. I will tell you that uh, in the instance where the board reached out to me, I'm only in office for 10 and a half months, um, and told me that they needed to get out of this senior center, uh, and we were on the hunt, and I was looking with your staff to try to help them identify another place, and I could not find a place in my neighborhood that met the requirements that you're forced, uh, not by your own doing, but that you're forced to undergo. I couldn't find it, I couldn't help. And uh, they were coming to me with some names of places and I said, you know, go check it out. You're not gonna be able to get in there. You'll see right. yourself. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the conundrum that a lot of, a lot of this is uh, based around, which is that you have these very large sites and then you have this kind of thing around your neck where you can't get in, you can't do it someplace else that looks like it would work perfectly because it just doesn't meet your requirements and you have to go and do an enormous amount of work to make it work. Um, and I'm wondering why you can't, well, you've kind of answered it, but why you can't get out from under this albatross of, of, of a requirement that may actually make no sense, particularly when you're going and retrofitting a hospital in order to run an election there. Right, so, so we have a, a lot of poll sites. But we do, as I, as I said, on a case-by-case -case basis, we go through the final surveys uh, that, that, we come, that come in through Evan Terry Associates and, and our staff reviews them. And then we sit down with the disability rights advocates who are the counsel, uh, in, uh, the opposing counsel in the lawsuit, and we try to come to a reasonable uh, determination. And as I said to you, there have been limited instances, but instances nonetheless, where the fix was worse than the underlying problem. And in those circumstances where the fix has been worse than the underlying problem, we've reached a compromise uh, in most of those instances. And this is one of those spots that we're very happy to take a look at that again, uh, to bring it up to Evan Terry Associates and as well as DRA and see if there's not uh, some common ground that meets the needs of all the voters. And that's our challenge. And we never want to be in a position where uh, the accessibility community feels like they're being pitted against uh, the other voters in a district. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and Council Member Germani Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ryan and uh, BOE uh, for being here. I'm pretty sure everybody has uh, expressed the irate nature uh, uh, that they felt, so I'll, I'm just gonna add a bit, uh, just so I can speak up for my constituents, particularly at PS208, PS269, um, St. Augustine's, uh, it was pretty atrocious. Um, I have never witnessed anything like it. It seems to me that it's getting worse and worse. I, I think it falls in a line of uh, suppression of voters, uh, unlike Georgia or other places where it was done intentional. Uh, this, I don't think it was intentional, but it has the same desired effect uh, of people leave because they're frustrated uh, or in some cases have their names taken off the rolls. There's a whole bunch of issues uh, that fall into that and it does get quite frustrating. Uh, I do believe it is a, a broader thing that has to be done. I absolutely believe 
uh, on the state level. There's a bunch of reforms that can uh, help the system. That has to be the number one thing that we do, uh, but that can't provide uh, an excuse for dereliction of the Board of Elections. And so uh, the first question I had, do we have any data on voter attrition or voters who weren't able to vote or uh, had to leave the polling site before they were scanning? Do we have any information like that or any anecdotal information of that? Only anecdotal, and, and, and you're right. Um, denial of a right to vote, whether, whether by uh, mistake or error or, or, or systemic, is still denial of a right to vote. But I do appreciate you recognizing that you do not believe it was intentional. But anecdotally speaking, I am certain that there were voters based on uh, the wait times uh, who uh, decided to leave and, and, and did not vote. But I have no way of quantifying that, and I apologize. Uh, in my, uh, one of my voting sites, P269, for the first time ever, um, I saw an impressive police presence, not one or two, um, but a lot. And they actually shut down the street, which I'd never seen before, uh, because of the frustrations. Did that happen um, across um, the city? How many times have you heard that? Was it, what was the interaction with the NYPD? It didn't happen, uh, you know, en masse across the city, but we have a very good working relationship uh, with the special events unit from the police department that assists us uh, with, with elections, and they are uh, an effective uh, partner uh, under the uh, leadership of Inspector Wallach. And when we have issues like that uh, on election day, uh, the NYPD is absolutely as responsive as it can be while they're trying to balance a lot of issues as well, uh, not to mention you know, regular policing and the anti-terrorism uh, threats that they face. So we thank them uh, for their work in that regard. Um, so, you know, at the beginning of the day, um, BOA actually responded fairly quickly. There is, generally speaking, on my end, when I tweet something out or something, I do get a response. Um, however, by the end of the day, I just think it was an epic fail, right? And so the BOE failed. It's, it's not the first time. So I'm trying to lead up to the day. Is there anticipation of this kind of failing? And if there is, why are there no alarm bells sounded before the day of? So, uh, as I have testified, uh, you know, throughout the course of the proceedings today, uh, the, this two-page center perforated ballot presented us challenges uh, that, uh, unfortunately, some of the things we can only learn through the experience of having gone through it. Uh, now we've come out uh, the other end. Uh, as I said, we cannot uh, prevent a ballot jam from happening uh, in the first place, uh, necessarily. However, we can respond better uh, to those circumstances when they arise. And one of the things that I'm certain we will be discussing with the commissioners, and I can't imagine a scenario where some form of it does not happen, uh, getting additional staff to be constantly present at the poll site. So if there is a, a relatively easily fixed ballot jam, uh, that we get that done quickly, and it doesn't have the net effect of shutting down a machine or machines for an extended period of time. So, um, and we've been here before where we've had problems on election day. And so, um, at some point we have to learn the lessons because we've been through them and we've seen that that's not happening. So I just want to walk through a couple of things. We did anticipate that we would have a higher than normal turnout. Yes? Yes. We did anticipate because we have perforations, we would have double the amount of papers going through with increased turnout. Yes? Yes. We didn't anticipate that that might cause some trouble because of the perforation and the changes? Yes. But we did nothing to try to address that beforehand? No. Okay. We, we, had, we had plans. Honestly, our focus was um, we, we didn't anticipate the types of repetitive ballot jams that we would get. That clearly was not something that was on our radar screen. What we were focusing our efforts on uh, in the lead up uh, to Election Day was the ballot bins filling, and what do we do with the now voted ballot material that we have a legal responsibility to keep and maintain, and how do we secure them uh, in poll sites uh, throughout the city that are not created equally? We have some very small poll sites, we have some very large poll sites, and we tried to work uh, collaboratively, uh, not only with our staff and do what we needed to do, but also to work with uh, the NYPD to make sure that we kept the machines and the ballot material uh, secure. And that's why I keep going back, Councilman, to the point of we need to have staff at the poll sites to clear the ballot jam. So if they happen, 
we can keep the lines moving. So my bell rung, but so let me just close. But I do want to say it sounds like a dereliction in terms of the questions I asked that you said yes to, that no one would figure or consider what would happen if there were ballot jams. And that's the, that's the, that's the problem I'm having. So my hope is that there's a conversation beforehand about what could happen, right. or else everyone is going to assume that we're OK when we're not. And um, right. that's just a problem. We've been through, whether it's a ballot jam or not, we've had problems. Right. And we said we have to learn to go through it. But it turns out that intuitively, we might have perceived that some things could occur. And then I think even if there were backup plans that didn't work, the community would feel a little better because at least we had planned it out. It looks right. like we didn't plan it. So, but, but let me say these two sure. other things because I know my, my bell rung. Um, one, um, we are trying to get an additional site at Flappish Gardens on New York. Um, the owners made some changes. I think the wheelchair entrance, they said the ramp or something was at a wrong angle. It seemed weird when I saw it that that would be what would shut down that space. It's a much bigger space in many places, so I'm asking you to please look into that. Uh, and lastly, just uh, for my colleague's first comment, uh, Public Advocate's Office, my belief is that if we think something is not uh, powerful enough, we may want to increase the power. It's the first time I've ever heard of taking it away. But thank you very much. So on, on the planning, what we did was we, we put out teams of technicians equivalent to what we do in a, in a presidential election. And in the, the postscript to this election was that additional increase in staffing was inadequate, uh, and we have to modify that uh, moving forward. So we certainly, and, and I know you weren't here, but I, I did apologize, and I, and I hope that uh, we can uh, work collaboratively to regain the trust of this body. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, so much, Council Member. Uh, one last quick question before we go to the next panelist. Uh, do you anticipate any problems at the next election that we have not spoken about? Uh, the next election is going to be a special election uh, that will be declared sometime uh, three days after the, the new year and then be conducted within 45 days. Uh, special elections, uh, by definition, are usually uh, lightly attended election events. There will be one office on the, uh, on the ballot. It'll be the smallest ballot that we use. Uh, so if we can look to Staten Island as what happens in a busy election when there's not a two-page ballot and you had relatively uh, few problems, uh, I would anticipate that we would have relatively uh, few problems uh, in this election uh, coming up. Uh, so in terms of we take each election event uh, in their own uh, little uh, silo, uh, and this is this election event coming up will have no basis of comparison uh, to the 26, 2018 general election. Okay. Uh, I was just thinking it's, it's going to be in February, right? It's going to be in February. So the coldest. The mayor has a little bit year. of flexibility, yeah. uh, not a lot. He's got a. He, he's he, the mayor has to issue a proclamation within three days of the vacancy, and then conduct the election within 45 days of the proclamation give or take a few days, uh, depending on how the calendar lays out. All right, just think about, uh, you know, what your think tank team, uh, what are the other potential problems, things that perhaps we're not looking at, it's gonna be in February, called this month, yeah. what happen if we have a super snowstorm, if we have what we just had a couple of days are, ago. Are you now wishing okay. things on us now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Ryan, thank you so much uh, for all your information. Uh, that you're provided. I'm looking for solutions. Um, uh, from what I hear, uh, you will be coming up with a plan uh, that you will be presenting and executing uh, to making sure we don't have a part two of uh, this uh, nightmare, yes, voting Chair. nightmare we just went through. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank you and the working relationship that we have cultivated uh, w with you uh, and your staff and, and Mr. Reed. And I think that the lines of communication are, are open uh, and that we should be able to work collaboratively to uh, solve uh, some of these very important issues. And we will continue to do that. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I uh, we'll invite now uh, Mr. Douglas Kellner from the New York State Board of Elections. Thank you uh, for waiting patiently. He's running up now.
Thanks for giving us a heads up. As I say, they won't be hugging me after they I know you're anxious to start, so, and thank you for waiting. I know it's, All right. uh, but we had a lot of important questions. Of course you did, and I found it very interesting to listen to it. Um, uh, some of it uh, was illuminating, and some of it was very disappointing that we're um, repeating the same old problems. Um, let me, um, I, I'm not going to read my testimony. That's uh, there for the record. Uh, but I do want to remind uh, the council that there are going to be major changes in election law in Albany this year because of the election of the Democratic Senate. I have a list of bullets of uh, changes that uh, we anticipate. The most significant for the City Board of Elections, which we really didn't discuss, is the implementation of early voting. And I would expect, although it hasn't really been decided yet, that uh, uh, the early voting um, will go into effect for the general election in November of 2019. And the idea is that's an off year, uh, but it would be good to at least get the pilot uh, up and running to uh, uh, see if they can work out the kinks in advance of the presidential year. But that's a big project, a big new project for the city board to be undertaking. And uh, uh, we want to, you know, I want to highlight that so that you realize that uh, uh, their budget request should uh, uh, take that into account and uh, that uh, they have adequate personnel to do realistic planning for it. Now, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the 30 minute rule. Uh, uh, I was the original proponent of adding the 30-minute rule to the State Board regulations in 2007. Unfortunately, the city has never complied with it for a presidential election. Um, this last election is another example of how the city still is not close to complying. and. Um, Unfortunately, now, the new excuse we're going to hear is, oh, early voting is going to take the pressure off uh, overcrowded poll sites. And that'll be the next excuse for the city not complying in November 2020. There are three th uh, key things that the city is just ignoring um, uh, that uh, are, are really not acceptable from my point of view. Um, that. Uh, would solve the problem. First is you've heard Director Ryan over and over again say space is an issue, that they don't have enough space. Well, they're not doing what they need to do to get additional space. The schools are closed on election day. They can use the entire school building. And their problem is, is that they're in this mindset of one size fits all. They want one site plan for every election. Hmm. No, they need a different site plan for the presidential election, the general election, uh, the midterm, the gubernatorial general election, and the mayoral general election, which are the top three most crowded events in the cycle. They can use much smaller space for the primaries. They can use many fewer poll workers for the primaries. But they don't, they're, they're in this one size fits all mindset, at least as far as it comes with space. I'm not aware of uh, any efforts to take up my challenge that they expand the poll site for the presidential election year. Um, and that will give them additional space to have additional book tables. And by the way, it's still very frustrating that after years of experts telling them, they still don't divide the books in the middle of the alphabet. So that you have a long line for the people in the first half of the alphabet and a very short line uh, uh, for the people in the second book because the, the, the um, alphabetization of names uh, does not split right at uh, A to M. Um, so, uh, so that's a simple thing that the city could do now that they tell me that they told the vendor to do it that way, but I haven't seen any follow-up uh, because the vendor didn't do it that way. Um, and then uh, with the assignment of poll workers, again, as I've said, one size doesn't fit all. 
there shouldn't be the same number of poll workers working on uh, the special election in February as you would have for a general election. And then, as uh, Director Ryan referred to, I agree with him that the way we assign poll workers is anachronistic. Um, the city has taken a very strict, hardline interpretation of the election law that many other counties do not do to avoid flexibility in assigning poll workers. It's our position that um, there only needs to be um, uh, two Democrats and two Republicans in charge of a poll site, that they can be assigned as the official inspectors for each election district at the poll site, and that all of the other workers uh, can be more flexibly assigned. And if they use the flexible assignment, then you can have different training for different poll workers at the site. Mm. And, and uh, um, my suggestion is that you start out with just giving a poll worker training on how to do the book or how to open the polls or how to unjam the uh, machine um, and uh, uh, increase their salaries as they qualify for additional training and work their way up to uh, uh, a position where they can be in charge of the poll site. So uh, that's my summary of the key things that I think the city should be doing. For the city council, I've uh, repeated in my remarks a section that they should be paying attention to ending the runoff uh, for 2021, um, that that's costly and unnecessary. I personally support instant runoff voting, but uh, it would be just as uh, well if you, or it would, it would still be better if you eliminated the runoff um, to avoid that extra expense for the city. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, I was, uh, Mr. Chair, I was very happy to hear uh, that there's movement for early voting. I think that's going to help some of our problems. It baffles me that in other states um, we have, you know, they had it for years and we're still fumbling in the state uh, with this particular opportunity that we can have. And uh, I think early voting is actually going to bring forth uh, more people to come out to vote, not just because of co the convenience of voting earlier, but it creates um, a buzz about the election. It creates uh, a momentum that begins to take place uh, and an excitement. So I'm very happy about that. I I'm going to ask you this next question because I really don't know the answer to this question. Uh, you mentioned that you have spoken to New York City Board of Election. What's your level of enforcement that you have over the city? And I can see what you <laughs> shaking your head. Is, uh, I'm assuming nothing, right? Well, it's not nothing, okay. but it's only moral suasion, okay. um, uh, realistically. Uh, because I have to get my Republican colleagues to agree to do anything more significant. Um, so. So we try to push them, but when they ignore us, there's not a whole lot we can do. And on these issues of additional poll sites, of dividing the books in half, um, of the way they staff their poll workers, they ignore us. Yeah, we see like, like common sense. Uh, I'm, well, definitely my staff will take a look on your recommendations and we will have the discussion that Director Ryan uh, invited us to have, and we, we've been having discussions uh, to be able to get to a place uh, where we can have just common sense, common sense approach uh, to make it a, a fruitful, beneficial, and positive experience for uh, all of our voters. Uh, one last question from my end. I don't know if council member, he does have a question. Uh, it's in regards to the machines. Who gets to select, I know we had three options, right? At this moment, three machines that are eligible for all the municipalities to use. Is that correct? Three? Depends how you count. Uh, okay. Two vendors. Two um, vendors. And, and uh, it's the state board that's responsible for that. The state 
board? Is the State Board of Elections okay. uh, has to certify the voting machines that can be used and all of the contracts for the purchase of voting equipment have to be approved by the State Board. Do you, do you happen to know why uh, the, the we only had two vendors and less options? I would imagine is there a rationale behind it? Well, I think that uh, politically, uh, after the Help America Vote Act uh, was enacted, um, uh, it became clear that New York State was going to be a ballot scanning state. Uh, although there were vendors that submitted direct recording electronic machines for certification, none of them passed certification because of security and verification issues. Um, so um, uh, these are the systems. I would say that in 2010, uh, the systems were the state of the art. And uh, we always say that New York may have been the last state to come into compliance with the Help America Vote Act, but we were the first to get it right in terms of uh, ballot security and uh, public confidence in the equipment. Um, but there have been uh, developments uh, in the last decade that, um, uh, as uh, Director Ryan indicated, um, particularly as we shift from to early voting and the concept of vote centers. Ideally, every, vote, every citizen of New York should be able to walk into any vote center anywhere in the state obtain the ballot for that voter's locality and cast the vote. And we have that technology now. It's complicated, it might be a little bit expensive, um, and the cost will come down in coming years, uh, but we need to completely rethink the voting process um, so that uh, to make it easier for the voter. Uh, and I'll close with this. I, I'm curious to hear your opinion on online voting, uh, especially for soldiers who are serving uh, far and away. Uh, we do have uh, people, we have um, companies that have federal certification, you know, the people who do the Oscars and the Grammys. I know uh, there is a fear, of, of course, but uh, we're not the only, you know, there's other uh, countries in which they have utilized uh, this with no, uh, with no signs that they've ever been uh, uh, breaking into the system. But we do have at least one company that I know, I met with them, that they, nobody has been able to break in uh, into their system. Uh, I'm just curious as to your opinion. I might be talking. No, Councilman, I'm very uh, a strong advocate on this issue. I would take issue with some of your remarks that I don't, uh, you know, I would challenge um, some of the facts uh, that you've represented. That uh, uh, many experts, including the Department of Defense, have uh, worked on ways to make a secure a ballot that can be transmitted electronically and nobody has been able to do that yet. And claims that vendors make are usually bunk. Mm -hmm. um, the most uh, recent uh, uh, example is this claim of using blockchain voting in West Virginia. Well, first of all, they only used it for 65 ballots, so it's not all that significant. Um, but uh, uh, the experts have shown how it has uh, very substantial security vulnerabilities. In New York State, we provide the ballots online so that uh, uh, military and overseas voters can download the ballots online, right. but they have to return them uh, uh, by mail. Uh, and uh, we believe that that's the only secure system. Now, I'll say that there's one exception I'm willing to make. For the, for the very, very small number of military voters or others who, for whom it is absolutely impossible to mail back a ballot. For example, an astronaut in the, um, space, sta in the uh, uh, space station, um, I would allow them to vote electronically because there really is no other alternative and the number is so small it's not going to be a source of fraud to affect the election. 
But, but I don't hear people talking that way. They want to get the camel's uh, nose under the tent and then have everybody voting. Well, I mean, I'll remind you, we just had a congressman that just won the election by one vote. Uh, we, I remember Council Member White, when he was here, uh, he won by four votes. Uh, so one vote uh, can, can make a difference in, in some races. But, you know, look into the future uh, with all the bright minds that we have uh, in the United States. I'm sure that one of these days uh, that we could get to that place and make it a lot easier. Let me turn it over to Council Member Yeager for, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, joining us today. Be just preliminarily, uh, and I apologize if you addressed this earlier, uh, uh, is your testimony your opinion or is it the opinion of the board? No, it's uh, very much only my opinion. There okay, Four commissioners right. and one commissioner talking is like one hand clapping. No, and, and just to be clear, uh, I don't mean that question with disrespect. I, uh, your, your history in New York State elections and your longevity on the board is to be honored. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that it's clear that it's not the board of elections that's actually here, because I did say that earlier today, and I, I didn't want to uh, misrepresent. Um, you addressed the 30-minute rule, and uh, a number of my colleagues, I believe it was, uh, actually it was Mr. Chairman uh, uh, Torres, uh, who addressed the 30-minute rule and the notion that the board uh, here doesn't necessarily comply with that. And you uh, state this requires more space, which requires advanced planning that needs to take place now. And um, I, I engaged in a lengthy dialogue uh, in both rounds of questioning with the city board about trying to find more space and their, their uh, limitations in that regard. And do you have anything to add to? Well, I, I want to emphasize the one thing is the schools are closed. And um, the city board insists on having a single poll site plan for all election events not a separate poll site plan for the events that require more space. Do you not think that's wise, that, that it makes more sense that, every, that on election day and primary day and special election day and runoff day and every other election day in, the, in between, um, that the voter kind of knows this is where I go and this is where I've always uh, gone. And not if there's not enough space that the voter has to wait two hours in order to vote. So my suggestion to the city board Mr. Chair, was that they inquire and, and explore whether or not there's an ability to get out from the albatross of the, of the requirements of this federal lawsuit that requires it to retrofit a hospital, for example, uh, to uh, make it accessible. I agree with you. I could tell lots of anecdotal stories, but I think that uh, Mr. Ryan also agrees with you in principle of the problems. And I think that in terms of their path of negotiating with the other side, I don't fault them on how they're doing that. I, I think that they're trying. What I fault them on is their lack of commitment to expand the poll sites where they know that they are not in compliance. I, I can and, tell you that uh, not, they, as a, not as a defense of them, but I can tell you that, and that, like I said earlier, I've only been in office for 10 and a half months. And, uh, this question came up earlier this year, uh, shortly after I took office, about this particular senior center, which has been a, a polling site since I was a little kid. And they said, well, we have to get out of there. It doesn't comply. Can you help us find another place? We can try to force ourselves into here. We can try to get into there. And we explored it, and we could not find a location. Yeah. Uh, and it's very, very difficult. I and agree with you, but I you would have a public school. The public school is closed on general election day. They can expand into additional space in the public school as needed. Um, during Hurricane Sandy, um, most of the poll sites in Rockaway uh, got shut down, and all of those poll sites got relocated to just four places, including East Rockaway High School. And I was so impressed with how they handled um, the emergency uh, at the high school simply because what they did is they assigned a classroom for each election district and then had the personnel to escort the voters to the, to, to the classroom for that election district. They had plenty of space, even though they moved something like 20 or 30 election districts into the building. The city knows how to do that. They just have to. But do it only it. works on general election day. It doesn't Correct. work in. Fe it won't work in February, and it won't work in June and September. You don't have the problem then.
because we don't have the turnout. We had it this September, though, Mr. Chairman. We had we had an incredibly high turnout this September to the point no, where there no, were you had, you in had, some in some ads. Uh, there were there were in lines, uh, uh, you know, that I didn't have that in my district, but in some right, ADs, there were bad management. Lines. But the turnout for the September primary is less than half of what the turnout was for the uh, November general election. In both cases, unanticipated, I think is fair to say, in, by everybody, including the election professionals who sit at that table and people like me who have worked in campaigns for 30 years, I didn't see this kind of turnout coming. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who anticipated it. I could tell you Joe Crowley didn't anticipate it in June, <laughs> and there are a lot of people who did not anticipate that kind of turnout, and I was shocked to see some of the turnout uh, in places. I mean, I, as I indicated earlier, I voted in under five minutes, but the turnout was tremendous in June, and then again in September, and then surely in November. Uh, you know, the governor got, got twice as many votes in the city. Uh, it, it's just it, in September, as, he, as his opponent did, or the other way around, I think his opponent got twice as many votes as his opponent did last time, and then he still exceeded the votes by twice as much. It was an incredible and, I believe, unanticipated turnout. I want to just really quickly, one more thing, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, you talked about uh, the increased number of uh, staffing and the staffing at the polls needs to be more efficient, and uh, uh, the director of the board um, talked about the poll worker program and referenced that other cities and jurisdictions have a poll worker program where we use municipal employees, and I engaged in a lengthy dialogue with him earlier this year at uh, this committee um, about that, and he simply has not been able to get it off the ground, not due to the fault of the board, but I believe due to the fault of the government to actually participate. And do you have any recommendations for how to m mandate that, in essence, uh, perhaps in state law by saying, you know, uh, requiring, I don't know, a, a day off for an extra pay or something if you're a municipal employee. Um, and I think, uh, as one of our chairs uh, asked earlier, wouldn't that it have been great if all of our do-it uh, technicians, we have, we have this huge agency here, Department of uh, information technology would it have been able to have been deployed around the city of New York to fix these scanners, which are essentially just come in kind of high operational printers. Um, we have people across the street who can fix scanners pretty quickly. So do you have any advice uh, that you can offer, not to us and not to the city board, but really to the government of New York City as to how to institute a municipal poll worker program? I, th I think it's a good proposal and that um the mayor's office and the council should pay careful attention to the proposal that the city board has advanced. All right. And again, I, I do greatly appreciate uh, you coming in to, to talk to us, and thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You're quite welcome. Mr. Chair, thank you for serving as the co-chair of New York State Board of Election. We really appreciate uh, you waiting. I know you were waiting here for a long time, uh, but um, your suggestions will definitely be noted and follow through. Thank you so much. With that, I invite Jude Ryan from Election Systems and Software. You can go to that. You can begin as, as soon as you are ready. Okay, that better. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the Council today. Um, I have some remarks from my testimony that I would read, but I think a lot of my testimony has been covered here today, so I'll stick to the highlights. Thank you. Um, my name is Judd Ryan. I'm Senior Vice President for Election Systems and Software. I've been with the company for 24 years, um, and I've had responsibility and um, relationship with New York City Board of Elections since the implementation of the ballot marking devices in 2008. Um, the City of New York utilizes the DS200 scanner. Um, that's our most recent technology. It's a digital scanner. It actually images the front and back of the ballot as it's scanned. Um, during the November election, over 37,000 
DS200s were deployed and utilized in jurisdictions across the country, um, including five other jurisdictions in New York State um, besides New York City, including jurisdictions like Nassau County and Erie County. Um, as we all know, the long lines and frustrations many voters experienced on November 6th in New York City was extremely unfortunate and unacceptable. I'm here today to offer my perspective on the causes of some of the problems and to provide ideas on how to improve the voter experience going forward. Um, as we've heard today, um, I think the major culprit here was the first time use of a two-part perforated ballot. Um, this is something that hasn't been done in the city of New York, the state of New York, or anywhere else in the country. Um, so this is a first, I think, for everybody. Obviously, um, in Brooklyn and in Queens, the ballot was two 19-inch ballots perforated together, so a total of 38 inches of paper. And in um, Manhattan and the Bronx, it was 34 inches or two 17-inch ballots. Um, in both cases, obviously, we're talking about a sheet of paper that is three feet long. I don't know of anything uh, in life today where somebody is asked to handle a three-foot sheet of paper. Um, and obviously, that caused a great deal of uh, issue here on Election Day. Um, Number one, the, uh, the piece of paper was long and cumbersome. Um, the privacy booth that the voters provided has a shelf or space for marking that is basically 20 inches long. Hmm. So when you're talking about a 38 inch sheet of paper, um, over a foot is hanging off the front of the, um, the privacy booth or the voter is forced to fold the ballot underneath itself at the perf. I think both of those facts um, kind of do away with the intent of the law um, as it's prescribed and, and what it's supposed to do is provide the voter uh, the visual ability to view the entire ballot in one shot. When you have to fold the ballot underneath itself or half of the ballot is hanging over the edge of the privacy booth, obviously the voter's not getting the benefit of seeing the entire ballot. So I think essentially what we're talking about here is legislation and a technology, in this case, uh, paper-based voting, are not aligned. Um, the DS-200 was utilized, you know, just in some cases a few miles away from the city of New York in Nassau County um, the exact same, same type of scanner, uh, same age of equipment, and same weather conditions, and they did not experience the problems that New York City experienced. And the difference is with the two-part ballot, you do not have, on one of the pieces, you do not have a single clean edge to feed through the scanner. Both edges are perforated, which can be rough, they have the tendency to, to catch um, and, and can uh, attribute to jams. The other thing that was exhibited or observed on election day were voters, and I'm certainly not blaming the voters, they've never been exposed to this, uh, were trying to feed the entire 38 inch ballot through the scanner without bursting it. Um, some were folding the ballot over and trying to feed two pieces when the scanner is only designed, obviously, and needs to take it, um, it can't have it folded over because it's too thick. And then also, if it were to accept it that way, you'd, you wouldn't be reading the panel, so the scanner automatically rejects it. There is a sensor that will kick the ballot back and make sure that it does not accept two ballots at one time. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is the voters instructed to separate the ballot after they make their marks. So you're asking a voter to separate a ballot while they're at the scanner. You know, so they have to tear it basically in, in midair instead of having a desk or something like when you're tearing a piece of paper out of a legal pad or your checkbook 
you can apply pressure and then tear. The voters weren't afforded that luxury. You know, they're tan tearing the ballot at the scanner, uh, which led to a lot of uh, imperfect tears. So essentially now you have one ballot that's too long and another ballot that's too short, uh, both of which are um, issues that will cause the, the scanner to return the ballot back to the voter. Okay, so obviously a lot of issues with the perforated ballot. Um, there's been some discussion about humidity and the weather and so forth, uh, so I'd like to set the record straight on that. Um, humidity is not an issue. Uh, these scanners operate in South Florida, Alabama, the Carolinas, Mississippi, very humid environments. Uh, we don't see jams or issues based on humidity. Um, we did get reports of because of the length of the ballot that it was difficult for voters to hold the ballot in a way that really made sense. And so ballots were touching wet clothing because of the length of the ballot, things of that nature. Wet paper is an issue um, for scanners, printers, copiers. You know, um, paper, wet paper will not travel well through machinery. Um, that was an issue. Um, and then lastly, I think the volume of paper um, was filling up the tote bins inside the ballot boxes, which led to uh, a backup into the ballot path, which was another cause uh, for some of the jamming. Um, you know, as I've sat here today, I've heard uh, a lot of the council members ask for suggestions going forward and potentially improving the process. When it comes to the ballot, um, because I think, you know, the full face requirement to see the ballot in one shot is not really being honored because it's, it's laying over or being folded under, um, you know, hopefully the uh, New York State Legislature would consider uh, doing away with uh, having the ballot in a single sheet uh, for several reasons. Um, we do have multiple page ballots quite a bit in other jurisdictions, uh, Miami-Dade, Florida, uh, Hillsborough County, Florida, they had multiple page ballots. They both utilized DS-200s. Um, in Miami-Dade, for example, they had five 19-inch ballots per voter, and they did not experience any of the issues as far as jamming goes that were experienced here on election day. So, you know, to do away with the perforated ballot and uh, maybe even the need for the numbered stub. Numbered and stubs, um, you know, are typically asked for here in New York for ballot accountability. Um, there are other methods of providing ballot accountability without numbering and stubs, which actually, by removal of that requirement, the jurisdictions would actually save money on ballot production uh, without uh, compromising the integrity of the election or the ballot counts. There are other methods for that. So that would be another method. Um, and then as I've listened today, you know, there's been a lot of talk about polling places and space. Um, I think a redesign of the polling location. You know, the scanners are already set up to tabulate by polling place, but um, because of, I think, carryover from lever machine days, you're still checking in by EDAD. Uh, you could check in by polling place and establish a much more orderly f flow to the polling locations as well as free up space by eliminating uh, ED supply carts and things that will allow for more privacy booths and uh, scanners on election day. So those are some of the elements. Um, the other thing, there's been a lot of talk about emergency ballots. Uh, again, I think this is a carryover from the lever machine days. Um, when a lever machine went down, you switch to emergency ballots. Um, states that are used to voting on paper, they don't have such a classification. Uh, a ballot is a ballot. Um, and I think that's relevant from the standpoint that if a scanner is inoperable for some reason, um, ballots are pushed into the emergency bin, 
once the scanner is uh, restored, replaced, or functioning again. Uh, typically, the procedure is to have a one poll worker of each party and uh, a police officer, in the case of the state of New York, come over, remove those ballots from the emergency bin, and feed them through the scanner. That way, excuse me, to some of the questions that have been asked here today, was my ballot tabulated? There are procedures in place to make sure that it is counted. It's counted during voting hours, and then at the end of the day, the election day workers, after a very long day, don't have additional tasks to perform. Um, so those are some of my uh, observations. Lastly, I would just like to say, uh, on behalf of election systems and software, I want to emphasize that you have our commitment to work with legislators, New York State Board of Elections, and the New York City Board of Elections to work towards solutions that ensure both the election laws and the technology work together for the benefit of the voter experience. We empathize with the voters who experience unacceptable lines and frustrations. And we are eager to do our part to improve the process. Procedures and operations to enhance the voting experience and maintain voter confidence. Um, I appreciate your time here today and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, thank you so much for that testimony. It's very helpful uh, to put everything into, into context. I have a few questions. I, the, all the suggestions that you had given, were those suggestions given to the Board of Elections uh, prior uh, to election day? Um, we've had discussions with the board about some of these um, ideas. Um, you know, I think until uh, a problem presents itself, a lot of time uh, legislators have, you know, more uh, pressing issues on their plate. I think, um, you know, after a problem presents itself that obviously I think people are I'm more willing to listen. Um, but did your company anticipate, did your company knew that there was gonna be a problem because of the perforation, uh, that we were gonna have more than usual jams? Uh, we did. Um, I had a conversation with Mr. Ryan about this. We said, you know, uh, we're worried. We're concerned about the perforation, we're concerned about what voters will do with this. Um, and, you know, Mr. Ryan recognized, you know, uh, the things that I uh, raised, and, you know, he had had those thoughts already as well. Um, you know, I think where the New York City Board was stuck was between uh, trying to follow the law and fit everything on a single sheet of paper and then balance a readable font. Obviously, uh, to stay within the confines of the 19-inch ballot, uh, you know, the five languages, it's, you know, I, I don't know if it's a six-point or a five-point font, but I've seen the ballot, and it's very hard to read. But I actually, I appreciate that you warn uh, the Board of Election what should have taken place within the context that they were given, is to assign, and this is what I've been saying from the very beginning of to this hearing, to assign a tech person, to hire more people, or to call out to do it uh, here in the city, uh, to have provided more text, because as you so clearly pointed out, you anticipated these problems were gonna happen. Uh, no fault of the way the machine was designed originally. You were given this task for understand the last minute. I, hopefully it was last minute, because if it's from a long, long time ago, then I wonder why uh, there was no rem you know, earlier remedy to this. But the most immediate, easiest way to have dealt with this was to have more techs uh, in the poll sites to fix the jams or to allow the poll workers to deal with the easiest type, which was the upper jam, as, as I understand it. 
Um, that's correct. The typically when the the scanner jams, um, it can be cleared by opening the lock in front, sliding the scanner forward, and removing the ballot. Um, it's a rather quick process. Where it becomes cumbersome is when you uh, factor in the breaking of the seal, the recording of the seal, the additional requirements that are in place, then it, it's, it begins to take more time. Um, but that's small compared, uh, smaller problem compared to the two hour lines that we were having. And that, at the end of the day, uh, was, is the reason why we're here, uh, yeah. because um, technically we should have anticipated, the Board of Elections should have anticipated this was gonna happen, you guys warned them, uh, and this was the first time, uh, and therefore it would have made a lot of sense uh, to have the text there. Let me move on to a couple of quick questions. I know. Uh, my colleague does have a, uh, a question or two, or however many questions he needs to ask. But uh, the DS200 machines have a useful life of 10 years. Can you explain what useful life means, and can these machines still be used after the useful life? Can you talk about uh, talk about the software? because you mentioned these are the latest machines, though the machines are nine years old. I would imagine what keeps changing is the software, not the, the actual machine, or perhaps the machine has changed, I don't know. Uh, but if you could uh, address the issue of the 10-year useful life. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I'm not sure where the 10-year useful life um, a statement or issue came from. Um, we like to like tell it. our customers that you know they can stay on a technology as long as they want to use it. We'll Thanks. keep that. We'll keep that product going for them. Um, we've demonstrated that over the years. We had a product um, two generations ago called the Optech Eagle. That product came out in 1990. We just saw people go away from that product in the last two years. So we had people using that product. Um, for almost 30 years. Our uh, predecessor to the DS200 was called the Model 100. That product came out in 1997. Uh, we still have people using that product today. So obviously they're on it for 20 years and counting now. Um, I think the same holds tr true for the DS200. Um, you can keep that product for 10 years, 15 years, uh, or longer if you wish. Um, I think, um, you know, some of it will depend on uh, legislation and the, and the law that you have today. I mean, with this ballot here, you are about two inches away from potentially having a third panel to this ballot. Um, as we've heard today, you know, there are additional contests, maybe requests for additional languages to be applied to the ballot. You add one or two more languages, this ballot would have been either a 51 um, or a 56 inch ballot. That's, that's getting, with the current law, that's, that's a very long piece of paper. I mean, that's, for some people, as tall as they are. I mean, a ballot as tall as the person voting on it. Um, which obviously would be even more cumbersome and more problematic. Um, and that's not unrealistic. I mean, literally probably two inches away from being in a scenario in this particular election. So, uh, look, I, part of my life I was racing my high school years. The first time I voted was in L.A. And you know how over there they have propositions uh, for just about everything and anything. So... Uh, I'm, I'm shocked as well that we still have, we're requiring the state to have perforation. I think we should uh, uh, stay away uh, from that. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that uh, the numbers, the years that we were told really came from the Board of Elections. They're the only ones who have told us that they have a lifespan of only 10 years. 
And so thank you for clarifying at that point, uh, and which leads me to the maintenance contract. What kind of, uh, can you describe what the maintenance contract and, or agreement you hold with the city uh, board of elections? Um, sure. Um, so when they first acquired the equipment, the equipment came with a uh, five-year warranty, which included uh, both uh, all parts and labor associated with repair of the units, uh, preventative maintenance, as well as software and firmware maintenance on the products. Um, right now, our arrangement with the city is we have, um, at the request of the New York City Board of Elections, we train their technicians to do preventative maintenance. Um, if a machine uh, breaks or parts go bad, uh, ESNS does the repair. So the board does the maintenance, we do the actual repairs, and then they also have a contract with us to keep the software and the firmware um, on the products up to date uh, and in line with current technology. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Councilor Marley Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, joining us today and uh, using your experience to help us understand what has happened and what could be made better. Um, you mentioned Miami-Dade County as a jurisdiction which uses similar technology and software and paper and scanning and whatnot. How are their lines on election day? Um, you know, I think every uh, jurisdiction with a concentrated population will experience lines from time to time. Um, I can tell you that they weren't having lines based on uh, backup at the scanner. Uh, you know, often um, lines are generated by the check-in process. Um, but I did not hear of reports of long lines in this particular election in Miami. Now, uh, Florida also offers early voting. Um, so that does take some of the pressure off of election day by handling a portion of your electorate prior to the big day. Florida, Florida also has historic trouble counting ballots, as I've learned. Uh, well, I, I'm sure you're referring to the 2000 presidential and the, the hanging and pad. the last and the last 10 days. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many voters? I'm sorry. How many vote? Yes. Excuse me. How many voters per scanner are planned for planned for in the Florida jurisdiction? To, just to frame it, uh, in New York, uh, we used to have a system where uh, one. Uh, lever machine would be assigned per 800 voters in a particular ED. So if there was an ED with 1,600 voters, that ED would have two, scan two lever machines. Uh, because we no longer segregate voters by ED, we, seg we combine them within a single poll site. We use, uh, or the board uses 1,400. I've learned, I thought it was 1,600 as the number. So if there are uh, 4,800, then they use, you know, 48 to three, three scanners, four scanners, based on each time it goes up to an additional 1,400. What is the number of voters that uh, Florida uses? Um, I don't know their exact uh, ratio, okay. council member. Um, so it's, I mean, it's just, from my perspective, it's important to, you know, make sure that we're comparing, you know, apples and apples, not apples and Volkswagens. Uh, you know, if we're talking about what happened in Florida, let's just make sure, you know, your scanners may work just fine, and I'm not saying they don't, um, and I'm not saying that there's a problem with your system or there isn't, but I want to make sure that if we're looking to another jurisdiction for a solution and saying, well, they're at least a gold standard or somewhere closer to a gold standard than New York City is, let's just make sure that we're actually looking at the same thing. Uh, understood. Okay. And I was not trying to imply that they were the gold standard. Um, what I was—I well, don't think to you are. I don't think anybody would. Okay. Okay. Um, Just that the the non-perforated aspect of their ballot um, is an experience that doesn't create jams like a perforated ballot does. Okay. Fair enough. And and I agree with that. I think that the 
perforation requirement, and I've said this earlier today, the perforation requirement of state law is something that was instituted before anybody in New York voted on paper other than absentee voters and emergency voters. Um, and there was this idea, I guess, uh, that, you know, ballot security, making sure that the voter received an intact ballot and that there was no, you know, funny business at the inspector's table. We make sure that the, if a ballot has to be on more than one page, it's a, it's a ballot with a perforation that the voter himself or herself has to tear. Um, I asked earlier of the board if it was aware, and I would ask you the same thing. Is there a system or is there a scanner on the market that can receive a single upload of all of our various var variations of uh, ballot style that we have in New York City, which are several thousand? Or, or can be several thousand in an election. Can it just receive the upload without all of the uh, uh, individualized testing that's required, leaving aside that the testing is a requirement of law but, uh, and, and board process set in Albany, but that if there was a way that we could create a system where someone just puts in a disk and says these are the 4,200 different kinds of ballots that are being used in New York City on election day, and now every machine has all of that information in it. Um, the machines you have today are capable of doing that. The DS-200 is capable of holding every single ballot style um, in the borough of Manhattan, for example. So it so doesn't have, in the borough of Manhattan, you say? In the, well, what about I, the entire in the entire city? Um, how many it, how many it, ballot styles can it hold? Nine thousand nine hundred ninety. Nine thousand. Okay, so up to ten thousand ballot styles. Yes, sir. And it doesn't require individual upload of each ballot. It could just receive that information in one programming. The ballot styles are button. put onto a USB drive. Okay, so um, each ballot style is, is placed onto that USB drive for a given. We classify them as polling locations. So. <clears throat> In the case of states or um, counties that have uh, vote centers, early voting, in-person absentee, however you want to classify it, typically those DS-200s are loaded with every single style in the jurisdiction. How long does it take to load all the ballot styles? If you were going to use the maximum that the machine could take, 9,999, how, many, how, how long does it take to load that onto a machine? Uh, just a matter of minutes. Okay, and so it's the testing that's an hour per ballot? So the testing, you know, New York State prescribes a certain configuration of ballots that need to go through a given device. So what you could do with some, you know, lenience in the rules and regulations is you could take your monster test deck, which would be a monstrous test deck, feed that through uh, the high speed reader and then essentially, after you've proven that the election definition is correct and accurate, then copy it to the precinct scanner so you're not having to hand feed thousands and thousands and thousands of ballots. And then each scanner can do that testing without, or do that verification that the ballot could be read properly without an individualized testing of each ballot per scanner. Yes. I believe that the, the board right now basically votes a ballot into the machine to make sure that it's aligning the ovals into the proper place that, you know, Andrew Cuomo gets his votes and not Molinaro's votes. Yeah, so there's really, there's two purposes to the testing that's conducted is one is to make sure that the election definition that is loaded onto the USB drive is accurate. That when you feed the ballots through that um, the election definition is what you suspect it to be and that it's counting accurately. Okay, so I don't, I don't my time is up, uh, it's been up for a while, so I don't okay. want to keep you on this, but, but the basic takeaway that I'm getting is that these machines can take up to 10,000 ballots, they do not, assuming the law and the rules of the board were to permit it, which they do, don't right now, and the city board has got its hands, its hands tied by Albany, uh, it would be able to do this without necessarily having to test each ballot into each machine and each machine requiring an hour. So for example, as the uh, director stated earlier today, 924 ballot styles in Manhattan would have taken 924 hours. That would not be necessary on, with your equipment. Based on yes changes no. to the rules and, and yeah. regulations, yes. Um, Technologically speaking, it would not, forget about the rules and regs and the statutes. 
The answer is yes. Please, yes, okay, yes. got it. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Chairman. If yes, I could just, sure. if the intent is to vote anywhere and, and uh, have the flexibility that you're talking about where if you live in Brooklyn, you can vote in Manhattan, if you're voting on paper, it would also require the introduction it's not what, of- I'm sorry. Okay. That's not, what I'm saying is that we have, we have six, six, 5,000 ballot machines in New York City. Uh, they, are not, they, they are deployed particularly to locations. And then there are 1,000 backup ballots, the 1,000 ba backup scanners. The 1,000 scanners are not, uh, are not programmed with particular ballots given the complexities of loading up thousands and thousands of variations of ballots. So a machine that's sitting dormant in Manhattan not being utilized won't necessarily be deployed elsewhere anyway because it doesn't have any information on it. It's available to be deployed in case of emergency. What I'm suggesting is can the city of New York, can the city board of New York take all 5,000 machines, put all the different variations of the ballots on all the machines, and then have them available to be deployed wherever they are. So for example, if uh, you know, they find out that as the director was at PS22 in Crown Heights on uh, election day, he sees a machine broken, he can pick up the phone, call up a guy who has another machine a couple of blocks away, and hey, let's get that machine over and plug it in, and it'll be good to go. That's a yes or no. Uh, that's a yes. Okay. I, 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 there may be a, a better alternative to troubleshooting. That. I just want to make sure the, yep. techno the, the technology allows it on your equipment. Before it, we deal with the, the, the issues of whether or not the law allows it and, yep. and, and the state board which governs the city board allows it and whether it's, it's even logistically possible. Just want to make sure that the technology that we're talking about, these ES200s, DS200s can actually accommodate what I'm suggesting. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just have one question. It's related to, you mentioned that humidity doesn't have a factor because you had it in Florida and all the states where humidity uh, is definitely much higher. Does your manual, I heard said that, that your manual, in your manual it says, that it needs to, they should be operated in environments where humidity levels are under 50%. Is that correct, or did I get? Uh, no, sir, that's, that's not a correct figure. Okay, okay great. Well, I wanna thank you. Uh, you clarify some things for me, some very important things. Thank you so much uh, for the information. Uh, and with that, uh, we go to our next panelist. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very informative. So we'll be calling uh, for the Chief Democracy Officer in YC, Ayerini Fonseca Sabu. Please raise your right hand. But do you swear or affirm, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera. Uh, and thank you for having this hearing. Um, to you and Chair Torres and uh, the speaker today, my name is Irene Fonseca Sabuni. I'm the Chief Democracy Officer for the City of New York. I work with the Democracy NYC initiative in the mayor's office. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify before you on such an important topic that affects more than 4.6 million New Yorkers. First, I'm going to tell you about the Democracy NYC initiative, some of the work that we've done, and what we think can ameliorate some of the problems that happened on election day two weeks ago today. The Democracy NYC initiative was born out of the voter purge uh, that happened in 2016, where 200,000 voters in New York City were improperly purged from the polls. Combined with low voter turnout during the 2016 general election, 
the administration identified a need to increase voter participation in civic engagement. The Democracy NYC initiative is responsive to those needs. The goals of the initiative are to increase voter registration, participation, and civic engagement. The initiative was announced in the Mayor's State of the City Address uh, this past February, which detailed a robust 10-point plan for the initiative. Earlier this year, Philip Thompson was appointed as the Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy Initiatives and charged with overseeing the initiatives, and I began in this role last month. I'm an educator and a civil rights and human rights attorney. I've devoted my professional career to giving voice and building power in vulnerable communities locally and internationally. Uh, most recently, I worked as a tenants' rights attorney representing tenant associations in affirmative litigation against landlords and working closely with community organizing groups throughout the city. It has been a privilege to support tenants building power in their communities and using their voices to make change. I've also worked as a teacher at high schools in Bushwick and Uganda and as a community health program coordinator in rural Rwanda. In each of these roles, I have strived to give voice to communities who may not otherwise have had a voice. In this way, my work as the first Chief Democracy Officer for the City of New York is a natural extension of my work. Since I began this position last month, only a month before the election, I have been speaking with New Yorkers all over the city, uh, in all of the boroughs, in high schools, in senior centers, in community centers, in houses of worship. I have relished the opportunity to hear from all of these New Yorkers, and all of them have said the same thing. It is too hard to vote in this city. This past election only exemplified these problems. We had people waiting online for two or three hours, leaving without knowing whether their vote had been counted, leaving without the opportunity to vote, polling sites with no operable scanners, or only one scanner operable, people who did not have privacy to fill out their ballots as legally required. In, tw in 2018, it is past time to modernize and professionalize our elections in New York City. I will, start talk, uh, I will start by talking about some of the city-led initiatives that we have done and then move on to state reforms that are needed. Voting rights are civil rights. The city recognizes its role in making voting accessible to all who are eligible, including and particularly communities who are historically disenfranchised or who have participated less in voting. To that end, the city has spearheaded a number of initiatives engaging young voters, voters with limited English proficiency, and those who are or have been involved with the justice system. The city has also offered the Board of Elections $20 million to support and reform that institution which is responsible for administering elections in this city. Starting with engaging youth voters, this past spring, for the first time, the mayor's office worked with the Department of Education to initiate Student Voter Registration Day on a citywide basis. In over 300 high schools, the Democracy NYC team worked with the Department of Education to register over 10,000 young people on one day. We heard from students how empowering it was to work to have the opportunity to register in school. One student in particular who registered as a senior at the high school for health professions and human services said, I don't think I would have been motivated to go out and figure out how to register to vote by myself. I would, not, I would have put it off and there would not have been a point when it would have been too late. This person is now a freshman and college and voted absentee for the first time. We know that when people vote young and vote early, they can become lifelong voters. We have also worked with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to support the um, voting of uh, New Yorkers with limited English proficiency, which has been discussed today. This year, uh, this past election, two weeks ago, Moya provided interpretation services at 101 polling sites around the city, offering Russian, Haitian Creole, Yiddish, Italian, Arabic, or Polish interpreters going beyond what is required by the Voting Rights Act, which currently requires, at certain polling sites, interpretation in Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, and Bangla. Sites and languages for Moya's interpretation services were selected using census data. Moya is currently evaluating the success of this project to inform the citywide expansion passed by the voters this past election as part of the 
Charter Revision Commission expansion. Moya has also provided translation of state voter registration forms into 11 languages beyond those required by the Voting Rights Act. All of these initiatives uh, aimed at making it easier for New Yorkers with limited English proficiency to fully participate in voting. Uh, we also have been working on voter participation for justice-involved people. Um, starting this past summer, we worked with the Campaign Finance Board and the Legal Aid Society in order to register detainees and visitors on Rikers Island. Um, first, we worked with DOC to uh, increase outreach efforts um, on Rikers Island posting over 1,000 voter outreach posters containing voter registration information in English and Spanish at high traffic areas throughout the facilities. Also, um, working with staff on Rikers Island, law library coordinators, program counselors, in order to make sure they were getting the word out to folks who were detained on Rikers Island that they could register to vote, that they could vote by absentee ballot. Um, perhaps most importantly, we worked with the Department of Corrections to implement a secondary mail channel, which both sped up the receipt and um, sending of voter mail and increased the security and the privacy of requests for um, absentee ballots and voter registration. Through this initiative, over 900 Almost 900 individuals were registered to vote, including both detainees and visitors at Rikers Island. Despite the success of these initiatives and our commitment to continue them, New York needs change at the state level and systemic reform. First and foremost, we need Board of Elections reform in this city. New York City deserves a professionalized and modernized Board of Elections, which will ensure that what happened two weeks ago never happens again. We also need early voting in this state to alleviate the massive crush when 4.6 million registered voters are eligible to vote during a 15-hour period on one day. 37 states and the District of Columbia have early voting. We need early voting in New York. We also need no excuse absentee voting so that people can send in their ballot without a pre-approved reason or excuse. We need to modernize voter registration in this state through automatic voter registration, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, and same day voter registration. Finally, we need electronic poll books uh, in order to make um, the voting process more nimble, more efficient, and more accurate on election day. Voting in New York City has been far too long for far too long for far far too hard for far too long. We look forward to partnering with the council to bring much needed reform to voting in our city. I appreciate the council's focus on this issue and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. I uh, have a few questions. I, uh, but before I get the question, I concur with your four points uh, that you brought forth, and uh, hopefully at the state level, uh, we will get uh, uh, some much needed help and legislation. I wanted to ask you regarding um, the Board of Election, New York City Board of Election uh, suggestion on using municipal employees as supplemental poll workers. Uh, what's the administration's position? Today is the first I've heard of that proposal, um, and I look forward to hearing more about it and exploring it. We are very interested in making it easier to vote in this city. Um, the administration offered $20 million to the Board of Elections two years ago um, in order to address many of the issues that appear time and time again in New York City's elections. So uh, I will uh, look forward to exploring that with the Board of Elections. Yeah, I would love for the administration to have a dialogue with New York City Board of Elections because what they were sharing earlier, as you heard, is that uh, much of the funding that has been offered and what is being targeted for, uh, in so many words, they have, there's no need for that. They would rather see a target on this particular issue that will make it a lot easier. Uh, but I thank you for uh, wanting to have that discussion and I'm looking forward to being part of that. Absolutely, and you know, if I could just say, um, 
the reason that there were um, attach, uh, you know, conditions attached to the funding is because we didn't want to see the exact same thing happening with that funding. And uh, respectfully uh, to the consultant that the commission uh, has been working with, um, whatever those recommendations are, they clearly have not been working. And so this funding, the requirements attached were to have a blue ribbon commission that would identify the failures, um, would have um, outside consultants who could think about poll worker training, perhaps we would have known in advance that we should have trained poll workers to address some of these issues in advance. So um, day of logistics, that was another thing. Every election day we hear about these logistical problems. It is not a surprise that we have millions of people voting in New York City. So um, that is the reason uh, there were conditions attached to that funding. Uh we uh, sent you a letter back in October 18. Yes. Uh, with 12 questions, and I, when I say we, I mean Council Member Richie Torres, my co-chair, and myself. Uh, when can we expect to have the answers? Uh, very soon. Um, things have been quite busy in our office and um, uh, leading up to and following Election Day, but we're looking forward to uh, responding to each of your um, questions very soon. So very soon means? Um, it's a relative term. <laughs> a week, two weeks, uh, three months. <laughs> you know, I, I um, you know, we have the holiday coming up this week. I would say um, that within the next couple of weeks okay. um, would be my uh, goal, and and I really think we can get that done. Thank you so much. Uh, let me turn it over to Councilmember Yeager, and then I have. Um, Two final questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the $20 million that the administration was going to give to the Board of Elections, Board of Elections uh, broke it down for us. I didn't really take notes on that, but if I remember, $11.5 million they identified as things they didn't need. Um, and then I don't remember what they said about the other stuff. But what I do remember is they said they spoke with a consultant that they had, and uh, $7.5 million, I think, of that was something that the consultant that they had said was not necessary. And now for the first time, as I understand it, you're representing that uh, you, were, you were suggesting they use the money, you, I mean the administration was suggesting they use the money um, for other consultants. So the Board of Elections consultants decided not necessary, they're wrong. You guys wanted to use it for consultants that you thought made sense, you're right. Which consultants are right and which consultants are wrong? What I can say is that what is happening in New York City on election day, year after year, is not working. And so the funding was attached to a few conditions, including a blue ribbon commission that would examine the failures. This came directly out of the purge of 200,000 voters in 2016. Why did that happen? What needed to be changed to make sure that that did not happen again? So there was the Blue Ribbon Commission, there was an independent consultant to recommend changes, increased poll worker training, um, day of logistical support to make sure that the issues that we see coming up again and again do not continue to happen. Well, nobody loves a good Blue Ribbon Commission more than I do. Um, but as I identified your, your suggestions on pages five and six of what you provided to the council, uh, every single thing that you identified here is uh, something that the state legislature needs to enact. Nothing we can do here, nothing you can do over on the other side, nothing that the Board of Elections can do. Is that correct? I mean, is that an accurate uh, uh, wrap up of what you've suggested? BOE reform, they need to professionalize the modernized Board of Elections. State legislature needs to put that in early voting. We can't do that. No excuse absentee voting, can't do that. Voter registration. Uh, change automatic voter registration, pre-registration of 16, 17-year-olds, I don't know why not 14-year-olds, but sure. Same-day voter reg, all good. Electronic poll book, sure, that's great. None of that can happen here in this building. My hope is that we can partner with you and the other members of the council in order to work together to get that done in Albany. I think in terms of things that can happen here, um, the 20 million offer was not specifically outlined in my testimony, but I would be happy to go. Okay. 
One of the things I spoke about with, I don't know how long you've been in the room today, but one of the things I spoke with- uh, I've been here all day. Okay, yes. super, sorry. No, uh, it's been- I, I got paid to be here, and <laughs> you know, I appreciate that you're here. Um, the, the board, uh, both the city board and the uh, uh, co-chair of the state elections board, um, uh, we talked about uh, uh, expanding the number of poll sites. And you know, I, I'll go back to the example that I've used, uh, the 300 people registered to vote at the local firehouse. It's not really something we can get here in New York City, but surely I think we all agree that the number of people who are voting in most of our poll sites is simply a very large number. And, and my question has been constantly, what can we do to make that smaller and have more poll sites? And the board, uh, seems to indicate that its hands are tied and with respect to uh, expanding the number of poll sites, they're doing the things they can and that they are working diligently. And I can tell you that in my district, they have reached out to me to try to help them identify additional poll sites, but uh, they have consistently pointed back to some, uh, they haven't termed it this way, but I will, ridiculous hand tying uh, uh, that they are facing because of an order from uh, federal court uh, that requires them to retrofit a hospital to make sure that it can handle people who need access to get in, which I would assume that a hospital seems to be okay handling people who can get in. But it's good enough for the patients and it's good enough for their families, not good enough for the board under this order. So my question is, what is the city doing to help the board get out from the albatross of this uh, seemingly ridiculous order? I can't speak to the details of that court order. We can follow up with your office um, about that. Don't e I you don't even have to follow up. Just help them get out from under it because it seems to me that it's ridiculous that we have places in New York City which are clearly accessible and uh, for every purpose other than for voting. And it just doesn't make sense that the board can't, that the board's hands are tied in identifying additional locations that a senior center is good enough to receive DIFTA funding and is good enough to serve as a senior center, but is not good enough to support those very same seniors to go vote on election day. A after looking into that- No, 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 I'm not I saying that you would have the okay. answer and I- But I, but, but I, I will say that the, 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 the crush of voting on election day um, could be ameliorated by early voting and by no excuse absentee, so- Okay, great, we'll adopt that today then. Well, we can work together to get that no, done. No, we can't. We can work together. That's that's a talking point. We can't work together in adopting it. We're not the we're not the state legislature. Yes, go but up all to of Albany. Us. I'll tell you where to get a ticket. Go up to Albany, get them to do it, and I come back and let us know how it happens. Come with me. I don't want early voting, so you're not going to get me to go with you. But well, that, that's my a point, different issue. But if my you point don't want is, early voting, but my point do. is, that, my point is that coming to the council and saying that we, we can fix the board of elections by only getting early voting is not necessarily. And by the way, I want to amend my statement in a second, but it's not necessarily the fix to the to to the problems that are at the board. Early voting will help a little bit, but I think everybody who testified the. Experts who know their machines will testify that early voting will take a little bit of a burden away from the board, but you're still going to have the early morning crush. I could tell you in my neighborhood, um, uh, the, the number of people who vote between 6 and 9 p.m. far exceeds the number of people who vote between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. by vast, vast, vast numbers. And I have been, uh, the last two elections, I don't remember the weather in every election day, but I could tell you that last November and this November, very, very bad rain. I was at the same poll site. The number of people who come at the end of the day are tremendous. Early voting doesn't necessarily get that. But before I go any further, I just want to fix one thing. It's not that I'm against early voting. I'm, I'm, my point is that I'm, I'm, I don't want to point the finger at early voting and at no excuse absentee voting and at all the different fixes and saying, well, if only we had same day voter registration, then we wouldn't have lines at the, at the polling places. It doesn't even make sense that these are the things we're pointing to, to saying that's what we can fix. All of your points are right. Your advocacy is incredible. You're 100% right on your points. But the idea that that's what's going to fix our elections, instead of simply just having, instead of 1,200 or thereabouts polling sites, 2,400 or 5,000, and reduce the number of sites that are in New York City so that the bipartisan team of election inspectors that do make sense to have can do their work, get people in and out. I know that was a lot. I'm sorry about that. No, I, I mean, I agree with you that we need comprehensive election reform for New York City. Um, it will not, there is no one fix. We are so far behind so many other states. I just so, gave you one fix. I gave you one fix. Well, 
I can say to that one, I'm going to need to look at that issue, it's not something I have examined, so after I look at it, I would be happy to weigh in. If a poll site didn't have to accommodate more than 500 voters, elections would be smoother. I, that's not that's not a guess. It's, I don't need a study to tell you that. It's just, you know, anybody With respect voted, to the federal court order, I can't speak to that. It's not a federal court order. I'm just telling you, if we can figure out a way to, to I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that that's the only problem. I'm suggesting that the city of New York should make sure that it, that it helps the Board of Elections get into more places, whether they need to retrofit these locations in order to make them compliant, or whether the Corp Council can help the Board get out from under this albatross of an order. But either way, we need more poll sites, and we need the Municipal Poll Worker Program absolutely do. And I engaged in a conversation with the, with the uh, Executive Director of the Board back, uh, Mr. Chairman, sometime I think during budget time we talked about it. Uh, at our committee, and, and the board was telling us that they have been talking to the administration. I know it was before you got there, so this is you know, something you'd have to look at, but the board was telling us that they have been talking to the administration about trying to kick something off like that, and I, I just think it's not only a good program for, for our election systems, but it's good for our municipal employees. It'll help them. It'll, it'll use their talents in a way to participate and help the city. It'll give them a benefit because there are ways that we can pay them with an extra day off, comp time, et cetera, and it's just good all around. There's no reason not to do it, and I would love for the administration to be able to help us get that done. I would love to hear more about that, and I have been briefed extensively on the discussions that the administration have ha has had with the Board of Elections. I'm going to give you my book about the Los Angeles. Thank, thank you. Um, and I, I think that what we need is comprehensive reform at every level, um, and I, I think this is the time to get it done in New York. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Council member, and uh, I have to Thank say you. it's very logical, but if you have more sites, less lines of people will move quicker, less aggravation. Uh, so, Chief, um, please help us with that uh, so we could uh, have uh, more sites. I only have one more question, and this is going back to August. Democracy NYC announced an increase in poll worker pay. Now, this is August, and it was through Democracy NYC. Uh, several of us supported that, even supply, supplying quotes uh, for your press release. When the primary election came the next month, there was no pay increase, and poll workers were left confused and disappointed. And so the question, the logical next question, will be uh, why uh, you did not increase the poll workers' pay into the general election. I am familiar with the increase in poll worker pay. Um, it was also one of the things in the package of um, uh, reforms that were offer was offered uh, two years ago um, with the $20 million poll worker increases was one of those. Um, I, I think it's very important uh, wh when the offer was made in August, I you know, I wasn't here. I'm not sure why, when the offer was made, what the implementation timeline was. Um, I know that it was implemented for um, the general election two weeks ago, um, and I can look into that specific, you know, t timing question about implementation and get back to so you. So let me help you out. It was, it was Democracy NYC. You can find it online. We actually mentioned it to one of your staff at their last hearing or the hearing before that. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's here. He's a tremendous staff that you have, uh, very capable. And so, uh, and it was, you know, we little, I literally read it from online, uh, and it was in August. So the implication is if you're making a statement in August and the election is in September, that the messaging that people receive, and I don't mean you because you weren't here, but the messaging is, that uh, they're gonna get the increase on the next election. I mean, to me, that would be the next logical jump. There was nothing said that it was gonna happen in November. Uh, so uh, it was easily, uh, it was very easy for everyone to assume that it was for September. Uh, I will also encourage you uh, to not only look at it, but uh, it's not too late uh, to go back and to uh, get this increase of pay, the money's there, 
uh, the funding is there, and, and it's gonna make a difference for a lot of the people who um, you know it's not easy work. I, I'm, I always salute everyone who does this kind of work because they're there, you know, five o'clock, actually 4.30 in the morning, they get up very early, they, they come out uh, very late at night, it's a very long day, so this extra pay at the very least is meaningful, symbolic, uh, but at the, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's to compensate uh, in light of the fact that we pay them very little. Uh, so uh, please, if you could go back and see if we could go retroactively on this and make this move, I think it would also send a loud message to all of our poor workers that they matter. Thank you, I will look into that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank really you. I appreciate your input. I'm looking forward to reviewing uh, your testimony uh, and see what we can implement. Thank you. Okay, and with that, to the very patient, uh, you all deserve a trophy. The last <laughs> panel uh, from Common Cause, of course, Susan Lerner. Um, Uh, reinvent Albany, Alex Kamada, uh, Diane Fersh, she's a poor worker, and from Citizens Uni Union, Ethan Geringer Sameth. You can begin as okay. soon as you're situated. Okay, uh, I apologize, I don't have written testimony today, um, but I will provide uh, a written testimony uh, in the future. Um, the reason, I, I'd like to talk specifically about why we at Common Cause believe there was such a mess uh, on election day. Um, and we think that there are uh, really um, two, uh, three reasons. First, bad law at the state level, and I'm not gonna belabor that. We've uh, I think that's been covered extensively. The second is bad policy choices by the New York City Board. And frankly, the third is political theater instead of uh, effective th uh, city action. Um, so I'd like to talk about the bad policies and then I'd like to talk about what I think effective city action could be, what the council could actually be doing, yes. certainly what the mayor could be doing. Um, first, uh, the bad policy choices that the board made uh, the board insists that it has to place all five languages on every ballot. That is not a legal requirement at all, but it makes it much harder to design a, a, re a reasonable ballot, and it resulted in the absurd ballot uh, that voters faced uh, on uh, November 6th. Uh, so aside from the question of changing the, the state law, the board makes choices that, that make the ballot unreadable, unworkable. Uh, and they don't need to do that. They have been advised repeatedly by language access uh, authorities, by the advocacy community, and they stubbornly decide they know better. And there we have a problem, I think, that uh, encapsulates every problem. Uh, the board does not listen. The board does not take consultation. The board uh, decides on its own. Um, the poll workers are not trained on clearing the, the uh, scanners, and we've heard that that was a deliberate choice on the part of the board. Advocacy groups, poll workers, coordinators have been begging the board for years to have more hands-on training for the poll workers so that they understood how the scanners worked. The board, in its infinite wisdom, decided it knew better, and the voters suffer. Um, generally, there is inadequate poll worker training, and I would have to contest the uh, assertion that, well, our um, consultant, our educational consultant tells us one thing. For years, the advocacy community has been asking the board to share the recommendations of the consultant, and magically, that has never happened. So we don't actually know what the consultant has recommended, and we don't know what the board has accepted or not accepted from the consultant that the taxpayers pay for, because the board refuses to make that public. That's a bad choice. And I suspect that there are recommendations that the education consultant made that the board 
board just decided to ignore. So using the consultant as a shield is frankly offensive because we don't know what the uh, consultant said. Um, and, uh, you know, so, oh, and the board was advised when it became clear that there was going to be this super long ballot and that voters were going to be confused. We heard that the board had taken certain actions, was bringing the coordinators back in, and that they had produced a video to explain to voters how to handle the ballot. And the video was on their website. We suggested to the board that they email the link to the video to every single poll worker in advance of elections. Oh, well, you know, we, we can't really do that. Um, so every step along the way, the board makes bad choices and they are never held accountable for it. Which gets me to my, sec my uh, third point. Um, we see these, this same hearing over and over again. It's really deja vu. Um, and the punching bag is always the staff. It's always the executive director and, and occasionally some of the other staff members. But as, as uh, Executive De Ryan, uh, Ryan made very clear, the choices are made by the commissioners. I would suggest that you should have the commissioners come in and answer questions, and if they refuse your invitation, this might be an appropriate place to use your subpoena power. Um, the um, so requiring the commissioners to appear and answer questions. Um, the council has passed some very good laws that would improve aspects of our city elections. For instance, it is now a matter of city law that the board is supposed to post a notice of change at a closed polling place telling voters where uh, they can now go to vote. The board does not do that. Uh, we've heard discussion today about the amount of money and effort put into providing translators in other languages. The board insists that the translators cannot be at the desk inside with other translators. The board insists that the translators have to sit uh, out uh, more than 100 feet away from the front door of the polling place off and in the last two years in the pouring rain, so the voters actually don't know that their services are available. The city knew this last November. There was no negotiation or limited negotiation between the mayor's office and the board to solve this problem. So now we, the taxpayers have paid for double the number of translators to sit outside where nobody saw them in the pouring rain for an entire day. That's inexcusable and that's something that can be fixed if somebody's actually doing more than posturing and actually trying to help the voters. Uh, so you know, we see this over and over again, decisions that are made for show. If there is a problem, if the council has passed a law that the Board of Elections is not following and the Board of Elections refuses to follow it after negotiations and various requests, Frankly, the city's going to have to sue because otherwise the law is useless. Um, and I strongly recommend that the, that the council should be looking at ways to use the budget process to require the board to take action that the council feels is necessary. There, it is possible to put restrictions on the use of the money rather than a large pot of general allocations, and we really haven't seen that uh, being done. I'd also like to um, point to things that are done in some other jurisdictions which could be helpful. There, was, uh, there were bills pending in the council um, in the four or five year ago time period to require city workers to be available as poll workers. Uh, Common Cause and other good uh, government organizations worked on those bills. Uh, I personally had discussions with various unions, found that there were questions that the unions had. The bills basically went nowhere. We, th we agree with the board that it's a really good idea to have the city workers available and to be urged to have them as poll workers. We had suggested that uh, poll worker recruitment be placed in all of the paychecks for poll workers so that the, poll the city employees knew about this opportunity. There are double dipping questions, there's time off questions, it would have to be negotiated with the unions, but this is a very solvable problem. As pointed out, Los Angeles County has solved it. 
Los Angeles County is also doing something very interesting that some other jurisdictions have done, which I seriously recommend that the committee think about, and that is to design its own software. To own the software and not to be subject to um, endless maintenance contracts on the part of private vendors. So that the software can be changed, it can be open source, uh, it can be proprietary, to New York City or to New York State, it can be much more nimble and adaptable. And the public would pay for it once and maintain it with uh, city employees rather than having to spend a huge amount of money on endless maintenance contracts. Uh, you're probably familiar with the marketing um, uh, adage that it's not the uh, disposable uh, razor holder that you make your money with, it's the disposable razors. So if you're doing business with the private vendors, it's the maintenance contracts where they really can hold you hostage and there is an alternative. Um, so I think that these are very solvable problems, but it is going to require some change in conduct in the political actors uh, to hold the board responsible uh, and to take more effective action. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the committee. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. Thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, as you know from the, the previous testimony, there are many issues with uh, our elections and many different solutions that uh, are put into place at different levels of government. Some of them the city board can do administratively, others can be done by the city itself, and others uh, require the changes in state law and even the state constitution. So today we're focused on solutions that the city or the city board of, ele uh, of elections can do. We did provide testimony to the assembly last week and that is on our website. We provided 10 pages of testimony related to bills and actions that the state can take and I'm happy to answer any questions about those. But regarding actions the city and the city board of elections can take, we tried to organize our testimony into a problem solution construct um, so that it's very clear since there are many different issues involved in administering a successful election. So let me start with I think what has been identified as the, as the root problem, or the major problem on election day on November 6th and that was the breakdowns of the scanners. Uh, we heard a lot of testimony about this previously before the assembly last week, uh, Executive Director Michael Ryan provided some preliminary numbers and he indicated that there were 2,631 incidents with the scanners, of which 4,064 were actually deployed. That's a very large number uh, and obviously indicative of a very systemic problem for which you heard a number of reasons today. Um, on election day, as Executive Director Ryan indicated, he talked mostly about humidity and the wetness of the ballots as causing some of the scanner jams. Uh, during his testimony today and also last week, he spoke more about the perforated edge of the ballot and the tearing of the ballot not being done cleanly. Um, last week before the assembly, which he did not mention today, he talked about the feeding in of the ballot into the scanners done too quickly by voters, which also has created some of the jams. I don't think we've really precisely identified for each of these factors which ones uh, were the most or were the primary or secondary causes of the scanners malfunctioning. We were very pleased to see that the council brought ES&S and that they came forth and testified uh, regarding the scanners. I will say we think they're understating the role of humidity and wetness. Uh, in their operational manual from 2013, and I'm reading specifically from page four, it says that operational humidity during operation should be between 10 and 50 percent. So clearly uh, it seems from that manual that humidity is impactful during operations and not just on storage uh, as they indicated. The second issue uh, that we've also heard about is, is ballot design. And uh, we heard about the unwieldy two-page, four-sided, 17-inch ballot in Manhattan and also a 19-inch ballot in Brooklyn. All of this is avoidable. 
uh, by the city board if they were only to reduce the number of languages on the ballot. And this is an issue that has come up in the past, and I think the board has been reluctant to do it because it requires that they create many more ballot styles. They now have to get all those different ballot styles out to poll sites, and it's more complexity for the poll workers. And the issue with the poll workers is the board faces a real challenge in recruiting over 35,000 poll workers for what is effectively a temporary job. And I think all of us have a very high expectation of the administration on election day, but at the same time, the board is relying on a temporary workforce. And that's why, as, as Common Cause indicated, and we support a municipal poll worker program, the Board of Elections does, I think all the good government groups have for years. So we really think that that's something that the council and the administration could work on and work out some of the issues that have been mentioned and try to come up with the solution because I really think, you know, this year it was malfunctioning scanners, another election, it will be another issue. And if we want to have a high performing workforce, we need to bring the city's workforce into the fold rather than rely on temporary workers. I just don't think you can get 35,000 very high performing temporary workers. Um, one of the other secondary kind of cascading issues that the malfunctioning scanners created was the um, was overcrowded poll sites and then also the ballot security being compromised and the emergency procedures being put into place um, that council member Lander talked in depth about. What we'd like to see is to reduce the lines and the overcrowding is to employ these emergency ballot procedures sooner in some instances. For example, if one scanner is down for a period of time, it would be better to employ the emergency ballot procedures, educate the public about them so they have more confidence that their vote will be counted, rather than waiting for every scanner to go down and causing people to wait in long lines and some of them walk away not even having voted. We also think that the board should take up the mayor's proposal of um, bringing in an operational consultant. Uh, I, the board obviously has some consultants, but we think they would benefit from a consultant who would look at poll site design, layout issues, how to handle these snaky lines that council member uh, Lander spoke of. All of that would be helpful. I know the DMV did something similar and their operations I think got better as a result of that, so there should be experts that they could bring in for that purpose. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that um, beyond the poll worker issue, clearly the Board of Elections has uh, staffing and operational issues that are internal to the board and kind of unique to their agency. Um, you know, for years, and Councilmember Kalos has raised this, they haven't really d employed professional hiring practices. They have not uh, advertised positions online. I don't know internally, it doesn't seem like they do a rigorous uh, hiring process. They should professionalize their workforce, notwithstanding the bipartisan requirements in the Constitution for the board, and we don't think that those filter down to every position within the city board anyway. For example, you don't really need to have a Republican and a Democrat voter technician. You just need a voter technician that can go out into the field and actually fix the machine in, in a timely way. We also think that the board should utilize uh, far more digitization and automation that modern companies use. Uh, it's a very paper-based environment there, and the um, staff could be reduced by employing digitization and automation, and, they, and the council and the budget for the board could be increased. You know, many of the permanent staff at the board are actually not well paid relative to other agencies, and we'd like to see a workforce that emphasizes quality over quantity, uh, rather than having many workers who are paid $30,000 a year, which is the case for, for many of them, even while some of these positions are patronage positions. Lastly, I just wanted to comment on um, communications to inactive voters, which the Chief Democracy Officer uh, was seeking to help in sending a mailer earlier this year, uh, or I should say a couple months ago. Uh, you know, while we appreciate her efforts, the reality is that the Board of Elections sends a communication in August 
regarding the upcoming election lets voters know, registered voters, where their poll site is uh, and additional information about the election. In state law, there's only a requirement that that communication go to active voters. There's no requirement it goes to inactive voters. Uh, I don't believe the board sends it to inactive voters. Uh, I think if the administration wanted to help, they should duplicate that mailing, send it to inactive voters, say nothing about changing your status, just send the information so people can go vote at their appropriate poll site, and then when they go and vote and do so, they become active voters. That would be most helpful, we believe, to inactive voters. Thank you, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. My name's Diana Finch. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you. My name is Diana Finch. I've been a high-performing temporary poll worker in the Bronx for over 10 years, and I've never seen an election so marred by shortages and poor planning. The only things we had enough of on November 6 were ballots and voters. We did not have enough training. The only notification we had about the two-page ballot was a robocall from Executive Director Ryan the Saturday beforehand advising us to view a video on the website, which when I saw it was a simple animation. The news media had better demo videos of actual ballots. We did not have enough workers. In the October 30th commissioners meeting, Executive Director Ryan quickly reports numbers for the November 6. 1,231 poll sites, 35,556 workers, just under 29 workers per site. Enough for ours, but on the day, we only had 21 or 22 people show up. And we had just one coordinator when for big elections, our site's supposed to have two. Mm. A major flaw is that while the 35,000 workers who passed training were sent a notice to work by mail, there's no requirement that we respond to say if we're coming to work or not. So the Board of Elections doesn't really know how many workers they'll have on any election day. We've heard about not enough working scanners, not enough scanner repair people. There were also not enough privacy booths. Executive Director Ryan announced approximately 13 per site. Ours were filled completely at many times, which created more long lines. Executive Director Ryan cited 13 O2 ballot marking devices, meaning fewer than 100 sites had more than one. Ours was in steady use by voters who can't see well or don't have great reading skills for such a long detailed ballot, but it broke down by midday and was never repaired. Some voters then had to have two poll workers from our skeleton staff read the entire ballot to them. There were not enough privacy sleeves, the folders for voters to keep ballots in, partly because there were so many in use held by voters standing online to fill out their ballots and standing online to scan them. We didn't even have enough pens. And at least a third of the privacy booths lacked pens, so right away we had to give out some of our too few pens. Why do folders and pens matter? The high number of jammed scanners were blamed on damp ballots. The heavily reused folders, meant to keep the ballots dry as well as private, got wet from coats and umbrellas, but we couldn't set them aside because we didn't have enough in the first place. Not enough pens meant people digging into their wet pockets and bags for their own, getting everything wetter. We even ran out of I Voted stickers, greatly disappointing many. And finally, there were not even enough voter registration forms our entire site ran out of this essential. The New York City Board of Elections did anticipate the turnout as evidenced by the commissioner's discussions about how many ballots to print, enough for 110 to 120% of the total registered voters. So why does the Board of Elections not ask for and plan for adequate staffing and supplies for New York City voters? That is the question we and the commissioners need to ask. And why are none of the commissioners here today? And that Thank is you. the question. Yes. I, I really appreciate uh, your testimony, and I cannot let you go without asking a few questions. You mentioned Susan, and I'm curious with Alex. Uh, have you, when was the last time you had an opportunity to sit down uh, with the executive director? 
New York City for um, election? Well, I have found that the, um, the staff is pretty accessible. Um, they, but there's no regular process. Other jurisdictions actually have advisory councils mm. uh, made up of voters and advocacy organizations who meet on a regular basis, and that was my experience in Los Angeles County, to discuss um, what's going right, what's going wrong, what are the good ideas, what is the board thinking of, and to get feedback from the community. This board lives in isolation. Have you suggested? I'm, I'm sure you have. But <laughs> and what kind of feedback did you get back regarding? The commissioners would have to talk about it, and the commissioners are not interested in any input from anybody. Okay. So I mean, in my experience, I, I uh, certainly executive director Ryan's responsive to phone calls, and then just going to the meetings. I mean, the board has meetings every Tuesday at one o'clock, and they're actually you know very open because they have to deliberate as a board. Uh, on all the major policy decisions they make. So in, in a lot of ways, the board is more transparent than, say, agency le agencies led by a commissioner that don't have to have that open meetings requirement. Um, so, I mean, it is a very deliberative process, and you do get to see how they make decisions if you go to board meetings uh, routinely. So, I, you know, I, I've found them personally to be uh, accessible. You know, I, I think the issues um, that occur are, are somewhat the odd construct of having a bi bipartisan board and then also just further down the line, some, uh, the junior staff, um, you know, not being paid well, not employing modern hiring techniques, the g digitization and automation we spoke about I think is an issue, um, and then just the challenges of having a temporary workforce that's very large implement uh, an election day. But what I have seen, unfortunately, on various occasions are recommendations from the staff that make a lot of sense, and the commission doesn't even entertain them, mm. or just, uh, just basically says, no, too radical, too different, we never did that before. Um, so there's a real problem at the commission level that's really the root of the, of, I think, a lot of the inefficiencies that we see. Because we have paid the staff to become election administrators. None of the staff are election administrators before we hired them. The management staff now has been there for a while, so we've paid them for on-the-job training. They're, they're giving the commission better ideas, and the commission doesn't care. So we've got to hold the commissioners responsible. Wow. Uh, I mean to ask you, and then I have a question for you, Diana. I'm going to leave the last question for you, the best question. Uh, I wanted to ask you, in page four that you mentioned, it says between 10 to 50 percent. But the next page, it says 80 percent. Uh, did you notice that piece? Have you? So I think the 80 percent was referring to storage, whereas the 10 to 50 was operational. Uh, I think the point is that clearly humidity impacts operations, and it seemed to me that both Executive Director Ryan and then ESNS were not acknowledging that as fully as they should. But we had we had the same level of humidity in other municipalities, yeah. and from the testimony that we have heard in our investigation, it seems that they didn't have the problems that we had. It looks like it was a perforation problem. The biggest problem for me was that, that the company that supply the machines warned the Board of Election that they were going to have a problem and there were no steps, there was no proactive steps taken to fix the problem. That's the, that's for me is the biggest problem that I have uh, here because if I look at all the variables, I'm always looking what's constant. The one piece that looked different than any other municipality was perforation. Yeah, I think that's certainly part, it could be the primary uh, reason for the, the ballot scanners. I mean, as I was saying in my testimony, there were a number of factors cited at different times on different days, before, you know, even before different bodies, and I don't believe we precisely know the primary cause. It could be the perforated ballot. I will say on the, um, on the humidity piece, ESNS has had issues with, uh, with similar but other machines in other jurisdictions. They did in North Carolina on election day. 
Um, so I think that it, that it, it could be more of a factor than they're, than they're indicating. And to Council Member Lander's point, who is calling his poll sites a mosh pit, nobody knows the relative humidity in that particular poll site or other poll sites where you had a lot of people in coming, out, coming in from wet weather, and the humidity, humidity, I would imagine, was pretty high, and I don't think it was measured, so we just don't know. And yeah. they should have, if they knew that was a problem too as well, they sh there should have been instruction to give instruction to the people who were coming right. to vote, you know, make sure your hands are dry, right. et cetera. Right, and I think, I mean, we've got firsthand testimony that I found very compelling of the lack of the um, shortfall in the privacy sleeves contributing to the fact that the ballots were actually getting wet, forget humidity. If they're wet, they're definitely going to be a problem. We heard complaints throughout the day where people were freaking out because the boxes in the scanners were filling out, were filling up. And look, you have a double ballot. So you're going to have double the number of pieces of paper in these uh, boxes. And there was great confusion about what you do when they fill up. And voters were calling Common Cause and the Election Protection Hotline and asking, what's going to happen? Where are the ballots going to go? Well, we heard from, uh, from Council Member Landers. Sometimes they ended up in paper, in plastic bags. So, you know, it's a complete lack of planning. Um, and just unable to grapple with uh, a realistic assessment of what's coming at you. And Diana, you know, I wanted to ask, because you were there, you know, in, nobody can speak better about the issue that took place really than you, because you were there, you were on the front lines, you did all those long hours. Um, did you see uh, that many of the ballots were getting wet? Yes, okay. particularly from the folders. It was because the wow. folders were wet. I think so. Okay. I mean, the folders were wet because the voters were wet, and the, we couldn't put away the, or throw away the wet folders because we didn't have enough folders. And I'm not talking and about. And some people had to use their ballots without any folders at all. Wow. And I know I'm talking about just one particular site. Uh, so, but uh, at what time did the machines started to jam? Did, did, did uh, let me not assume. Did uh, on your side did the machines jam? Yes. And what was the early? And at one point we were down to just one functioning. Oh really? Machine. Wow. What time did this start to jam? Mm, probably around eight, nine in the morning. And, and then there was a call that was placed, I would imagine. Yes, and the coordinator initially said that she couldn't even get through wow. to the board of elections. Okay. So I was at a number of polling places in Brooklyn, and I do feel that at least in that borough the board had deployed more technicians who were responding pretty quickly. But what we were seeing was often all of the machines would go down. They would get a technician in pretty well, uh, that the machines would be fixed. And once they went down once, there was a much higher probability that they were going to go down again. Gotcha. So we would see four machines were out, they were all fixed. Within two hours, one of them had gone down. That one got fixed, another one went down. So, um, you know, the problems were intermittent throughout the day and voters were tearing their hair out. And so I'll close with this last question. I'll go to you, Diana, which is if uh, the director was sitting right here, Dr. Ryan, what would you like to tell him? I would like to tell him that he has to completely open up the whole operations and take a very hard look at the numbers. I don't think anyone is really looking at the numbers and doing a professional study of what's needed and what we need to do. He ran through all the numbers that I cited the week before the election. He presented them to the commissioners and the commissioners asked no questions and they didn't even figure out. So that means you have only one ballot marking device for most of the poll sites across the city, what happens if it breaks. They didn't even ask any of those questions. And the meeting after the election, which I tried to make, but I thought I couldn't, and then I thought, well, many other people will come and testify, it's not just me. No one came to testify, and the commissioners discussed the election for seven minutes. Hmm. That's how long that meeting was. And only one of the commissioners from Brooklyn 
said anything about what had happened on election day. And I think, uh, and I'm gonna conclude today's hearing, uh, I think that uh, that is really at the root of the problem. We need a leadership. We need a leadership to anticipate. We need a leadership to hear, um, uh, to hear the advice of those who've been doing this, who've been working, the nonprofits, the community, the, the poll workers, been at it for many, many years. And we are gonna get to the bottom of this. I, I know this is my first year, Susan. <laughs> Have a little faith with me. I, I'm into results. I'm not into okay. the fanfare. I wanna see results. I wanna see changes. We're gonna demand changes. Uh, it's gonna happen. You'll see some. And looking forward to uh, being able to organize maybe a round table that we can sit down with the director and hear uh, your community has been working tirelessly uh, in this effort. And uh, Diane, thank you for being in Facebook uh, as well. Yeah, I know you were out there. Thank you. Because uh, that's where people are at. That's where people are listening and the message truly went out. I want to thank my co-chair, uh, Richie Torres, the speaker, all of the staff that have been here literally all day uh, with me. They did a fantastic job from both committees. Uh, they are truly five-star uh, staff. And with that, we conclude today's hearing. You know, I looked up the job openings at the board. Yeah. And they do, ha all the job openings that I saw had Democrats.